Chapter Twenty Two, Part One of Etiquette. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah Jennings. Etiquette in society, in business, in politics, and at home, by Emily Post. Chapter Twenty Two, Part One: The Day of the Wedding. No one is busier than the best man on the day of the wedding. His official position is a cross between trained nurse, valet, general manager, and keeper. Bright and early in the morning, he hurries to the house of the groom, generally before the latter is up. Very likely, they breakfast together. In any event, he takes the groom in charge precisely as might a guardian. He takes note of his patient's general condition. If he is normal and fit, so much the better. If he is up in the air or nervous. The best man must bring him to earth and jolly him along as best he can. Best man as expressman. His first actual duty is that of packer and expressman. He must see that everything necessary for the journey is packed, and that the groom does not absent-mindedly put the furnishings of his room in his valise and leave his belongings hanging in the closet. He must see that the clothes the groom is to wear away are put into a special bag to be taken to the house of the bride. Where he, as well as she, must change from wedding into travelling clothes, the best man becomes expressman if the first stage of the wedding journey is to be to a hotel in town. He puts all the groom's luggage into his own car or a taxi, drives to the bride's house, carries the bag with the groom's travelling suit in it to the room set aside for his use, usually the dressing room of the bride's father or the bedroom of her brother. He then collects, according to pre-arrangement, the luggage of the bride. And drives with the entire equipment of both bride and groom to the hotel where rooms have already been engaged, sees it all into the rooms, and makes sure that everything is as it should be. If he is very thoughtful, he may himself put flowers about the rooms. He also registers for the newlyweds, takes the room key, returns to the house of the groom, gives him the key, and assures him that everything at the hotel is in readiness. This maneuver allows the young couple, when they arrive, to go quietly to their rooms, without attracting the notice of any one. As would be the case if they arrived with baggage and were conspicuously shown the way by a bellboy whose manner unmistakably proclaims bride and groom, or if they are going at once by boat or train, the best man takes the baggage to the station, checks the large pieces, and fees a porter to see that the hand luggage is put in the proper stateroom or parlor car chairs. If they are going by automobile, he takes the luggage out to the garage and personally sees that it is bestowed in the car. Best man as valet. His next duty is that of valet. He must see that the groom is dressed and ready early, and plaster him up if he cuts himself shaving. If he is wise in his day, he even provides a small bottle of adrenaline for just such an accident, so that plaster is unnecessary and that the groom may be whole. He may need to find his collar button or even to point out the missing clothes that are lying in full view. He must also be sure to ask for the wedding ring and the clergyman's fee, and put them in his own waistcoat pocket. A very careful best man carries a duplicate ring. In case of one being lost during the ceremony, best man as companion in ordinary. With the bride's and groom's luggage properly bestowed, the ring and fee in his pocket, the groom's travelling clothes at the bride's house, the groom in complete wedding attire, and himself also ready, the best man has nothing further to do but be gentleman in waiting to the groom until it is time to escort him to the church, where he becomes chief of staff. At the house of the bride. Meanwhile, if the wedding is to be at noon, dawn will not have much more than broken before the house, at least below stairs, becomes bustling. Even if the wedding is to be four o'clock, it will still be early in the morning when the business of the day begins. But let us suppose it is to be at noon. If the family is one that is used to assembling at an early breakfast table, it is probable that the bride herself will come down for this last meal alone with her family. They will, however, not be allowed to linger long at the table. The caterer will already be clamouring for possession of the dining room. The florist will, by that time, have heaped dumps of wire and greens into the middle of the drawing room, if not beside the table where the family are still communing with their eggs. The doorbell has long ago begun to ring. At first, there are telegrams and special delivery letters. Then, as soon as the shops open, come the last moment wedding presents, notes, messages, and the insistent clamour of the telephone. Next, excited voices in the hall announce members of the family who come from a distance. They all want to kiss the bride. They all want rooms to dress in. They all want to talk. Also comes the hairdresser to do the bride's or her mother's or aunt's or grandmother's hair or all of them. The manicure, the masseuse, 
anyone else that may have been thought necessary to give final beautifying touches to any or all of the female members of the household. The dozen and one articles from the caterer are meantime being carried in at the basement door. Made dishes and dishes in the making, raw materials of which others are to be made, folding chairs, small tables, chinaware, glassware, napery, knives, forks, and spoons, it is a struggle to get in or out of the kitchen or area door. The bride's mother consults the florist for the third and last time as to whether the bridal couple had not better receive in the library because of the bay window which lends itself easily to the decoration of a background, and because the room is, if anything, larger than the drawing room. And for the third time the florist agrees about the advantage of the window, but points out that the library has only one narrow door, and that the drawing room is much better because it has two wide ones, and guests going into the room will not be blocked in the doorway by others coming out. The best man turns up and wants the bride's luggage. The head usher comes to ask whether the Joneses to be seated in the fourth pew are the tall dark ones or the blonde ones, and whether he had not better put some of the Titherington's who belong in the eighth pew also in the seventh, as there are nine Titherington's, and the eminence in the seventh pew are only four. A bridesmaid elect hurries up the steps, runs into the best man carrying out the luggage, much conversation and giggling and guessing as to where the luggage is going. Best man, very important. Also very noble and silent. Bridesmaid shrugs her shoulders, dashes up to the bride's room, and dashes down again. More presents arrive. The furniture movers have come and are carting lumps of heaviness up the stairs to the attic and down the stairs to the cellar. It is all very like an ant hill. Some are steadily going forward with the business in hand, but others, who have become quite bewildered, seem to be scurrying aimlessly this way and that, picking something up only to put it down again. The drawing room. Here, where the bride and groom are to receive, one cannot tell yet what the decoration is to be. Perhaps it is a hedged-in garden scene, a palm grove, a flowering recess, a screen and canopy of wedding bells, but a bower of foliage of some sort is gradually taking shape. The dining room. The dining room, too, blossoms with plants and flowers. Perhaps its space and that of a tent adjoining is filled with little tables. Or perhaps a single row of camp chairs stands flat against the walls, and in the center of the room, the dining table pulled out to its furthest extent is being decked with trimmings and utensils which will be needed later when the spaces left at intervals for various dishes shall be occupied. Preparation of these dishes is meanwhile going on in the kitchen. The kitchen. The caterers, chefs, in white cooks, caps, and aprons are in possession of the situation. And their assistants run here and there, bringing ingredients as they are told. Or perhaps the caterer brings everything already prepared, in which case the waiters are busy unpacking the big tin boxes and placing the bain marie, a sort of fireless cooker receptacle, in a tank of hot water, from which the hot food is to be served. Huge tubs of cracked ice in which the ice cream containers are buried are already standing in the shade of the areaway or in the back yard. Last preparations. Back again in the drawing room, the florist and his assistants are still tying and tacking and arranging and adjusting branches and garlands and sheaves and bunches, and the floor is a litter of twigs and strings and broken branches. The photographer is asking that the central decoration be finished so he can group his pictures. The florist assures him that he is as busy as possible. The house is as cold as open windows can make it, to keep the flowers fresh and to avoid stuffiness. The doorbell continues its ringing, and the parlor maid finds herself a contestant in a marathon, until someone decides that card envelopes and telegrams had better be left in the front hall. A first bridesmaid arrives. She at least is on time. All decoration activity stops while she is looked at and admired. Panic seizes someone. The time is too short. Nothing will be ready. Someone else says the bridesmaid is far too early. There is no end of time. Upstairs, everyone is still dressing. The father of the bride, one would suppose him to be the bridegroom at least, is trying on most of his shirts, the floor strewn with discarded collars. The mother of the bride is hurrying into her wedding array so as to be ready for any emergency, as well as to superintend the finishing touches to her daughter's dress and veil. The wedding dress. Everyone knows what a wedding dress is like. It may be of any white material, satin, brocade. Velvet, chiffon, or entirely of lace. It may be embroidered in pearls, crystals, or silver. Or it may be as plain as a slip cover, anything in fact that the bride fancies, and made in whatever fashion or period she may choose. 
As for her veil, in its combination of lace or tulle and orange blossoms, perhaps it is copied from a headdress of Egypt or China, or from the severe drapery of Rebecca herself, or proclaim the knowing touch of the Rue de la Paix. It may have a cap, like that of a lady in a French print, or fall in clouds of tulle from under a little wreath, such as might be worn by a child queen of the May. The origin of the bridal veil is an unsettled question. Roman brides wore yellow veils, and veils were used in the ancient Hebrew marriage ceremony. The veil as we use it may be a substitute for the flowing tresses which in old times fell like a mantle, modestly concealing the bride's face and form. Or it may be an amplification of the veil which medieval fashion added to every headdress. In olden days the garland, rather than the veil, seems to have been of greatest importance. The garland was the coronet of the good girl, and her right to wear it was her inalienable attribute of virtue. Very old books speak of three ornaments that every virtuous bride must wear, a ring on her finger, a brooch on her breast, and a garland on her head. A bride who had no dowry of gold was said nevertheless to bring her husband great treasure if she brought him a garland, in other words, a virtuous wife. At present the veil is usually mounted by a milliner on a made foundation, so that it need merely be put on. But every young girl has an idea of how she personally wants her wedding veil, and may choose rather to put it together herself, or have it done by some particular friend, whose taste and skill she especially admires. If she chooses to wear a veil over her face, up the aisle, and during the ceremony, the front veil is always a short, separate piece, about a yard square, gathered on an invisible band, and pinned with a hairpin at either side, after the long veil is arranged. It is taken off by the maid of honor, when she gives back the bride's bouquet at the conclusion of the ceremony. The face veil is a rather old-fashioned custom, and is appropriate only for a very young bride of a demure type, the tradition being that a maiden is too shy to face a congregation unveiled, and shows her face only when she is a married woman. Some brides prefer to remove their left glove by merely pulling it inside out at the altar. Usually the underseam of the wedding finger of her glove is ripped for about two inches, and she need only pull the tip off to have the ring put on. Or if the wedding is a small one, she wears no gloves at all. Brides have been known to choose colors other than white. Cloth of silver is quite conventional, and so is very deep cream. But cloth of gold suggests the habiliment of a widow rather than that of a virgin maid, of which the white and orange blossoms, or myrtle leaf, are the emblems. If a bride chooses to be married in travelling dress, she has no bridesmaids, though she often has a maid of honour. A travelling dress is either a tailor-maid, if she is going directly on a boat or train, or a morning or afternoon dress, whatever she would wear away after a big wedding. But to return to our particular bride, every one seemingly is in her room, her mother, her grandmother, three aunts, two cousins, three bridesmaids, four small children, two friends, her maid, the dressmaker, and an assistant. Every little while the parlour-maid brings a message or a package. Her father comes in and goes out at regular intervals in sheer nervousness. The rest of the bridesmaids gradually appear and distract the attention of the audience so that the bride has moments of being allowed to dress undisturbed. At last even her veil is adjusted, and all present gasp their approval. How sweet! Dearest, you are too lovely! And darling, how wonderful you look! Her father reappears. If you are going to have the pictures taken, you had better all hurry. Oh, Mary, shouts someone, what have you on that is something old, something new, something borrowed, something blue, and a lucky sixpence in your shoe? Let me see, says the bride. Old, I have old lace. New, I have lots of new. Borrowed and blue? A chorus of voices. Where my ring? Where my pin? Where mine? It's blue. And someone's pin, which has a blue stone in it, is fastened on under the trimming of her dress, and serves both needs. If the lucky sixpence, a dime will do, is produced, she must at least pay discomfort for her luck. Again, someone suggests that the photographer is waiting and time is short. Having pictures taken before the ceremony is a dull custom, because it is tiring to sit for one's photograph at best, and to attempt anything so delaying as posing at the moment when the procession ought to be starting is as trying to the nerves as it is exhausting and more than one wedding procession has consisted of very dragged-out young women in consequence. At a country wedding it is very easy to take the pictures out on the lawn at the end of the reception, and just before the bride goes to dress. Sometimes in a town house they are taken in an upstairs room at the same hour, 
but usually the bride is dressed, and her bridesmaids arrive at her house fully half an hour before the time necessary to leave for the church, and pictures of the group are taken, as well as several of the bride alone, with special lights, against the background where she will stand and receive. Procession to Church Whether the pictures are taken before the wedding or after, the bridesmaids always meet at the house of the bride, where they also receive their bouquets. When it is time to go to the church, there are several carriages or motors drawn up at the house. The bride's mother drives away in the first, usually alone, or she may, if she chooses, take one or two bridesmaids in her car, but she must reserve room for her husband, who will return from church with her. The maid of honor, bridesmaids, and flower girls go in the next vehicles, which may be their own or else are supplied by the bride's family. And last of all comes the bride's carriage, which always has a wedding appearance. If it is a brugham, the horse's headpieces are decorated with white flowers, and the coachman wears a white boutonniere. If it is a motor, the chauffeur wears a small bunch of white flowers on his coat, and white gloves, and has all the tires painted white, to give the car a wedding appearance. The bride drives to the church with her father only. Her carriage arrives last of the procession, and stands without moving in front of the awning, until she and her husband, in place of her father, return from the ceremony, and drive back to the house for the breakfast or reception. If she has no father, this part is taken by an uncle, a brother, a cousin, her guardian, or other close male connection of her family. If it should happen that the bride has neither father nor a very near male relative or guardian, she walks up the aisle alone. At the point in the ceremony when the clergyman asks who gives the bride, if the betrothal is read at the chancel steps, her mother goes forward and performs the office in exactly the same way that her father would have done. If the entire ceremony is at the altar, the mother merely stays where she is standing in her proper place at the end of the first pew on the left, and says very distinctly, I do. At the church. Meanwhile, about an hour before the time for the ceremony, the ushers arrive at the church, and the sexton turns his guardianship over to them. They leave their hats in the vestry or coat room. Their boutonnieres, sent by the groom, should be waiting in the vestibule. They should be in charge of a boy from the florists, who has nothing else on his mind but to see that they are there, that they are fresh, and that the ushers get them. Each man puts one in his buttonhole, and also puts on his gloves. The head usher decides, or the groom has already told them, to which ushers are apportioned the centre, and to which the side aisles. If it is a big church, with side aisles and gallery, and there are only six ushers, four will be put in the centre aisle, and two in the side. Guests who choose to sit up in the gallery find places for themselves. Often at a big wedding, the sexton or one of the assistants guards the entrance to the gallery, and admission is reserved by cards for the employees of both families, but usually the gallery is open for those who care to go up. An usher whose place is in the side aisle may escort occasional personal friends of his own down the center aisle if he happens to be unoccupied at the moment of their entrance. Those of the ushers who are most likely to recognize the various close friends and members of each family are invariably detailed to the center aisle. A brother of the bride, for instance, is always chosen for this aisle, because he is best fitted to look out for his own relatives and to place them according to their near or distant kinship. A second usher should be either a brother of the groom or a near relative who would be able to recognize the family and close friends of the groom. The first six to twenty pews on both sides of the center aisle are fenced off with white ribbons into a reserved enclosure. The parents of the bride always sit in the first pew on the left, facing the chancel. The parents of the groom always sit in the first pew on the right. The right-hand side of the church is the groom's side, always. The left is that of the bride. Seating the Guests It is the duty of the ushers to show all guests to their places. An usher offers his arm to each lady as she arrives, whether he knows her personally or not. If the vestibule is very crowded and several ladies are together, he sometimes gives his arm to the older and asks the others to follow but this is not done unless the crowd is great and the time short. If the usher thinks a guest belongs in front of the ribbons, though she fails to present her card, he always asks at once, Have you a pew number? If she has, he then shows her to her place. If she has none, he asks whether she prefers to sit on the bride's side or the groom's side, and gives her the best seat vacant in the unreserved part of the church. He generally makes a few polite comments as he takes her up the aisle, such as, I am sorry you came late, all the good seats are taken further up, or, isn't it lucky they have such a beautiful day, or, too bad it is raining. 
or perhaps the lady is first in making a similar remark or two to him. Whatever conversation there is is carried on in a low voice, not, however, whispered or solemn. The deportment of the ushers should be natural, but at the same time dignified and quiet, in consideration of the fact that they are in a church. They must not trot up and down the aisles in a bustling manner, yet they must be fairly agile, as the vestibule is packed with guests who have all to be seated as expeditiously as possible. The guests without reserved cards should arrive first in order to find good places. Then come the reserved seat guests, and lastly the immediate members of the families, who all have a special places in the front pews held for them. It is not customary for one who is in deep mourning to go to a wedding, but there can be little criticism of an intimate friend who takes a place in the gallery of the church from which she can see the ceremony and yet be apart from the wedding guests. At a wedding that is necessarily small because of mourning, the women of the family usually lay aside black for that one occasion and wear white. In front of the ribbons. There are two ways in which people in front of the ribbons are seated. The less efficient way is by means of a typewritten list of those for whom seats are reserved, and of the pews in which they are to be seated, given to each usher, who has read it over for each guest who arrives at the church. From every point of view, the typewritten list is bad. First, it wastes time, and as everyone arrives at the same moment, and every lady is supposed to be taken personally up the aisle on the arm of an usher, the time consumed while each usher looks up each name on several gradually rumpling and tearing sheets of paper is easily imagined. Besides which, one who is at all intimate with either family cannot help feeling in some degree slighted when, on giving one's name, the usher looks for it in vain. The second and far better method is to have a pew card sent, enclosed with the wedding invitation, or an inscribed visiting card sent by either family. A guest who has a card with pew number 12 on it knows, and the usher knows, exactly where she is to go. Or if she has a card saying reserved, or before the ribbons, or any special mark that means in the reserved section but no especial pew, the usher puts her in the best position available, behind the first two or three numbered rows that are saved for the immediate family, and in front of the ribbons marking the reserved enclosure. It is sometimes well for the head usher to ask the bride's mother if she is sure she has allowed enough pews in the reserved section to seat all those with cards. Arranging definite seat numbers has one disadvantage. One pew may have every seat occupied, and another may be almost empty. In that case, an usher can, just before the procession is to form, shift a certain few people out of the crowded pews into the others. But it would be a breach of etiquette for people to reseat themselves, and no one should be seated after the entrance of the bride's mother. The bridegroom waits. Meanwhile, about fifteen minutes before the wedding hour, the groom and his best man, both in morning coats, top hats, boutonnieres, and white buckskin, but remember not shining, gloves, walk or drive to the church and enter the side door which leads to the vestry. There they sit, or in the clergyman's study, until the sexton or an usher comes to say that the bride has arrived. End of chapter 22, part 1《ハッピーバースデーディアハッピーバースデーディアハッピーバースデーディアハッピーバースデーディアハッピーバースデーディアハッピーバースデーディアハッピーバースデーディアハッピーバースデーディアハッピーバースデーディアハッピーバースデーディアハッピーバースデーディアハッピーバースデーディアハッピーバースデーディアハッピーバースデーディアハッピーバースデーディアハッピーバースデーディアハッピーバースデーディアハッピーバースデーディアハッピーバー At a perfectly managed wedding, the bride arrives exactly one minute, to give a last comer time to find place, after the hour. Two or three servants have been sent to wait in the vestibule to help the bride and bridesmaids off with their wraps and hold them until they are needed after the ceremony. The groom's mother and father also are waiting in the vestibule. As the carriage of the bride's mother drives up, an usher goes as quickly as he can to tell the groom, and any brothers or sisters of the bride or groom, who are not to take part in the wedding procession, and have arrived in their mother's carriage, are now taken by ushers to their places in the front pews. The moment the entire wedding party is at the church, the doors between the vestibule and the church are closed. No one is seated after this, except the parents of the young couple. The proper procedure should be carried out with military exactness, and is as follows. The groom's mother goes down the aisle on the arm of the head usher, and takes her place in the first pew on the right, The groom's father follows alone, 
and takes his place beside her. The same usher returns to the vestibule and immediately escorts the bride's mother. He should then have time to return to the vestibule and take his place in the procession. The beginning of the wedding march should sound just as the usher returns to the head of the aisle. To repeat, no other person should be seated after the mother of the bride. Guests who arrive later must stand in the vestibule or go into the gallery. The sound of the music is also the cue for the clergyman to enter the chancel, followed by the groom and his best man. The two latter wear gloves, but have left their hats and sticks in the vestry room. The groom stands on the right-hand side at the head of the aisle, but if the vestry opens into the chancel, he sometimes stands at the top of the first few steps. He removes his right glove and holds it in his left hand. The best man always remains directly back into the right of the groom, and does not remove his glove. Here comes the bride. The description of the procession is given in detail above in the wedding rehearsal section. Starting on the right measure and keeping perfect time, the ushers come two by two, four paces apart. Then the bridesmaids, if any, at the same distance exactly. Then the maid of honor alone. Then the flower girls, if any. Then at a double distance, the bride on her father's right arm. She is dressed always in white, with a veil of lace or tulle. Usually she carries a bridal bouquet of white flowers either short or with streamers, narrow ribbons with little bunches of blossoms on the end of each, or trailing vines, or maybe she holds a long sheaf of stiff flowers such as lilies on her arm, or perhaps she carries a prayer book instead of a bouquet. The groom comes forward to meet the bride. As the bride approaches, the groom waits at the foot of the steps, unless he comes down the steps to meet her. The bride relinquishes her father's arm, changes her bouquet from her right to her left, and gives her right hand to the groom. The groom, taking her hand in his right, puts it through his left arm. Just her fingertips should rest near the bend of his elbow, and turns to face the chancel as he does so. It does not matter whether she takes his arm or whether they stand hand in hand at the foot of the chancel in front of the clergyman. Her father gives her away. Her father has remained where she left him, on her left and a step or two behind her. The clergyman stands a step or two above them and reads the betrothal. When he says, Who giveth this woman to be married? The father goes forward, still on her left, and halfway between her and the clergyman, but not in front of either. The bride turns slightly toward her father and gives him her right hand. The father puts her hand into that of the clergyman and says at the same moment, I do. He then takes his place next to his wife at the end of the first pew on the left. The Marriage Ceremony A soloist or the choir then sings while the clergyman slowly ascends to the altar before which the marriage is performed. The bride and groom follow slowly, the fingers of her right hand on his left arm. The maid of honor, or else the bridesmaid, moves out of line and follows on the left-hand side until she stands immediately below the bride. The best man takes the same position exactly on the right behind the groom. At the termination of the anthem, the bride hands her bouquet to the maid of honor, or her prayer book to the clergyman, and the bride and groom plight their troth. When it is time for the ring, the best man produces it from his pocket. If in the handling from best man to groom, to clergyman, to groom again, and finally to the bride's finger, it should slip and fall, the best man must pick it up if he can without searching. If not, he quietly produces the duplicate, which all careful best men carry in the other waistcoat pocket, and the ceremony proceeds. The lost ring, or the unused extra one, is returned to the jewellers next day. Which ring, under the circumstances, the bride keeps, is a question as hard to answer as that of the lady or the tiger. Would she prefer the substitute ring that was actually the one she was married with, or the one her husband bought and had marked for her? Or would she prefer not to have a substitute ring and have the whole wedding party on their knees searching? She alone can decide. Fortunately, even if the clergyman is very old and his hand shaky, a substitute is seldom necessary. The wedding ring must not be put above the engagement ring. On her wedding day, a bride either leaves her engagement ring at home when she goes to church, or wears it on her right hand. After the Ceremony At the conclusion of the ceremony, the minister congratulates the new couple. The organ begins the recessional. The bride takes her bouquet from the maid of honor, who removes the veil if she wore one over her face. She then turns toward her husband, her bouquet in her right hand, and puts her left hand through his right arm, and they descend the steps. The maid of honor, handing her own bouquet to a second bridesmaid, follows at a short distance after the bride, at the same time stooping and straightening out the long train and veil. The bride and groom go on down the aisle. 
the best man disappears into the vestry room. At a perfectly conducted wedding, he does not walk down the aisle with the maid of honor. The maid of honor recovers her bouquet and walks alone. If a bridesmaid performs the office of maid of honor, she takes her place among her companion bridesmaids who go next, and the ushers go last. The best man has meanwhile collected the groom's belongings and dashed out of the side entrance and around to the front to give the groom his hat and stick. Sometimes the sexton takes charge of the groom's hat and stick and hands them to him at the church door as he goes out, but in either case the best man always hurries around to see the bride and groom into their carriage, which has been standing at the entrance to the awning since she and her father alighted from it. All the other conveyances are drawn up in the reverse order from that in which they arrived. The bride's carriage leaves first, next come those of the bridesmaids, next the bride's mother and father, next the groom's mother and father, then the nearest members of both families and finally all the other guests in the order of their being able to find their conveyances. The best man goes back to the vestry, where he gives the fee to the clergyman, collects his own hat and coat if he has one, and goes to the bride's house. As soon as the recessional is over, the ushers hurry back and escort to the door all the ladies who were in the first pews, according to the order of precedence, the bride's mother first, then the groom's mother then the other occupants of the first pew on either side, then the second and third pews, until all members of the immediate families have left the church. Meanwhile, it is a breach of etiquette for other guests to leave their places. At some weddings, just before the bride's arrival, the ushers run ribbons down the whole length of the center aisle, fencing the congregation in. As soon as the occupants of the first pews have left, the ribbons are removed, and all the other guests go out by themselves the ushers having by that time hurried to the bride's house to make themselves useful at the reception. At the house. An awning makes a covered way from the edge of the curb to the front door. At the lower end, the chauffeur, or one of the caterer's men, stands to open the carriage doors and give return checks to the chauffeurs and their employers. Inside the house, the florist has finished. An orchestra is playing in the hall or library. Everything is in perfect order. The bride and groom have taken their places in front of the elaborate setting of flowering plants that has been arranged for them. The bride stands on her husband's right, and her bridesmaids are either grouped beyond her or else divided half on her side and half on the side of the groom, forming a crescent with the bride and groom in the center. Ushers at the house. At a small wedding, the duty of ushers is personally to take guests up to the bride and groom. But at a big reception where guests outnumber ushers fifty or a hundred to one, being personally conducted is an honor accorded only to the very old, the very celebrated, or the usher's own best friends. All the other guests stand in a long congested line by themselves. The bride's mother takes her place somewhere near the entrance of the room, and it is for her benefit that her own butler or one furnished by the caterer asks each guest his name and then repeats it aloud. The guests shake hands with the hostess, and making some polite remark about the beautiful wedding or lovely bride, continue in line to the bridal pair. Wedding Conversation What you say in congratulating a bridal couple depends on how well you know one or both of them. But remember it is a breach of good manners to congratulate a bride on having secured a husband. If you are unknown to both of them, and in a long queue, it is not even necessary to give your name. You merely shake hands with the groom, say a formal word or two, such as congratulations, shake hands with the bride, say I wish you every happiness, and pass on. If you know them very well, you may say to him, I hope your good luck will stay with you always, or I certainly do congratulate you, and to her, I hope your whole life will be one long happiness. Or if you are much older than she, you look too lovely, dear Mary, and I hope you will always be as radiant as you look today. Or if you are a woman and a relative or really close friend, you kiss the groom, saying all the luck in the world to you, dear Jim, she certainly is lovely. Or kissing the bride, Mary, darling, every good wish in the world to you. To all the above, the groom and bride merely answer, Thank you. A man might say to the groom, Good luck to you, Jim, old man, or she is the most lovely thing I have ever seen. And to her, I hope you will have every happiness, or I was just telling Jim how lucky I think he is. I hope you will both be very happy. Or if a very close friend, also kissing the bride, all the happiness you can think of isn't as much as I wish you, Mary, dear. But it cannot be too much emphasized that promiscuous kissing among the guests is an offense against good taste. To a relative, or old friend of the bride, but possibly a stranger to the groom, the bride always introduces her husband, saying, Jim, this is Aunt Kate, or Mrs. Neighbor, you know Jim, don't you? Or formally, Mrs. Faraway, 
May I present my husband? The groom, on the approach of an old friend of his, says, Mary, this is Cousin Carrie. Or, Mrs. Denver, do you know Mary? Or, hello, Steve, let me introduce you to my wife. Mary, this is Steve, Michigan. Steve says, how do you do, Mrs. Smartlington? And Mary says, of course, I have often heard Jim speak of you. The bride, with a good memory, thanks each arriving person for the gift sent her. Thank you so much for the lovely candlesticks. Or, I can't tell you how much I love the dishes. The person who is thanked says, I am so glad you like it, or them. Or, I am so glad. I hoped you might find it useful. Or, I didn't have it marked, so that in case you have a duplicate, you can change it. Conversation is never a fixed grouping of words that are learned or recited like a part in a play. The above examples are given more to indicate the sort of things people in good society usually say. There is, however, one rule. Do not launch into long conversation or details of yourself, how you feel or look or what happened to you or what you wore when you were married. Your subject must not deviate from the young couple themselves, their wedding, their future. Also be brief in order not to keep those behind waiting longer than necessary. If you have anything particular to tell them, you can return later when there is no longer a line. But even then, long conversation, especially concerning yourself, is out of place. Parents of the Groom The groom's mother always receives either near the bride's mother or else continuing the line beyond the bridesmaids, and it is proper for every guest to shake hands with her too, whether they know her or not. But it is not necessary to say anything. The bride's father sometimes stands beside his wife, but he usually circulates among his guests, just as he would at a ball or any other party where he is host. The groom's father is a guest, and it is not necessary for strangers to speak to him, unless he stands beside his wife, and as it were, receives. But there is no impropriety in anyone telling him how well they know and like his son or his new daughter-in-law. The guests, as soon as they have congratulated the bride and groom, go out and find themselves places, if it is to be a sit-down breakfast, at a table. Details of a sit-down breakfast. Unless the house is remarkable in size, there is usually a canopied platform built next to the veranda or on the lawn or over the yard of a city house. The entire space is packed with little tables surrounding the big one reserved for the bridal party, and at a large breakfast a second table is reserved for the parents of the bride and groom and a few close and especially invited friends. Place cards are not put on any of the small tables. All the guests, except the few placed at the two reserved tables, sit with whom they like, sometimes by prearrangement, but usually where they happen to find their friends, and room. The general sit-down breakfast, except in great houses like a few of those in Newport, is always furnished by a caterer, who brings all the food, tables, chairs, napery, china, and glass, as well as the necessary waiters. The butler and footmen belonging in the house may assist or oversee or detail themselves to other duties. Small menu cards printed in silver are put on all the tables. Sometimes these cards have the crest of the bride's father embossed at the top, but usually the entwined initials of the bride and groom are stamped in silver to match the wedding cake boxes. Example. Bouillon, lobster Newberg, supreme of chicken, peas, aspic of foie gras, celery salad, ices, coffee, Instead of bouillon, there may be caviar or melon, or grapefruit, or a puree, or clam broth. For lobster Newburg may be soft-shell crabs or oyster pâté or other fish. Or the bouillon may be followed by a dish such as sweetbreads and mushrooms, or chicken pâtés, or broiled chicken, a half a chicken for each guest. Or squab, with salad such as whole tomatoes filled with celery. Or the chicken or squab may be the second course, and an aspic with the salad, the third, Individual ices are accompanied by little cakes of assorted variety. There used always to be champagne. A substitute is at best a poor thing, and what the prevailing one is to be is as yet not determined. Orange juice and ginger ale, or white grape juice and ginger ale with sugar and mint leaves, are two attempts at a satisfying cup that have been offered lately. The Bride's Table The feature of the wedding breakfast is always the bride's table. Placed sometimes in the dining room, sometimes on the veranda or in a room apart, this table is larger and more elaborately decorated than any of the others. There are white garlands or sprays or other arrangements of white flowers, and in the center as chief ornament it is an elaborately iced wedding cake. On the top of it has a bouquet of white or silver flowers, or confectioner's quaint dolls representing the bride and groom. 
The top is usually made like a cover, so that when the time comes for the bride to cut it, it is merely lifted off. The bride always cuts the cake, meaning that she inserts the knife and makes one cut through the cake, after which each person cuts himself or herself a slice. If there are two sets of favors hidden in the cake, there is a mark in the icing to distinguish the bridesmaid's side from that of the usher's. Articles, each wrapped in silver foil, have been pushed through the bottom of the cake at intervals. The bridesmaids find a ten cent piece for riches, a little gold ring for first to be married, a thimble or little parrot or cat for old maid, a wishbone for the luckiest. On the usher's side, a button or dog is for the bachelor, a miniature pair of dice as a symbol of lucky chance in life. The ring and ten cent piece are the same. If a big piece of the wedding cake is left, The bride's mother has it wrapped in tin foil and put in a sealed tin box and kept for the bride to open on her first anniversary. The evolution of the wedding cake began in ancient Rome, where brides carried wheat ears in their left hands. Later, Anglo Saxon brides wore the wheat made into chaplets, and gradually the belief developed that a young girl who ate of the grains of wheat which became scattered on the ground would dream of her future husband. The next step was the baking of a thin dry biscuit, which was broken over the bride's head, and the crumbs divided amongst the guests. The next step was in making richer cake, then icing it, and the last, instead of having it broken over her head, the bride broke it herself into small pieces for the guests. Later she cut it with a knife. The Table of the Bride's Parents The table of the bride's parents differs from other tables in nothing except in its larger size, and the place cards for those who have been invited to sit there. The groom's father always sits on the right of the bride's mother, and the groom's mother has the place of honor on the host's right. The other places at the table are occupied by distinguished guests who may or may not include the clergyman who perform the ceremony. If a bishop or dean perform the ceremony, he is always included at this table, and is placed at the left of the hostess, and his wife, if present, sits at the bride's father's left. Otherwise, only especially close friends of the bride's parents are invited to this table. The Wedding Cake In addition to the big cake on the bride's table, there are at all weddings, near the front door, so that the guests may each take one as they go home, little individual boxes of wedding cake, black fruit cake. Each box is made of white moire or gross grain paper, embossed in silver with the last initial of the groom intertwined with that of the bride, and tied with white satin ribbon. At a sit down breakfast, the wedding cake boxes are sometimes put one at each place, on the tables, so that each guest may be sure of receiving one, and other thoughtless ones prevented from carrying more than their share away. The Standing Breakfast or Reception The standing breakfast differs from the sit down breakfast in service only. Instead of numerous small tables at which the guests are served with a coarse luncheon, a single long one is set in the dining room, the regular table pulled out to its farthest extent. It is covered with a plain white damask cloth, or it may be of embroidered linen and lace insertion. In the center is usually a bowl or vase or other centerpiece of white flowers. On it are piles of plates, stacks of napkins, and rows of spoons and forks at intervals, making four or possibly six piles altogether. Always there are dishes filled with little fancy cakes, chosen as much for looks as for taste. There is usually a big urn at one end filled with bouillon, and one at the other filled with chocolate or tea. In four evenly spaced places are placed two cold dishes, such as an aspic of chicken, or ham mousse, or a terrine de foie gras, or other aspic. The hot dishes may be a boned capon, vol au vent of sweetbread and mushrooms, creamed oysters, chicken a la king, chicken croquette, or there may be cold cuts or celery salad in tomato aspic. Whatever the choice may be, there are two or three cold dishes and at least two hot. Whatever there is must be selected with a view to its being easily eaten with a fork while the plate is held in the other hand. There are also rolls and biscuits, pâté de foie gras or lettuce and tomato sandwiches, the former made usually of split dinner rolls with pâté between, or thin sandwiches rolled like a leaf in which a moth has built a cocoon. Ices are brought in a little later when a number of persons have apparently finished their first course. Ice cream is quite as fashionable as individual ices. It is merely that caterers are less partial to it because it has to be cut. After dinner, coffee is put on a side table, as the champagne used to be. From now on, there will probably be a bowl or pitchers of something with a lump of ice in it that can be ladled into glasses and become whatever those gifted with imagination may fancy. 
Unless the wedding is very small, there is always a bride's table, decorated exactly as that described for a sit-down breakfast, and usually placed in the library, but there is no especial table for the bride's mother and her guests, or for anyone else. The bridal party eat. By the time the sit-down breakfast has reached its second course, and the queue of arriving guests has dwindled and melted away, the bride and groom decide that it is time they too go to breakfast. Arm in arm, they lead the way to their own table, followed by the ushers and bridesmaids. The bride and groom always sit next to each other, she on his right. The maid of honor, or matron, is on his left, and the best man is on the right of the bride. Around the rest of the table come bridesmaids and ushers alternately. Sometimes one or two others, sisters of the bride or groom, or intimate friends who were not included in the wedding party, are asked to the table, and when there are no bridesmaids, this is always the case. The decoration of the table, the service, the food, is exactly the same whether the other guests are seated or standing. At dessert, the bride cuts the cake, and the bridesmaids and ushers find the luck pieces. Dancing at the Wedding On leaving their table, the bridal party join the dancing, which by now has begun in the drawing room where the wedding group received. The bride and groom dance at first together, and then each with bridesmaids or ushers or other guests. Sometimes they linger so long that those who had intended staying for the going away grow weary and leave, which is often exactly what the young couple want. Unless they have to catch a train, they always stay until the crowd thins before going to dress for their journey. At last the bride signals to her bridesmaids and leaves the room. They all gather at the foot of the stairs, about halfway to the upper landing as she goes up. She throws her bouquet, and they all try to catch it. The one to whom it falls is supposed to be the next married. If she has no bridesmaids, she sometimes collects a group of other young girls and throws her bouquet to them. End of chapter 22, part 2「22」「Part 3」「Of Etiquette」「This is a LibriVox recording」「All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain」「For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org」Recording by Sarah Jennings「Etiquette in Society, in Business, in Politics, and at Home » by Emily Post « Chapter 22 » Part 3 – The Day of the Wedding Into Travelling Clothes The bride goes up to the room that has always been hers, followed by her mother, sisters, and bridesmaids, who stay with her while she changes into her travelling clothes. A few minutes after the bride has gone upstairs, the groom goes to the room reserved for him, and changes into the ordinary sack suit which the best man has taken there for him before the ceremony. He does not wear his top hat nor his wedding boutonniere. The groom's clothes should be apparently new, but need not actually be so. The bride's clothes, on the other hand, are always brand new, every article that she has on. The Going Away Dress A bride necessarily chooses her going away dress according to the journey she is to make. If she is starting off in an open motor, she wears a suitably small motor hat and a wrap of some sort over whatever dress or suit she chooses. If she is going on a train or boat, she wears a travelling dress, such as she would choose under ordinary circumstances. If she is going to a nearby hotel or a country house put at her disposal, she wears the sort of dress and hat suitable to town or country occasion. She should not dress as though about to join a circus parade, or the ornaments on a Christmas tree, unless she wants to be stared at and commented upon in a way that no one of good breeding can endure. The average bride and groom of good taste and feeling try to be as inconspicuous as possible. On one occasion, in order to hide the fact that they were bride and groom, a young couple went away in their oldest clothes and were very much pleased with their cleverness, until, pulling out his handkerchief, the groom scattered rice all over the floor of the parlour car. The bride's lament after this was, why had she not worn her prettiest things? The groom, having changed his clothes, waits upstairs in the hall, generally, until the bride emerges from her room in her travelling clothes. All the ushers shake hands with them both. His immediate family, as well as hers, have gradually collected. Any that are missing must unfailingly be sent for. The bride's mother gives her a last kiss. Her bridesmaids hurry downstairs to have plenty of rice ready and to tell everyone below as they descend, they are coming. A passage from the stairway and out the front door, all the way to the motor, is left free between two rows of eager guests, their hands full of rice. Upon the waiting motor the ushers have tied everything they can lay their hands on in the way of white ribbons and shoes and slippers. Here they come. At last the groom appears at the top of the stairs, 
a glimpse of the bride behind him. It surely is running the gauntlet. They seemingly count one, two, three, go. With shoulders hunched and collars held tight to their necks, they run through shrapnel of rice, down the stairs, out the hall, down the outside steps, into the motor, slam the door, and are off. The wedding guests stand out on the street or roadway, looking after them for as long as a vestige can be seen, and then gradually disperse. Occasionally young couples think it clever to slip out of the areaway, or over the roofs, or out of the cellar and across the garden. All this is supposed to be in order to avoid being deluged with rice and having labels of newly wed or large white bows and odd shoes and slippers tied to their luggage. Most brides, however, agree with their guests that it is decidedly spoil sport to deprive a lot of friends, who have only their good luck at heart, of the perfectly legitimate enjoyment of throwing emblems of good luck after them. If one white slipper among those thrown after the motor lands right side up, on top of it, and stays there, greatest good fortune is sure to follow through life. There was a time when the going away carriage was always furnished by the groom, and this is still the case if it is a hired conveyance. But nowadays, when nearly everyone has a motor, the newly married couple, if they have no motor of their own, are sure to have one lent them by the family of one of them. Very often they have two motors and are met by a second car at an appointed place, into which they change after shaking themselves free of rice. The white ribboned car returns to the house, as well as the decorated and labeled luggage, which was all empty, their real luggage having been bestowed safely by the best man that morning in their hotel or boat or train. Or it may be that they choose a novel journey, for there is, of course, no regulation vehicle. They can go off in a limousine, a pony cart, a yacht, a canoe, on horseback or by airplane. Fancy alone limits the mode of travel, suggests the destination, or directs the etiquette of a honeymoon. Bride's first duty of thought for groom's parents. At the end of the wedding there is one thing the bride must not forget. As soon as she is in her traveling dress, she must send a bridesmaid or someone out into the hall and ask her husband's parents to come and say goodbye to her. If his parents have not themselves come upstairs to see their son, the bride must have them sent for at once. It is very easy for a bride to forget this act of thoughtfulness, and for a groom to overlook the fact that he cannot stop to kiss his mother goodbye on his way out of the house, and many a mother seeing her son and new daughter rush past without even a glance from either of them has returned home with an ache in her heart. It sounds improbable, doesn't it? One naturally exclaims, But how stupid of her! Why didn't she go upstairs? Why didn't her son send for her? Usually she does, or he does. But often the groom's parents are strangers, and if by temperament they are shy or retiring people, they hesitate to go upstairs in an unknown house until they are invited to. So they wait, feeling sure that in good time they will be sent for. Meanwhile the bride forgets, and it does not occur to the groom that unless he makes an effort well upstairs, there will be no opportunity in the dash down to the carriage to recognize them or anyone. Flippancy versus Radiance a completely beautiful wedding is not merely a combination of wonderful flowers, beautiful clothes, smoothness of detail, delicious food. These, though all necessary, are external attributes. The spirit or soul of it must have something besides, and that something is in the behavior and in the expression of the bride and groom. The most beautiful wedding ever imagined could be turned from sacrament to circus by the indecorous behavior of the groom or the flippancy of the bride. She, above all, must not reach up and wig-wag signals while she is receiving, any more than she must wave to people as she goes up and down the aisle of the church. She must not cling to her husband, stand pigeon-toed, or lean against him or the wall or any person or thing. She must not run her arm through his and let her hand flop on the other side. She must not swing her arms as though they were dangling rope. She must not switch herself this way and that, nor must she hello or shout. No matter how young or natural and thoughtless she may be, she must, during the ceremony, and the short time that she stands beside her husband at the reception, assume that she has dignity. It is not by chance that the phrase happy pair is one of the most trite in our language, for happiness, above all, is the inner essential that must dominate a perfect wedding. An unhappy-looking bride, an unwilling-looking groom, turns the greatest wedding splendor into sham. Without love it is a sacrament inadvisedly entered into, and the sight of a tragic-faced bride strikes chill to the heart. The radiance of a truly happy bride is so beautifying that even a plain girl is made pretty, and a pretty one divine. There is something glad yet sweet, shy yet triumphant, serious yet radiant. There is no other way to put it. And a happy groom looks first of all protective. 
He, too, may have the quality of radiance, but it is different, more directly glad. They both look as though there were sunlight behind their eyes, as though their mouths irresistibly turned to smiles. No other quality of a bride's expression is so beautiful as radiance, that visible proof of perfect happiness, which endears its possessor to all beholders, and gives to the simplest little wedding complete beauty. THE HOUSE WEDDING A house wedding involves slightly less expenditure, but has the disadvantage of limiting the number of guests. The ceremony is exactly the same as that in a church, excepting that the procession advances through an aisle of white satin ribbons from the stairs down which the bridal party descends to the improvised altar. A small space near the altar is fenced off with ribbons for the family. There is a low rail of some sort back of which the clergyman stands, and something for the bride and groom to kneel on during the prayers of the ceremony. The prayer bench is usually about six or eight inches high, and between three or four feet long. At the back of it an upright on either end supports a cross-piece or altar rail. It can be made in the roughest fashion by any carpenter or amateur, as it is entirely hidden under leaves and flowers. On the kneeling surface of the bench are placed cushions rather than flowers, because the latter stain. All caterers have the necessary standards to which ribbons are tied, like the wires to telegraph poles. The top of each standard is usually decorated with a spray of white flowers. At a house wedding, the bride's mother stands at the door of the drawing room, or wherever the ceremony is to be, and receives people as they arrive. But the groom's mother merely takes her place near the altar with the rest of the immediate family. The ushers are purely ornamental, unless the house is so large that pews have been installed, and the guests are seated as in a church. Otherwise, the guests stand wherever they can find places behind the aisle ribbons. Just before the bride's entrance, her mother goes forward and stands in the reserved part of the room. The ushers go up to the top of the stairway. The wedding march begins, and the ushers come down two and two, followed by the bridesmaids, exactly as in a church, the bride coming last on her father's arm. The clergyman and the groom and best man have, if possible, reached the altar by another door. If the room has only one door, they go up the aisle a few moments before the bridal procession starts. The chief difference between a church and house wedding is that the bride and groom do not take a single step together. The groom meets her at the point where the service is read. After the ceremony, there is no recessional. The clergyman withdraws, an usher removes the prayer bench, and the bride and groom merely turn where they stand and receive the congratulations of their guests, unless, of course, the house is so big that they receive in another room. When there is no recessional, the groom always kisses the bride before they turn to receive their guests. It is against all tradition for anyone to kiss her before her husband does. There are seldom many bridal attendants at a house wedding, two to four ushers and one to four bridesmaids, unless the house is an immense one. In the country, a house wedding includes one in a garden, with a wedding procession under the trees, or tables out on the lawn. A perfect plan for California or other rainless states, but difficult to arrange on the Atlantic seaboard where rain is too likely to spoil everything. The Wedding in Assembly Rooms those whose houses are very small, and yet who wish to have a general reception, sometimes give the wedding breakfast in a hotel or assembly rooms. The preparations are identical with those in a private house. The decorations and menu may be lavish or simple. Although it is perfectly good form to hold a wedding reception in a ballroom, a breakfast in a private house, no matter how simple, has greater distinction than the most elaborate collation in a public establishment. Why this is so is hard to determine. It is probably that without a home atmosphere... Though it may be a brilliant entertainment, the sentiment is missing. The Second Marriage The detail of a spinster's wedding is the same whether she marries a bachelor or a widower, the difference being that a widower does not give a bachelor dinner. The marriage of a widow is the same as that of a maid, except she cannot wear white or orange blossoms, which are emblems of virginity, nor does she have bridesmaids. Usually a widow chooses a very quiet wedding, but there is no reason why she should not have a big wedding if she cares to, except that somber ushers and a bride in travelling dress, or at best a light afternoon one with a hat, does not make an effective processional, unless she is beautiful enough to compensate for all that is missing. A wedding in very best taste for a widow would be a ceremony in a small church or chapel, a few flowers or palms in the chancel the only decoration, and two to four ushers. There are no ribboned-off seats, as only very intimate friends are asked. The bride wears an afternoon street dress and hat. Her dress for a church ceremony should be more conventional than if she were married at home, where she could wear a semi-evening gown and substitute a headdress for a hat. She could even wear a veil if it is coloured, and does not suggest the bridal white one. 
a celebrated beauty wore for her second wedding in her own house a dress of gold brocade with a Russian court headdress and a veil of yellow tulle down the back. Another wore a dress of grey and a Dutch cap of silver lace, and had her little girl in quaint cap and long dress to match her own, as maid of honour. A widow has never more than one attendant, and most often none. There may be a sit-down breakfast afterwards, or the simplest afternoon tea. In any case, the breakfast is, if possible, at the bride's own house, and the bridal pair may either stay where they are, and have their guests take leave of them, or themselves drive away afterwards. Very intimate friends send presents for a second marriage, but general acquaintances are never expected to. Summary of Expenses All the expenses of a wedding belong to the bride's parents. The invitations are issued by them, the reception is at their house, and the groom's family are little more than ordinary guests. The cost of a wedding varies as much as the cost of anything else that one has or does. A big fashionable wedding can total far up in the thousands, and even the simplest entails considerable outlay, which can, however, be modified by those who are capable of doing things themselves instead of employing professional service at every point. The parents of the bride provide 1. Engraved invitations and cards. 2. The service of a professional secretary who compiles a single list from the various ones sent her, addresses the envelopes, both inner and outer, encloses the proper number of cards, seals, stamps, and mails all the invitations. This item can be omitted and the work done by the family. 3. The biggest item of expense, the trousseau of the bride, which may consist not alone of wearing apparel of endless variety and lavish detail, but household linen of the finest quality priceless in these days, and in quantity sufficient for a lifetime. Or it may consist of the wedding dress, and even that a travelling one, and one or two others, with barest essentials and few accessories. 4. Awnings for church and house. This may be omitted at the house in good weather, at the church, and also in the country. 5. Decorations of church and house. Cost can be eliminated by amateurs using garden or field flowers. 6. Choir, soloists, and organist at church. Choir and soloists are necessary. 7. Orchestra at house. This may mean 50 pieces with two leaders, or it may mean a piano, violin, and drum, or a violin, harp, and guitar. 8. Carriages or motors for the bridal party, from house to church and back. 9. The collation, which may be the most elaborate sit-down luncheon, or the simplest afternoon tea. 10. Boxes of wedding cake. 11. Champagne. Used to be one of the biggest items, as a fashionable wedding without plenty of it was unheard of. Perhaps, though, pocket books may have less relief on account of its omission than would at first seem probable, since what is saved on the wine bill is made up for on additional food necessary to make the best wineless menu seem other than meagre. 12. The bride's presents to her bridesmaids. Maybe jewels of value or trinkets of trifling cost. 13. A wedding present to the bride from each member of her family, not counting her trousseau, which is merely part of the wedding. 14. The bride gives a wedding present, or a wedding ring, or both, to the groom, if she especially wants to. Not necessary, or even customary. The groom's expenses are, 1. The engagement ring, as handsome as he can possibly afford. 2. A wedding present, jewels if he is able, always something for her personal adornment. 3. His bachelor dinner. 4. The marriage license. 5. A personal gift to his best man and each of his ushers. 6. To each of the above he gives their wedding ties, gloves, and boutonnieres. 7. The bouquet carried by the bride. In many cities it is said to be the custom for the bride to send boutonnieres to the ushers, and for the groom to order the bouquets of the bridesmaids. In New York's smart world, the bridesmaids' bouquets are looked upon as part of the decorative arrangement, all of which is in the province of the bride's parents. 8. The wedding ring. 9. The clergyman's fee. 10. From the moment the bride and groom start off on their wedding trip, all the expenditure becomes his. Wedding anniversaries. 1 year, paper. 5 years, wood. 10 years, tin. 15 years, crystal. 20 years, China. 25 years, silver. 50 years, gold. 75 years, diamond. Wedding anniversaries are celebrated in any number of ways. The party may be one of two alone, or it may be a dance. 
Most often it is a dinner, and occasionally an afternoon tea. In Germany, a silver wedding is a very important event, and a great celebration is made of it. But in America, it is not very good form to ask any but intimate friends and family to an anniversary party, especially as those bidden are supposed to send presents. These need not, however, be of value. In fact, the paper, wooden, and tin wedding presents are seldom anything but jokes. Crystal is the earliest that is likely to be taken seriously by the gift bearers. Silver is always serious, and the golden wedding a quite sacred event. Most usually, this last occasion is celebrated by a large family dinner to which all the children and grandchildren are bidden. Or the married couple perhaps choose an afternoon at home and receive their friends and neighbors, who are, of course, supposed to bring presents made of gold. End of chapter 22, part 3. Chapter 23 of Etiquette. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Betsy Bush, Marquette, Michigan, April 2007. Etiquette in Society, in Business, in Politics, and at Home by Emily Post. Chapter 23 Christenings. A child can, of course, be christened without making a festivity of it at all, just as two people can be married with none but the clergyman and two witnesses. But nearly every mother takes this occasion to see her friends and show her baby to them. Invitations to a christening are never formal, because none but the family and a very few intimate friends are supposed to be asked. In this day, invitations are nearly all sent over the telephone, except to those who are at a distance, or else friends are asked verbally when seen. But it is both correct and polite to write notes, such as, Dear Mrs. Kindheart, the baby is to be christened here at home, next Sunday at half-past four, and we hope you and Mr. Kindheart, and the children, if they care to, will come. Affectionately, Lucy Gilding. If a telephone message is sent, the form is, Mr. and Mrs. Gilding, Jr., would like Mr. and Mrs. Norman to come to the baby's christening on Sunday at half-past four at their house. Asking the Godparents Before setting the date for the christening, the godmothers, two for a girl and one for a boy, and the godfathers, two for a boy and one for a girl, have of course already been chosen. If a godfather or mother, after having given his consent, is abroad or otherwise out of reach at the time of the christening, a proxy takes part in the ceremony instead, and without thereby becoming a godfather. Since godparents are always most intimate friends, it is natural to ask them when they come to see the mother and the baby, which they probably do often, or to write them if at a distance. Sometimes they are asked at the same time that the baby's arrival is announced to them, occasionally even before. The gilding baby, for instance, supposedly sent the following telegram. Mrs. Richard Worldly, Great Estates. I arrived last night, and my mother and father were very glad to see me, and I am now eagerly waiting to see you. Your loving godson, Robert Gilding the Third. But more usually, a godparent at a distance is telegraphed. John Strong, Equitrust, Paris. It's a boy. Will you be godfather? Gilding. But in any case, a formally worded request is out of place. Do not write. My husband and I sincerely hope that you will consent to be our son's godmother, etc. Anyone so slightly known as this wording implies would not be asked to fill so close a position as that of godmother without great presumption on your part. You must never ask anyone to be a godmother or godfather whom you do not know intimately well as it is a responsibility not lightly to be undertaken and impossible to refuse. Godparents should, however, be chosen from among friends rather than relatives, since the sole advantage of godparents is that they add to the child's relatives, so that if it should be left alone in the world, its godparents become its protectors. But where a child is born with plenty of relatives, who can be called upon for advice and affection and assistance in event of his or her becoming an orphan, Godparents are often chosen from among them. Nothing could be more senseless, however, than choosing grandparents, since the relationship is as close as can be anyway, and the chances that the parents will outlive their own parents make such a choice still more unsuitable. 
In France, the godmother is considered, next to the parents and grandparents, the nearest relative a child can have. In some European countries, the queen, or another who is above the parents in rank, assumes a special protectorate over her godchild. In this instance, the godmother appoints herself. In America, a similar situation cannot very well exist, though on rare occasions an employer volunteers to stand as godfather for an employee's child. Godparents must, of course, give the baby a present, if not before, at least at the christening. The standard gift is a silver mug, a porringer, or a knife, fork, and spoon, marked usually with the baby's name and that of the giver. Robert Gilding the Third, from his godfather, John Strong. Or the presents may be anything else they fancy. In New England, a very rich godfather sometimes gives the baby a bond, which is kept with interest intact until a girl is eighteen or a boy twenty-one. Time of Christening In other days of stricter observances, a baby was baptized in the Catholic and High Episcopal Church on the first or at least second Sunday after its birth. But today the christening is usually delayed, at least until the young mother is up and about again. Often it is put off for months, and in some denominations children need not be christened until they are several years old. The most usual age is from two to six months. If the family is very high church, or the baby is delicate, and its christening therefore takes place when it is only a week or two old, the mother is carried into the drawing-room and put on a sofa near the improvised font. She is dressed in a becoming negligee and perhaps a cap, and with lace pillows behind her and a cover equally decorative over her feet. The guests in this event are only the family and the fewest possible intimate friends. The Christening in Church In arranging for the ceremony, the clergyman, of course, is consulted and the place and hour arranged. If it is to be in church, it can take place at the close of the regular service on Sunday. But if a good deal is to be made of the christening, a weekday is chosen, and an hour when the church is not being otherwise used. The decorations, if any at all, consist of a few palms or some flowering plants grouped around the font, and the guests invited for the christening take places in the pews, which are nearest to the font, wherever that happens to be. As soon as the clergyman appears, the baby's coat and cap are taken off, in any convenient pew, not necessarily the nearest one, and the godmother, holding the baby in her arms, stands directly in front of the clergyman. The other godparents stand beside her, and other relatives and friends nearby. The godmother who is holding the baby must be sure to pronounce its name distinctly. In fact, it is a wise precaution, if it is a long or an unusual one, to show the name printed on a slip of paper to the clergyman beforehand, as more than one baby has been given a name not intended for it. And whatever name the clergyman pronounces is fixed for life. The little town girl, who was to be called Marion, is actually Mary Ann. As soon as the ceremony is over, the godmother hands the baby back to its nurse, who puts on its cap and coat, and it is then driven with all its relatives and friends to the house of its parents or grandparents, where a lunch or an afternoon tea has been arranged. House Christening Unless forbidden by the church to which the baby's parents belong, the house christening is by far the easier, safer, and prettier. Easier because the baby does not have to have wraps put on and off, and be taken out and brought in. Safer, because it is not apt to catch cold, and prettier for a dozen reasons. The baby in the first place looks much prettier in a dress that has not been crushed by having a coat put over it and taken off, and put on and off again. In the second place, a baby brought down from the nursery without any fussing is generally good, whereas one that has been dressed and undressed, and taken hither and yon, is apt to be upset and therefore to cry. If it cries in church, it just has to cry. In a house, it can be taken into another room and be brought back again after it has been made more comfortable. It is trying to a young mother who is proud of her baby's looks to go to no end of trouble to get exquisite clothes for it and ask all her friends in and then have it look exactly like a tragedy mask carved in a beat. And you can scarcely expect a self-respecting baby who is hauled and mauled and taken to a strange place and handed to a strange person who pours cold water on it not to protest. And alas, it has only one means. 
The arrangements made for a house christening are something like those made for a house wedding, only much simpler. The drawing room, or wherever the ceremony is to be performed, is often decorated with pots of pale pink roses or daisies, or branches of dogwood or white lilacs. Nothing is prettier than the blossoms of fruit trees, if they can be persuaded to keep their petals on, or any other spring flowers. In summer, there are all the garden flowers. In autumn, cosmos and white chrysanthemums, or at any season, baby's breath and roses. The font is usually a bowl, of silver usually, put on a small, high table. A white napkin on the table inevitably suggests a restaurant rather than a ritual, and is therefore unfortunate, and most people of taste prefer to have the table covered with old church brocade, an arrangement of flowers, either standing behind or laid upon it, so that the stems are toward the center, and covered by the base of the bowl. If the clergyman is to wear vestments, a room must be put at his disposal. At the hour set for the ceremony, the clergyman enters the room first, and takes his place at the font. The guests naturally make way, forming an open aisle. If not, the baby's father or another member of the family clears an aisle. The godmother carries the baby, and follows the clergyman. The other two godparents walk behind her, and all three stand near the font. At the proper moment, the clergyman takes the baby, baptizes it, and hands it back to the godmother, who holds it until the ceremony is over. THE CHRISTENING DRESS The christening dress is always especially elaborate and beautiful. Often it is one that was worn by the baby's mother, father, or even its grand or great-grandparent. Baby clothes should be as sheer as possible and as soft. The ideal dress is of mull, with much or little Valenciennes lace, real, and finest hand embroidery. But however much or little its trimmings, it must be exquisite in texture. In fact, everything for a baby ought to be handmade. It can be as plain as a charity garment, but of fine material and tiny hand stitches. If the baby is very little, it is usually laid on a lace-trimmed pillow. This lace, too, must be Valenciennes. The godmother or godmothers should wear the sort of clothes that they would wear at an afternoon tea. The godfather or fathers should wear formal afternoon clothes. The other guests wear ordinary afternoon clothes, and the mother, unless on the sofa, wears a light-colored afternoon dress. She should not wear black on this occasion. As soon as the ceremony is performed, the clergyman goes to the room that was set apart for him, changes into his ordinary clothes, and then returns to the drawing-room to be one of the guests at luncheon or tea. The godmother hands the baby to the nurse, or maybe to its mother, and everyone gathers around to admire it, and the party becomes exactly like every informal afternoon tea. The only difference between an ordinary informal tea and a christening is that a feature of the latter is a christening cake and caudle. The christening cake is generally a white lady cake, elaborately iced, sometimes with the baby's initials and garlands of pink sugar roses, and although, according to cookbooks, caudle is a gruel, the actual caudle, invariably served at christenings, is a hot eggnog, drunk out of little punch cups. One is supposed to eat the cake as a sign that one partakes of the baby's hospitality, and is therefore its friend, and to drink the caudle to its health and prosperity. But by this time the young host or hostess is peacefully asleep in the nursery. End of chapter 23 Christenings Chapter 24 of Etiquette This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chris Gladys Etiquette in Society in Business, in Politics, and at Home, by Emily Post. Chapter 24. Funerals. At no time does solemnity so possess our souls as when we stand deserted at the brink of darkness into which our loved one has gone. And the last place in the world where we would look for comfort at such a time is in the seeming artificiality of etiquette. Yet, it is in the moment of deepest sorrow that etiquette performs its most vital 
and real service. All set rules for social observance have for their object the smoothing of personal contacts, and in nothing is smoothness so necessary as in observing the solemn rites accorded our dead. It is the time-worn servitor, etiquette, who draws the shades, who muffles the bell, who keeps the house quiet, who hushes voices and footsteps and sudden noises, who stands between well-meaning and importunate outsiders, and the retirement of the bereaved, who decrees that the last rites shall be performed smoothly and with beauty and gravity, so that the poignancy of grief may, in so far as possible, be assuaged. First Details As soon as death occurs, someone, the trained nurse usually, draws the blinds in the sick room and tells a servant to draw all the blinds of the house. If they are not already present, the first act of someone at the bedside is to telephone or telegraph the immediate members of the family, the clergyman, and the sexton of the church to which the family belong, and possibly one or two closest friends whose competence and sympathy can be counted on, as there are many things which must be done for the stricken family as well as for the deceased. The sexton of nearly every Protestant church is also undertaker. If he is not, then an outside funeral director is sent for. If the illness has been a long one, it may be that the family has become attached to the trained nurse, and no one is better fitted than she to turn her ministrations from the one whom she can no longer help to those who have now very real need of just such care as she can give. If the death was sudden, or the nurse unsympathetic or for other reasons unavailable, then a relative or near friend of practical sympathy is the ideal attendant in charge. CONSIDERATION FOR THE FAMILY Persons under the shock of genuine affliction are not only upset mentally, but are all unbalanced physically. No matter how calm and controlled they seemingly may be, no one can, under such circumstances, be normal. Their disturbed circulation makes them cold, their distress makes them unstrung, sleepless. Persons they normally like, they often turn from. No one should ever be forced upon those in grief, and all over-emotional people, no matter how near or dear, should be barred absolutely. Although the knowledge that their friends love them and sorrow for them is a great solace, the nearest afflicted must be protected from anyone or anything which is likely to overstrain nerves already at the threatening point and none have the right to feel hurt if they are told they can neither be of use nor be received. At such a time, to some people, companionship is a comfort. Others shrink from dearest friends. One who is by choice or accident selected to come in contact with those in new affliction should, like a trained nurse, banish all consciousness of self. Otherwise, he or she will be of no service, and service is the only gift of value that can be offered. First Aid to the Bereaved First of all, the ones in sorrow should be urged, if possible, to sit in a sunny room and where there is an open fire. If they feel unequal to going to the table, a very little food should be taken to them on a tray. A cup of tea or coffee or bouillon, a little thin toast, a poached egg, milk, if they like it hot, or milk toast. Cold milk is bad for one who is already overchilled. The cook may suggest something that usually appeals to their taste, but very little should be offered at a time, for although the stomach may be empty, the palate rejects the thought of food and digestion is never in best order. It sounds paradoxical to say that those in sorrow should be protected from all contacts, and yet 
that they must be constantly asked about arrangements and given little time to remain utterly undisturbed. They must think of people they want sent for. They must decide the details of the funeral, when they would like it held, and whether in church or at the house, whether they want special music or flowers ordered, and where the internment is to be. On Duty at Door A friend or servant is always stationed in the hall to open the door, receive notes and cards, and to take messages. In a big house, the butler, in his day clothes, should answer the bell, with the parlour maid to assist him, until a footman can procure a black livery and take his or her place. A parlour maid or waitress at the door should wear either a black or grey dress with her plainest white apron, collar, and cuffs. Member of Family in Charge A close friend or male member of the family should be, if not at the door, as near the front hall as possible, to see the countless people with whom details have to be arranged, to admit to a member of the family anyone they may want to see, and to give news to or take messages from others. As people come to the house to inquire and offer their services, he gives them commissions the occasion requires. The first friend who hurries through the house, in answer to the telephone message which announced the death, is asked to break the news to an invalid connection of the family. Or he may be sent to the florist to order the bell hung, or to the station to meet a child arriving from school. Notice to Papers The sexton, or other funeral director, sends the notices to the daily papers announcing the death, and the time and place of the funeral. The form is generally selected by a member of the family from among those appearing in that day's newspapers. These notices are paid for by the sexton and put on his bill. With the exception of the telephone messages or telegrams to relatives and very intimate friends, no other notices are sent out. Only those persons who are expected to go to the house at once have messages sent to them. All others are supposed to read the notice in the papers. When the notice reads, Funeral Private, and neither place nor time is given, very intimate friends are supposed to ask for these details at the house. Others understand they are not expected. Hanging the Bell As a rule, the funeral director hangs crepe streamers on the bell, white ones for a child, black and white for a young person, or black for an older person. This signifies to the passerby that it is a house of mourning, so that the bell will not be rung unnecessarily nor long. If they prefer, the family sometimes orders a florist to hang a bunch of violets or other purple flowers on black ribbon streamers for a grown person, or white violets, white carnations, any white flower without leaves, on the black ribbon for a young woman or man, or white flowers on white gauze or ribbon for a child. Checking Expenses in Advance It is curious that long association with the sadness of death seems to have deprived an occasional funeral director of all sense of moderation. Whether the temptation of good business gradually undermines his character, knowing as he does that bereaved families ask no questions, or whether his profession is merely devoid of taste, he will, if not checked, bring the most ornate and expensive casket in his establishment. He will perform every rite that his professional ingenuity for expenditure can devise. He will employ every attendant he has. He will order vehicles numerous enough for the cortege of a president. He will even if thrown in contact with a bewildered chief mourner, secure a pledge for the erection of an elaborate mausoleum. Someone, therefore, who has the family's interest at heart, and knows their taste and purse, should go personally 
to the establishment of the undertaker, and not only select the coffin, but go carefully into the specifications of all other details, so that everything necessary may be arranged for, and unnecessary items omitted. This does not imply that a family that prefers a very elaborate funeral should not be allowed to have one, but the great majority of people have moderate rather than unlimited means, and it is not unheard of that a small estate is seriously depleted by vulgarly lavish and entirely inappropriate funeral expenses. One would be a poor sort, who, for the sake of friends, would not willingly endure a little troublesome inquiry, rather than witness a display of splurge and bad taste, and realize, at the same time, that the friends who might have been protected will be deluged with bills which it cannot but embarrass them to pay. Honorary Pallbearers The member of the family who is in charge will ask, either when they come to the house, or by telephone or telegraph if they are at a distance, six or eight men who are close friends of the deceased to be the pallbearers. When a man has been prominent in public life, he may have twelve or more from among his political or business associates, as well as his lifelong social friends. Near relatives are never chosen, as their place is with the women of the family. For a young woman, her own friends, or those of her family, are chosen. It is a service that may not, under any circumstances except serious ill-health, be refused. The one in charge will tell the pallbearers where they are to meet. It used to be customary for them to go to the house on the morning of the funeral and drive to the church behind the hearse, but as everything tending to a conspicuous procession is being gradually done away with, it is often preferred to have them wait in the vestibule of the church. Honorary pallbearers serve only at church funerals. They do not carry the coffin, for the reason that, being unaccustomed to bearing such a burden, one of them might possibly stumble, or at least give an impression of uncertainty or awkwardness that might detract from the solemnity of the occasion. The sexton's assistants are trained for this service, so as to prevent, in so far as is humanly possible, a blundering occurrence. Morning for Funeral among those who come to the house there is sure to be a woman friend of the family whose taste and method of expenditure is similar to theirs. She looks through the clothes they have to see if there is not a black dress or suit that can be used, and makes a list of only the necessary articles which will have to be procured. All dressmaking establishments give precedence to morning orders, and will fill a commission within twenty-four hours. These first things are made invariably without bothering the wearer with fitting. Alterations, if required, are made later. Or, the morning departments of the big stores and specialty shops are always willing to send a selection on approval, so that a choice can be made by the family in the privacy of their own homes. Nearly always, acquaintances who are themselves in mourning offer to lend crepe veils, toques, and wraps, so that the garments which must be bought at first may be as few as possible. Most women have a plain black suit or dress, the trimming of which can quickly be replaced with crepe by a maid or a friend. Most men are of standard size, and can go to a clothier and buy a ready-made black suit. Otherwise, they must borrow or wear what they have as no tailor can make a suit in twenty-four hours. Sitting up no longer customary. Unless the deceased was a prelate, or personage whose lying in state is a public ceremony, or unless it is the special wish of the relatives, the solemn vigil through long nights by the side of the coffin is no longer essential as a mark of veneration or love for the departed. 
nor is the soulless body dressed in elaborate trappings of farewell grandeur. Everything today is done to avoid unnecessary evidence of the change that has taken place. In case of a very small funeral, the person who has passed away is sometimes left lying in bed in night clothes, or on a sofa in a wrapper, with flowers, but no set pieces about the room, so that an invalid or other sensitive bereft one may say farewell, without ever seeing the all-too-definite finality of a coffin. In any event, the last attentions are paid in accordance with the wish of those most nearly concerned. Extra Work for Servants Kindness of heart is latent in all of us, and servants, even if they have not been long with a family, rise to the emergency of such a time as that of a funeral, which always puts additional work upon them, and often leaves them to manage under their own initiative. The house is always full of people, family and intimate friends occupy all available accommodation, but it is a rare household which does not give sympathy as generously below stairs as above, and he or she would be thought very heartless by their companions, who did not willingly and helpfully assume a just share of the temporary tax on energy, time, and consideration. CHURCH FUNERAL The church funeral is the more trying, in that the family have to leave the seclusion of their house and face a congregation. On the other hand, many who find solemnity only in a church service with the added beauty of choir and organ prefer to take their heart-rending farewell in the house of God. ARRANGING AND RECORDING FLOWERS an hour before the time for the service, if the family is Protestant, one or two woman friends go to the church to arrange the flowers which are placed about the chancel. Unless they have had unusual practice in such arrangement, they should, if possible, have the assistance of a florist, as effective grouping and fastening of heavy wreaths and sprays is apt to overtax the ingenuity of novices, no matter how perfect their usual taste may be. Whoever takes charge of the flowers must be sure to collect carefully all the notes and cards. They should always take extra pencils, in case the points break, and write on the outside of each envelope a description of the flowers that the card was sent with. Spray of Easter lilies and palm branches tied with white ribbon. Wreath of laurel leaves and gardenias. Long sheaf of pink roses and white lilacs. These descriptions will afterward help identify and recall the flowers when notes of thanks are sent. As the appointed time for the funeral draws near, the organ plays softly, the congregation gradually fills the church, the first pews on either side of the center aisle are left empty. THE PROCESSIONAL At the appointed time, the funeral procession forms in the vestibule. If there is to be a choral service, the minister and the choir enter the church from the rear and precede the funeral cortege. Directly after the choir and clergy come the pallbearers, two by two, then the coffin, covered with flowers, and then the family. The chief mourner comes first, leaning upon the arm of her closest male relative. Usually, each man is escort for a woman, but two women or two men may walk together according to the division of the family. If the deceased is one of four sons, where there is no daughter, the mother and father walk immediately behind the body of their child, followed by the two elder sons, and behind them the younger, with the nearest woman relative. If there is a grandmother, she walks with the eldest son, and the younger two follow together. If it is a family of daughters who are following their father, the eldest daughter may walk with her mother, or the mother may walk with her brother or a son-in-law. Although the arrangement of the procession is thus fixed, 
those in affliction should be placed next to the one whose nearness may be of most comfort to them. A younger child, who is calm and soothing, would better be next to his mother than an older, who is of more nervous temperament. At the funeral of a woman, her husband sometimes walks alone, but usually with his mother or his daughter. A very few intimate friends walk at the rear of the family, followed by the servants of the household. At the chancel, the choir take their accustomed places. The minister stands at the foot of the chancel steps. The honorary pallbearers take their places in the front pews on the left, and the coffin is set upon a stand previously placed there for the purpose. The bearers of the coffin walk quietly around to inconspicuous stations on a side aisle. The family occupy the front pews in the right. The rest of the procession fill vacant places on either side. The service is then read. THE RECESSIONAL Upon the conclusion of the service, the procession moves out in the same order as it came in, excepting that the choir remain in their places and the honorary pallbearers go first. Outside the church, the coffin is put into the hearse, the family getting into carriages or motors waiting immediately behind, and the flowers are put into a covered vehicle. It is very vulgar to fill open landaus with displayed floral offerings and parade through the streets. Few go to the burial. If the burial is in the churchyard, or otherwise within walking distance, the congregation naturally follows the family to the graveside. Otherwise, the general congregation no longer expects nor wishes to go to the internment, which, excepting at a funeral of public importance, is witnessed only by the immediate family and the most intimate friends, who are asked if they care to go. The long line of carriages that used to stand at the church, ready to be filled with a long file of mere acquaintances, is a barbarous thing of the past. House Funeral Many people prefer a house funeral. It is simpler, more private, and obviates the necessity for those in sorrow to face people. The nearest relatives may stay apart in an adjoining room, or even upon the upper floor, where they can hear the service, but remain in unseen seclusion. Ladies keep their wraps on. Gentlemen wear their overcoats, or carry them on their arms, and hold their hats in their hands. Music To many people there is a lack of solemnity in a service outside of a church and lacking the accompaniment of the organ. It is almost impossible to introduce orchestral music that does not sound either dangerously suggestive of the gaiety of entertainment or else thin and flat. A quartet or choral singing is beautiful and appropriate, if available. Otherwise, there is usually no music at a house funeral. House Arrangement Some authorities say that only the flowers sent by very close friends should be shown at a house funeral, and that it is ostentatious to make a display. But when people, or societies, have been kind enough to send flowers, it would certainly be wanting in appreciation, to say the least, to relegate their offerings to the backyard, or wherever it is that the cavaliers would have them hid. In a small house, where flowers would be overpowering, it is customary to insert in the death notice, It is requested that no flowers be sent, or Kindly omit flowers. Arrangement for the service is usually made in the drawing-room, and the coffin is placed in front of the mantel, or between the windows, but always at a distance from the door, usually on stands brought by the funeral director, who also brings enough camp chairs to fill the room without crowding. A friend, or a member of the family, collects the cards and arranges the flowers behind and at the side and against the stands of the coffin. If there is to be a blanket, 
or a pall of smilax or other leaves with or without flowers fastened to a frame or sewed on thin material and made into a covering, it is always ordered by the family. Otherwise, the wreaths to be placed on the coffin are chosen from among those sent by the family. The Service As friends arrive, they are shown to the room where the ceremony is to be held, but they take their own places. A room must be apportioned to the minister in which to put on his vestments. At the hour set for the funeral, the immediate family, if they feel like being present, take their places in the front row of chairs. The women wear small hats or toques and long crepe veils over their faces so that their countenances may be hidden. The minister takes his stand at the head of the coffin and reads the service. At its conclusion, the coffin is carried out to the hearse, which, followed by a small number of carriages, proceeds to the cemetery. It is very rare nowadays for any but a small group of relatives and intimate men-friends to go to the cemetery, and it is not thought unloving or slighting of the dead for no women at all to be at the graveside. If any women are to be present, and the internment is to be in the ground, someone should order the grave lined with boughs and green branches, to lessen the impression of bare earth. Distant Country Funeral In the country, where relatives and friends arrive by train, carriages or motors must be provided to convey them to the house or church or cemetery. If the clergyman has no conveyance of his own, he must always be sent for, and if the funeral is in a house, a room must be set apart for him in which to change his clothes. It is unusual for a family to provide a special car. Sometimes the hour of the funeral is announced in the papers as taking place on the arrival of a certain train, but everyone who attends is expected to pay his own railway fare and make, if necessary, his own arrangements for lunch. Only when the country place where the funeral is held is at a distance from town and a long drive from the railway station, a light repast of bouillon, rolls, and tea and sandwiches may be spread on the dining-room table. Otherwise, refreshments are never offered, except to those of the family, of course, who are staying in the house. House Restored to Order While the funeral cortege is still at the cemetery, someone who is in charge at home must see that the mourning emblem is taken off the bell, that the windows are opened, the house aired from the excessive odor of flowers, and the blinds pulled up. Any furniture that has been displaced should be put back where it belongs, and unless the day is too hot, a fire should be lighted in the library or principal bedroom to make a little more cheerful the sad homecoming of the family. It is also well to prepare a little hot tea or broth, and it should be brought them upon their return without their being asked if they would care for it. Those who are in great distress want no food, but if it is handed to them they will mechanically take it, and something warm to start digestion and stimulate impaired circulation is what they most need. Morning A generation or two ago the regulations for mourning were definitely prescribed, definite periods according to the precise degree of relationship of the mourner. One's real feelings, whether of grief or comparative indifference, had nothing to do with the outward manifestation one was obliged, in decency, to show. The tendency today is toward sincerity. People do not put on black for aunts, uncles, and cousins unless there is a deep tie of affection as well as of blood. Many persons today do not believe in going into mourning at all. There are some who believe, as do the races of the East, that great love should be expressed in rejoicing in the rebirth of a beloved spirit, instead of selfishly mourning their own earthly loss. But many who object to manifestations of grief find themselves impelled to wear mourning when their sorrow comes, 
and the number of those who do not put on black is still comparatively small. Protection of Mourning If you see acquaintances of yours in deepest mourning, it does not occur to you to go up to them and babble trivial topics, or ask them to a dance or dinner. If you pass close to them, irresistible sympathy compels you merely to stop and press their hand and move on. A widow or mother, in the newness of her long veil, has her hard path made as little difficult as possible by every one with whom she comes in contact, no matter on what errand she may be bent. A clerk in a store will try to wait on her as quickly and as attentively as possible. Acquaintances avoid stopping her with long conversation that could not but torture and distress her. She meets small kindnesses at every turn, which save unnecessary jars to supersensitive nerves. Once in a great while, a tactless person may have no better sense than to ask her abruptly for whom she is in mourning. Such people would not hesitate to walk over the graves in a cemetery, and fortunately such encounters are few. Since many people, however, dislike long mourning veils and all crepe generally, it is absolutely correct to omit both if preferred, and to wear an untrimmed coat and hat of plainest black, with or without a veil. A WORD OF ECONOMY In the first days of stress, people sometimes give away every colored article they possess, and not until later are they aware of the effort necessary, to say nothing of the expense, of getting an entire new wardrobe. Therefore it is well to remember. Dresses and suits can be dyed without ripping. Any number of fabrics, all woolens, soft silks, canton crepe, georgette, and chiffon, dye perfectly. Buttonholes have sometimes to be reworked, snaps or hooks and eyes changed to black, a bit of trimming taken off or colored with dull braid, silk, or crepe, and the clothes look every bit as well as though newly ordered. Straw hats can be painted with an easily applied stain sold in every drug and department store for the purpose. If you cannot trim hats yourself, a milliner can easily imitate or, if necessary, simplify the general outline of the trimming as it was, and a seamstress can easily cover dyed trimmings on dresses with crepe or dull silk. Also, tan shoes, nearly all footwear made of leather, can be dyed black and made to look like new by any first-class shoemaker. Morning Materials Lusterless silks, such as crepe de chin, georgette, chiffon, grograine, peau de choix, dull finish charmousse, and taffeta, and all plain woolen materials are suitable for deepest mourning. Uncut velvet is as deep mourning as crepe, but cut velvet is not mourning at all, nor is satin or lace. The only lace permissible is a plain or hem-stitched net known as footing. Fancy weaves in stockings are not mourning, nor is bright jet or silver. A very perplexing decree is that clothes entirely of white are deepest mourning, but the addition of a black belt or hat or gloves produces second mourning. Patent leather and satin shoes are not mourning. People in second mourning wear all combinations of black and white, as well as clothes of gray and mauve. Many of the laws for materials seem arbitrary, and people interpret them with greater freedom than they used to, but never, under any circumstances, can one who is not entirely in colors wear satin embroidered in silver or trimmed with jet and lace. With the exception of wearing a small string of pearls and a single ring, especially if it is an engagement ring, jewelry with deepest mourning is never in good taste. WHEN A VEIL IS NOT WORN Nor should a woman ever wear a crepe veil to the theater or restaurant or any public place of amusement. On the other hand, 
people left long to themselves and their own thoughts grow easily morbid, and the opera or concert or an interesting play may exert a beneficial relaxation. Gay restaurants with thumping, strident musical accompaniment or entertainments of the cabaret variety need scarcely be commented upon. But to go to a matinee with a close friend or relative is becoming more and more usual, and the picture theatres, where one may sit in the obscurity and be diverted by the story on the silver screen which, requiring no mental effort, often diverts a sad mind for an hour or so, is an undeniable blessing. An observer would have to be much at a loss for material who could find anything to criticize in seeing a family together under such circumstances. One generally leaves off a long veil, however, for such an occasion, and drives bareheaded, if it be evening, or substitutes a short black face veil over one's hat on entering and leaving a building in the daytime. Morning for Country Wear Except for church, crepe veils and clothes heavily trimmed with crepe are not appropriate in the country, ever. Morning clothes for the summer consist of plain black serge or tweed, silk or cotton material, all black with white organdy collar and cuffs, and a veilless hat with a brim. Or one may dress entirely in dull materials of white. A Widow's Mourning A widow used never to wear any but woolen materials, made as plain as possible, with deep-hemmed turn-back cuffs and collar of white organdy. On the street she wore a small crepe bonnet, with a little cap border of white crepe or organdy, and a long veil of crepe or nun's veiling to the bottom edge of her skirt, over her face as well as down her back. At the end of three months the front veil was put back from over her face, but the long veil was worn two years at least, and frequently for life. These details are identical with those prescribed today, excepting that she may wear lusterless silks as well as wool. The duration of mourning may be shorter, and she need never wear her veil over her face except at the funeral unless she chooses. A widow of mature years who follows old-fashioned conventions wears deep mourning with crepe veil for two years, black the third year, and second mourning the fourth. But shorter periods of mourning are becoming more and more the custom, and many consider three or even two years conventional. The Very Young Widow The young widow should wear deep crepe for a year, and then lighter mourning for six months, and second mourning for six months longer. There is nothing more utterly captivating than a sweet young face under a widow's veil, and it is not to be wondered at that her own loneliness and need of sympathy, combined with all that is appealing to sympathy in a man, results in the healing of her heart. She should, however, never remain in mourning for her first husband after she has decided she can be consoled by a second. There is no reason why a woman, or a man, should not find such consolation, but she should keep the intruding attraction away from her thoughts until the year of respect is up, after which she is free to put on colors and make happier plans. Morning Worn by a Mother A mother who has lost a grown child wears the same mourning as that prescribed for a widow, excepting the white cap ruche. Some mothers wear mourning for their children always. Others do not believe in being long in black for a spirit that was young, and, for babies or very young children, wear colorless clothes of white or gray or mauve. A Daughter or Sister A daughter or sister wears a long veil over her face at the funeral. The length of the veil may be to her waist or to the hem of her skirt, and it is worn for from three months to a year, according to her age and feelings. An older woman wears deep black for her parents, sisters, and brothers for a year, and then lightens her mourning during the second year. A young girl, 
if she is out in society or in college, may wear a long veil for her parents or her betrothed if she wants to. Or she wears a thin net veil, edged with crepe, and the corners falling a short way down her back. Or none at all. Very young girls, of from fourteen to eighteen, wear black for three months, and then six months of black and white. They never wear veils of any sort, nor are their clothes trimmed in crepe. Children, from eight to fourteen, wear black and white and gray for six months, for a parent, brother, sister, or grandparent. Young children are rarely put into mourning, though their clothes are often selected to avoid vivid color. They usually wear white, with no black, except a hair ribbon for the girls, and a necktie for the boys. Very little children in black are too pitiful. Extreme Fashion Inappropriate Fancy clothes in mourning are always offenses against good taste, because, as the word implies, a person is in mourning. To have the impression of fashion dominant is contrary to the purpose of somber dress. It is a costume for the spirit, a covering for the visible body of one whose soul seeks the background. Nothing can be in worse taste than crepe which is gathered and rushed and puffed and pleated and made into waterfalls and imitation ostrich feathers as garnishing for a hat. The more absolutely plain, the more appropriate and dignified is the morning dress. A long veil is a shade pulled down, a protection. It should never be a flaunting arrangement to arrest the amazed attention of the passerby. The necessity for dignity cannot be overemphasized. Bad Taste in Mourning Mourning observances are all matters of fixed form, and any deviation from precise convention is interpreted by the world at large as signifying want of proper feeling. How often has one heard said of a young woman who was perhaps merely ignorant of the effect of her inappropriate clothes or unconventional behavior, Look at her, and her dear father scarcely cold in his grave. Or, Little she seems to have cared for her mother, and such a lovely one she had, too. Such remarks are as thoughtless as are the actions of the daughter, but they point to an undeniable condition. Better far not wear mourning at all, saying you do not believe in it, than allow your unseemly conduct to indicate indifference to the memory of a really beloved parent. Better that a young widow should go out in scarlet and yellow on the day after her husband's funeral than wear weeds which attract attention on account of their flaunting bad taste and flippancy. One may not, one must not, one cannot wear— the very last cry of exaggerated fashion in crepe. Nor may one be boisterous or flippant or sloppy in manner, without giving the impression to all beholders that one's spirit is posturing, tripping, or dancing on the grave of sacred memory. This may seem exaggerated, but if you examine the expressions, you will find that they are essentially true. Draw the picture for yourself. A slim figure, if you like, held in the posture of the caterpillar slout, a long length of stocking, so thin as to give the effect of shaded skin, above high-heeled slippers with sparkling buckles of bright jet, a short skirt, a scrappy, thin, low-necked, short-sleeved blouse through which white underclothing shows various edgings of lace and ribbons, and on top of this, a painted face under a long crepe veil. Yet the wearer of this costume may in nothing but appearance resemble the unmentionable class of women she suggests. As a matter of fact, she is very likely a perfectly decent young person, and really sad at heart, and her clothes and make-up not different from countless others who pass unnoticed, because their colored clothing suggests no mockery of solemnity. Morning Wear for Men 
The necessity of business and affairs, which has made withdrawal into seclusion impossible, has also made it customary for the majority of men to go into mourning by the simple expedient of putting a black band on their hat or on the left sleeve of their usual clothes, and wearing only white instead of colored linen. A man never, under any circumstances, wears crepe. The band on his hat is a very fine cloth, and varies in width according to the degree of mourning, from about two and a half inches to within half an inch on the top of a high hat. On other hats, the width is fixed at about two and a half or three inches. The sleeve band, from three and a half to four and a half inches in width, is of dull broadcloth on overcoats or winter clothing, and of serge on summer clothes. The sleeve band of mourning is sensible for many reasons, the first being that of economy. Men's clothes do not come successfully from the encounter with dye vats, nor lend themselves to alterations, and an entirely new wardrobe is an unwarranted burden to most. Except for the one black suit bought for the funeral and kept for Sunday church, or other special occasion, only wealthy men, or widowers, go to the very considerable expense of getting a new wardrobe. Widowers, especially if they are elderly, always go into black, which includes very dark gray mixtures, with a deep black band on the hat, and, of course, black ties and socks and shoes and gloves. Conventions of Mourning for Men Although the etiquette is less exacting, the standards of social observance are much the same for a man as for a woman. A widower should not be seen at any general entertainment, such as a dance or in a box at the opera, for a year, a son for six months, a brother for three at least. The length of time a father stays in mourning for a child is more a matter of his own inclination. Morning Livery Coachmen and chauffeurs wear black liveries in town. In the country, they wear gray, or even their ordinary whipcord with a black band on the left sleeve. The house footman is always put into a black livery with dull buttons and a black and white striped waistcoat. Maids are not put into mourning, with the exception of a lady's maid or nurse who, through many years of service, has become one of the family and who personally desires to wear mourning as though for a relative of her own. Acknowledgement of Sympathy In the case of a very prominent person, where messages of condolence, many of them impersonal, mount into the thousands, the sending of engraved cards to strangers is proper, such as, Mr. W. de Bonds wishes gratefully to acknowledge your kind expression of sympathy. Or, Senator and Mrs. Michigan wish to express their appreciation of Miss Millicent Gilding's sympathy in their recent bereavement. Under no circumstances should such cards be sent to intimate friends, or to those who have sent flowers or written personal letters. When someone with real sympathy in his heart has taken the trouble to select and send flowers, or has gone to the house and offered what service he might, or has, in a spirit of genuine regard, written a personal letter, the receipt of words composed by a stationer and dispatched by a professional secretary, is exactly as though his outstretched hand had been pushed aside. A family in mourning is in retirement from all social activities. There is no excuse on the score of their having no time. Also, no one expects a long letter nor does anyone look for an early reply. A personal word on a visiting card is all anyone asks for. The envelope may be addressed by someone else. It takes but a moment to write, Thank you, or Thank you for all your sympathy, or Thank you for your kind offers and sympathy, or, on a sheet of letter paper, Thank you, dear Mrs. Smith, for your beautiful flowers and your kind sympathy, or your flowers were so beautiful. Thank you for them and for your loving message. Or, thank you for your sweet letter. I know you meant it, and I appreciate it. 
Many, many such notes can be written in a day. If the list is overlong, or the one who received the flowers and messages is in reality so prostrated that she, or he, is unable to perform the task of writing, then some other member of her immediate family can write for her. Mother, or father, is too ill to write, and asks me to thank you for your beautiful flowers and kind message. Most people find a sad comfort, as well as pain, in the reading and replying to letters and cards, but they should not sit at it too long. It is apt to increase rather than assuage their grief. Therefore, no one expects more than a word, but that word should be seemingly personal. Obligations of Presence at Funerals Upon reading the death notice of a mere acquaintance, you may leave your card at the house, if you feel so inclined, or you may merely send your card. Upon the death of an intimate acquaintance or friend, you should go at once to the house, write with sympathy on your card, and leave it at the door. Or you should write a letter to the family. In either case, you send flowers addressed to the nearest relative. On the card accompanying the flowers, you write, With sympathy, with deepest sympathy, or with heartfelt sympathy, or with love and sympathy. If there is a notice in the papers requesting no flowers be sent, you send them only if you are a very intimate friend. Or, if you prefer, send a few flowers with a note immediately after the funeral to the member of the family who is particularly your friend. If the notice says, Funeral Private, you do not go unless you have received a message from the family that you are expected, or unless you are such an intimate friend that you know you are expected without being asked. Where a general notice is published in the paper, it is proper and fitting that you should show sympathy by going to the funeral even though you had little more than a visiting acquaintance with the family. You should not leave cards, nor go to a funeral of a person with whom you have not in any way been associated, or to whose house you have never been asked. But it is heartless and delinquent if you do not go to the funeral of one with whom you are associated in business or other interests, or to whose house you were often invited, or where you are a friend of the immediate members of the family. You should wear black clothes if you have them, or if not, the darkest, the least conspicuous you possess. Enter the church as quietly as possible, and as there are no ushers at a funeral, seat yourself where you approximately belong. Only a very intimate friend should take a position far up in the center aisle. If you are merely an acquaintance, you should sit inconspicuously in the rear somewhere, unless the funeral is very small and the church big, in which case you may sit on the end seat of the center aisle toward the back. End of chapter 24「Chapter 25, Part 1 of Etiquette」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. Etiquette in Society, in Business, in Politics, and at Home by Emily Post. Chapter 25. The Country House and Its Hospitality. Part 1. The difference between the great house with twenty to fifty guest rooms, all numbered like the rooms in a hotel, and the house of ordinary good size with from four to six guest rooms, or the farmhouse or small cottage which has but one best spare chamber, with perhaps a man's room on the ground floor, is much the same as the difference between the elaborate wedding and the simplest, one merely of degree and not of kind. To be sure, in the great house, weekend guests often include those who are little more than acquaintances of the host and hostess, whereas the visitor occupying the only spare room is practically always an intimate friend. 
excepting therefore that people who have few visitors never ask anyone on their general list, and that those who fill an enormous house time and time again necessarily do, the etiquette, manners, guest-room appointments, and the people who occupy them are precisely the same. Popular opinion to the contrary, a man's social position is by no means proportionate to the size of his house, and even though he lives in a bungalow, he may have every bit as high a position in the world of fashion as his rich neighbor in his palace, often much better. We all of us know a Mr. Newgold, who would give many of the treasures in his marble palace for a single invitation to Mrs. Oldname's comparatively little house, and half of all he possesses for the latter's knowledge, appearance, manner, instincts, and position, none of which he himself is likely ever to acquire, though his children may. But in our description of great or medium or small houses, we are considering those only whose owners belong equally to best society, and where, though luxuries vary from the greatest to the least, house appointments are in essentials alike. This is a rather noteworthy fact. All people of good position talk alike, behave alike, and live alike. Ill-mannered servants, incorrect liveries or service, sloppily dished food, carelessness in any of the details that to well-bred people constitute the decencies of living, are no more tolerated in the smallest cottage than in the palace. But since the biggest houses are those which naturally attract most attention, suppose we begin our detailed description with them. House Party of Many Guests Perhaps there are ten, or perhaps there are forty guests, but if there were only two or three, and the house a little instead of a big one, the details would be precisely the same. A weekend means from Friday afternoon, or from Saturday lunch, to Monday morning. The usual time chosen for a house party is over a holiday, particularly where the holiday falls on a Friday or Monday, so that the men can take a Saturday off and stay from Friday to Tuesday, or Thursday to Monday. On whichever day the party begins, every one arrives in the neighborhood of five o'clock, or a day later at lunchtime. Many come in their own cars, the others are met at the station, sometimes by the host or a son, or, if it is to be a young party, by a daughter. The hostess herself rarely, if ever, goes to the station, not because of indifference or discourtesy, but because other guests, coming by motor, might find the house empty. It is very rude for a hostess to be out when her guests arrive. Even someone who comes so often as to be entirely at home is apt to feel dispirited upon being shown into an empty house. Sometimes a guest's arrival unwelcomed cannot be avoided, if, for instance, a man invited for tennis week or a football or baseball game arrives before the game is over but too late to join the others at the sport. When younger people come to visit the daughters, it is not necessary that their mother stay at home, since the daughters take their mother's place. Nor is it necessary that she receive the men friends of her son, unless the latter, for some unavoidable reason, is absent. No hostess must ever fail to send a car to the station or boat landing for every one who is expected. If she has not conveyances enough of her own, she must order public ones and have the fares charged to herself. Greeting of the Host The host always goes out into the front hall and shakes hands with every one who arrives. He asks the guests if they want to be shown to their rooms, and if not, sees that the gentlemen who come without valets give their keys to the butler or footman, and that the ladies without maids of their own give theirs to the maid who is on duty for the purpose. Should any of them feel dusty, or otherwise untidy, they naturally ask if they may be shown to their rooms, so that they can make themselves presentable. 
They should not, however, linger longer than necessary, as their hostess may become uneasy at their delay. Ladies do not, in fashionable houses, make their first appearance without a hat. Gentlemen, needless to say, leave theirs in the hall when they come in. Travel in the present day, however, whether in parlor car or closed limousines, or even in open cars on macadam roads, obviates the necessity for an immediate removing of travel stains, so that instead of seeking their rooms, the newcomers usually go directly into the library, or out on the veranda, or wherever the hostess is to be found behind the inevitable tea tray. Greeting of the Hostess As soon as her guests appear in the doorway, the hostess at once rises, goes forward smiling, shakes hands, and tells them how glad she is that they have safely come, or how glad she is to see them, and leads the way to the tea table. This is one of the occasions when everyone is always introduced. Good manners also demand that the places nearest the hostess be vacated by those occupying them, and that the newly arrived receive attention from the hostess, who sees that they are supplied with tea, sandwiches, cakes, and whatever the tea table affords. After tea, people either sit around and talk, or more likely nowadays they play bridge. About an hour before dinner, the hostess asks how long everyone needs to dress, and tells them the time. If any need a shorter time than she must allow for herself, she makes sure that they know the location of their rooms, and goes to dress. A ROOM FOR EVERY GUEST It is almost unnecessary to say that in no well-appointed house is a guest, except under three circumstances, put in a room with anyone else. The three exceptions are 1. A man and wife, if the hostess is sure beyond a doubt that they occupy similar quarters when at home. 2. Two young girls who are friends and have volunteered, because the house is crowded, to room together in a room with two beds. 3. On an occasion such as a wedding, a ball, or an intercollegiate athletic event, young people don't mind for one night, that is spent for the greater part, up, how many are doubled, and house room is limited merely to cot space, sofas, and even the billiard table. But she would be a very clumsy hostess, who, for a weekend, filled her house like a sardine box, to the discomfort and resentment of everyone. In the well-appointed house, every guest room has a bath adjoining for itself alone, or shared with a connecting room, and used only by a man and wife, two women, or two men. A bathroom should never, if avoidable, be shared by a woman and a man. A suitable accommodation for a man and wife is a double room with bath and a single room next. THE GUEST ROOM the perfect guest room is not necessarily a vast chamber decorated and an historically correct period. Its perfection is the result of nothing more difficult to attain than painstaking attention to detail, and its possession is within the reach of every woman who has the means to invite people to her house in the first place. The ideal guest room is never found except in the house of the ideal hostess, and it is by no means idle talk to suggest that every hostess be obliged to spend twenty-four hours, every now and then, in each room that is set apart for visitors. If she does not do this actually, she should do so in imagination. She should occasionally go into the guest bathroom and draw the water in every fixture, to see there is no stoppage, and that the hot water faucets are not seemingly jokes of the plumber. If a man is to occupy the bathroom, she must see that the hook for a razor strop is not missing, and that there is a mirror by which he can see to shave, both at night and by daylight. Even though she can see to powder her nose, it would be safer to make her husband bathe and shave both a morning and an evening in each bathroom, 
and then listen carefully to what he says about it. Even though she has a perfect housemaid, it is not unwise occasionally to make sure herself that every detail has been attended to, that in every bathroom there are plenty of bath towels, face towels, a freshly laundered wash rag, bath mat, a new cake of unscented bath soap in the bathtub soap rack, and a new cake of scented soap on the washstand. It is not expected, but it is often very nice to find violet water, bath salts, listerine, talcum powder, almond or other hand or sunburn lotion, in decorated bottles on the washstand shelf, but to cover the dressing table in the bedroom with brushes and an array of toilet articles is more of a nuisance than a comfort. A good clothes brush and whisk broom are usually very acceptable, as, strangely enough, guests almost invariably forget them. A comforting adjunct to a bathroom that is given to a woman is a hot water bottle with a woolen cover hanging on the back of the door. Even if the water does not run sufficiently hot, a guest seldom hesitates to ring for that, whereas no one ever likes to ask for a hot water bag, no matter how much she might long for it. A small bottle of pyro is also convenient for one who brings a curling lamp. In the bedroom, the hostess should make sure, by sleeping in it at least once, that the bed is comfortable, that the sheets are long enough to tuck in, that there are enough pillows for one who sleeps with head high. There must also be plenty of covers. Besides the blankets, there should be a wool-filled or an eider-down quilt in coloring to go with the room. There should be a night light at the head of the bed, not just a decorative glow-worm effect, but a light that is really good to lie in bed and read by. And always there should be books, chosen more to divert than to engross. The sort of selection appropriate for a guest room might best comprise two or three books of the moment, a light novel, a book of essays, another of short stories, and a few of the latest magazines. Spare room books ought to be especially chosen for the expected guest. Even though one cannot choose accurately for the taste of another, one can at least guess whether the visitor is likely to prefer transcendental philosophy or detective stories, and supply either accordingly. There should be a candle and a box of matches. Even though there is electric light, it has been known to go out and some people like to burn a candle all night. There must also be matches and ash receivers on the desk, and a scrap basket beside it. In hot weather every guest should have a palm-leaf fan, and in August, even though there are screens, a fly-killer. In big houses with a swimming pool, bathrobes are supplied, and often bathing suits. Otherwise dressing gowns are not part of any guest-room equipment. A comfortable sofa is very important, if the room is big enough, with a sofa pillow or two, and with a lightweight quilt or afghan across the end of it. The hostess should do her own hair in each room to see if the dressing table is placed where there is a good light over it, both by electric and by daylight. A very simple expedient in a room where massive furniture and low windows make the daylight dressing table difficult is the European custom of putting an ordinary small table directly in the window and standing a good-sized mirror on it. Nothing makes a more perfect arrangement for a woman. And the pincushion. It is more than necessary to see that the pins are usable and not rust to the head. There should be black ones and white ones, long and short, and also safety pins in several sizes. Three or four threaded needles of white thread, black, gray, and tan silk are an addition that has proved many times welcome. She must also examine the writing desk to be sure that the ink is not a cracked patch of black dust at the bottom of the well, and the pens solid rust, and the writing paper textures and sizes at odds with the envelopes. There should be a fresh blotter and a few stamps. Also thoughtful hostesses, 
put a card in some convenient place giving the post office schedule and saying where the mail bag can be found. And a calendar, and a clock that goes. Is there anything more typical of the average spare room than the clock that is at a standstill? There must be plenty of clothes hangers in the closets. For the women, a few hat stands, and for men, trouser hangers, and the coat hangers that have a bar across the shoulder piece. It is unnecessary to add that every bureau drawer should be looked into to see that nothing belonging to the family is filling the space which should belong to the guest, and that the white paper lining the bottom is new. Curtains and sofa pillows must, of course, be freshly laundered. The furniture, floor, walls, and ceiling unmarred and in perfect order. When bells are being installed in new houses, they should be on cords and hung at the side of the bed. Light switches should be placed at the side of the door going into the room and bathroom. It is scarcely practical to change the wiring in old houses, but it can at least be seen that the bells work. People who like strong perfumes often mistakenly think they are giving pleasure in filling all the bedroom drawers with pads heavily scented. Instead of feeling pleasure, some people are made almost sick. But all people, hay fever patients excepted, love flowers, and vases of them beautify rooms as nothing else can. Even a shabby little room, if dustlessly clean and filled with flowers, loses all effect of shabbiness, and is inviting instead. In a hunting country there should be a boot jack, and boot hooks in the closet. Guest rooms should have shutters and dark shades for those who like to keep the morning sun out. The rooms should also, if possible, be away from the kitchen end of the house and the nursery. A shortcoming in many houses is the lack of a newspaper, and the thoughtful hostess who has the morning paper sent up with each breakfast tray, or has one put at each place on the breakfast table, deserves a halo. At night, a glass and a thermos pitcher of water should be placed by the bed. In a few very specially appointed houses, a small glass-covered tray of food is also put on the bed table. Fruit or milk and sandwiches, or whatever is marked on the guest card. The Guest Card A clever device was invented by Mrs. Gilding, whose palatially appointed house is run with the most painstaking attention to everyone's comfort. On the dressing table in each spare room at Golden Hall is a card pad with a pencil attached to it. But if the guest card is used, a specimen is given below. Needless to say, the cards are used only in huge houses that, because of their size, are necessarily run more like a clubhouse than as a home. In every house, the questions below are asked by the hostess, though the guests may not readily perceive the fact. At bedtime, she always asks, Would you like to come down to breakfast, or will you have it in your room? If the guest says, In her room, she is then asked what she would like to eat. She is also asked whether she cares for milk, or fruit, or other light refreshment at bedtime, and if there is a special book she would like to take up to her room. The guest card mentioned above is as follows. Please fill this out before going down to dinner. What time do you want to be awakened, or will you ring? Will you breakfast upstairs or down? Underscore your order. Coffee, tea, chocolate, milk. Oatmeal, hominy, shredded wheat. Eggs, how cooked. Rolls, muffins, toast. Orange, pear, grapes, melon. At bedtime, will you take hot or cold milk, cocoa, orangeade, sandwiches, meat, lettuce, jam, cake, crackers, oranges, apples, pears, grapes. Besides this list, there is a catalog of the library with a card, clipped to the cover, saying, Following books for room number X. 
then four or six blank lines, and a place for the guest's signature. At the dinner hour. Every one goes down to dinner as promptly as possible, and the procedure is exactly that of all dinners. If it is a big party, the gentlemen offer their arms to the ladies the host or hostess has designated. At the end of the evening, it is the custom that the hostess suggest going upstairs, rather than the guests who ordinarily depart after dinner. But etiquette is not very strictly followed in this, and a reasonable time after dinner, if anyone is especially tired, he or she quite frankly says, I wonder if you would mind very much if I went to bed. The hostess always answers, Why, no, certainly not. I hope you will find everything in your room. If not, will you ring? It is not customary for the hostess to go upstairs with a guest, so long as others remain in her drawing room. If there is only one lady, or a young girl, the hostess accompanies her to her room, and asks if everything has been thought of for her comfort. How Guests Are Asked and Received Many older ladies adhere to former practice and always write personal notes of invitation. All others write or telegraph to people at a distance and send telephone messages to those nearby. When a house is to be filled with friends of daughters or sons of the house, the young people in the habit of coming to the house, or young men, whether making a first visit or not, do not need any invitation further than one given them verbally by a daughter or even a son. But a married couple or a young girl invited for the first time should have the verbal invitation of daughter or son seconded by a note or at least a telephone message sent by the mother herself. Everyone is always asked for a specific time. Even a near relative comes definitely for a week or a month or whatever period is selected. This is because other plans have to be made by the owners of the house, such as inviting another group of guests, or preparing to go away themselves. Who are asked on house parties? Excepting when strangers bring influential letters of introduction, or when a relative or very intimate friend recently married is invited with her new husband or his bride, Only very large and general house parties include anyone who is not an intimate friend. At least 70% of American house parties are young people, either single or not long married, and in any event all those asked to any one party, unless the hostess is a failure or a genius, belong to the same social group. Perhaps a more broad-minded attitude prevails among young people in other parts of the country, but willfully narrow-minded Miss Young New York is very chary of accepting an invitation until she finds out who, among her particular friends, are also invited. If Mrs. Stranger asks her for a weekend, no matter how much she may like Mrs. Stranger personally, she at once telephones two or three of her own group. If some of them are going, she accepts with pleasure. But if not, the chances are she regrets. If, on the other hand, she is asked by the Gildings, she accepts at once. Not merely because Golden Hall is the ultimate in luxury, but because Mrs. Gilding has a gift for entertaining, including her selection of people, amounting to genius. On the other hand, Miss Young New York would accept with equal alacrity the invitation of the Jack Little Houses, where there is no luxury at all. Here, in fact, a guest is quite as likely as not to be pressed into service as auxiliary nurse, gardener, or chauffeur. But the personality of the host and hostess is such that there is scarcely a day in the week when the motors of the most popular of the younger set are not parked at the Little House door. People we love to stay with. We enjoy staying with certain people usually for one of two reasons. 
first because they have wonderful luxurious houses, filled with amusing people, and visiting them is a period crammed with continuous and delightful experience, even though such a visit has little that suggests any personal intercourse or friendship with one's hostess. The other reason we love to visit a certain house is, on the contrary, entirely personal to the host or hostess. We love the house because we love its owner. Nowhere do we feel so much at home, and though it may have none of the imposing magnificence of the great house, it is often far more charming. Five flunkies cannot do more towards a guest's comfort than to take his hat and stick and to show him the way to the drawing room. A very smart young New Yorker, who is also something of a wag, says that when going to a very magnificent house, he always tries to wear sufficient articles so that he shall have one to bestow upon each footman. Someone saw him, upon entering a palace that is a counterpart of the worldlies, quite solemnly hand his hat to the first footman, his stick to the second, his coat to the third, his muffler to the fourth, his gloves to the fifth, and his name to the sixth, as he entered the drawing room. Needless to say, he did this as a matter of pure amusement to himself. Of course, six men servants or more do add to the impressiveness of a house that is a palace and are a fitting part of the picture. And yet, a neat maid servant at the door can divest a guest of his hat and coat and lead the way to the sitting room with equal facility. Having several times mentioned Golden Hall, the palatial country house of the Gildings, suppose we join the guests and see what the last word in luxury and lavish hospitality is. Golden Hall is not an imaginary place, except in name. It exists within a hundred miles of New York. The house is a palace, the grounds are a park. There is not only a long wing of magnificent guest rooms in the house, occupied by young girls or important older people, but there is also a guest annex, a separate building, designed and run like the most luxurious country club. The second floor has nothing but bedrooms, with bath for each. The third floor has bachelor rooms, and rooms for visiting valets. Visiting maids are put in a separate third floor wing. On the ground floor there is a small breakfast room, a large living room filled with books, magazines, a billiard and pool table. Beyond the living room is a fully equipped gymnasium. And beyond that a huge white marble glass walled natatorium. The swimming pool is fifty feet by one hundred. On three sides is just a narrow shelf like walkway, but the fourth is wide and is furnished as a room. With lounging chairs upholstered in white oilcloth. Opening out of this are perfectly equipped Turkish and Russian baths in charge of the best Swedish masseur and masseuse procurable. In the same building are two squash courts, a racket court, a tennis court, and a bowling alley. But the feature of the guest building is a glass roofed and enclosed riding ring, not big enough for games of polo. But big enough for practice in winter, built along one entire side of it. The stables are full of polo ponies and hunters, the garage full of cars, the boathouse has every sort of boat sail boats, naphtha launches, a motor boat, and even a shell. Every amusement is open heartedly offered, in fact, especially devised for the guests. At the main house there is a ballroom with a stage at one end. An orchestra plays every night. New moving pictures are shown, and vaudeville talent is imported from New York. This is the extreme of luxury in entertaining. As Mrs. Toplofty said at the end of a bewilderingly lavish party, How are any of us ever going to amuse anyone after this? I feel like doing my guest rooms up in mothballs. No one, however, has discovered that invitations to Mrs. Toplofty's are any less welcome. Besides, excitement loving youth and exercise devotees 
were never favoured guests at the Hudson Manor anyway. THE SMALL HOUSE OF PERFECTION It matters not in the slightest whether the guest-room's carpet is aubusson or rag, whether the furniture is antique or modern, so long as it is pleasing of its kind. On the other hand, because a house is little, is no reason that it cannot be as perfect in every detail, perhaps more so, as the palace of the multiest millionaire. The attributes of the perfect house cannot be better represented than by Brook Meadows Farm, the all-the-year home of the old names nor can anything better illustrate its perfection than an incident that actually took place there. A great friend of the old names, but not a man who went at all into society, or considered whether people had position or not, was invited with his new wife, a woman from another state, and of much wealth and discernment, to stay over a weekend at Brook Meadows. Never having met the old names, she asked something about their house and life, in order to decide what type of clothes to pack. "'Oh, it's just a little farmhouse. Old name wears a dinner coat, of course. His wife wears, I don't know what, but I have never seen her dressed up a bit.' "'Evidently plain people,' thought his wife, and aloud, "'I wonder what evening dress I have that is high enough.' I can put in the black lace day dress. Perhaps I had better put in my cerise satin. The cerise? asked her husband. Is that the red you had on the other night? It is much too handsome, much. I tell you, Mrs. Oldname never wears a dress that you could notice. She always looks like a lady, but she isn't a dressy sort of person at all. So the bride packed her plainest, that is, her cheapest, clothes, but at the last she put in the cerise. When she and her husband arrived at the railroad station, that, at least, was primitive enough, and Mr. Oldname, in much-worn tweeds, might have come from a castle or a cabin. Country clothes are no evidence. But her practised eye noticed the perfect cut of the chauffeur's coat, and that the car, though of an inexpensive make, was one of the prettiest on the market." and beautifully appointed. At least they have good taste in motors and accessories, thought she, and was glad she had brought her best evening dress. They drove up to a low, white-shingled house, at the end of an old-fashioned brick walk bordered with flowers. The visitor noticed that the flowers were all of one colour, all in perfect bloom. She knew no inexperienced gardener had produced that apparently simple approach to a door that has been chosen as a frontispiece in more than one book on colonial architecture. The door was opened by a maid in a silver-gray taffeta dress, with organdy collar, cuffs and apron, white stockings, and silver buckles on black slippers, and the guest saw a quaint hall and vista of rooms that at first sight might easily be thought simple, by an inexpert appraiser. But Mrs. Oldname, who came forward to greet her guests, was the antithesis of everything the bride's husband had led her to believe. To describe Mrs. Oldname as simple is about as apt as to call a pearl simple, because it doesn't dazzle. Nor was there an article in the apparently simple living-room that would be refused were it offered to a museum. The tea-table was Chinese Chippendale, and set with old spode on a lacquered tray over a mosaic embroidered linen tea-cloth. The soda biscuits and cakes were light as froth, the tea an especial blend imported by a prominent connoisseur and given every Christmas to his friends. There were three other guests besides the bride and groom, a United States senator, and a diplomat and his wife who were on their way from a post in Europe to one in South America. Instead of bridge, there was conversation on international topics until it was time to dress for dinner. When the bride went to her room, which adjoined that of her husband, she found her bath drawn, her clothes laid out, and the dressing-table lights lighted. 
That night the bride wore her cerise dress to one of the smartest dinners she ever went down to, and when they went upstairs and she at last saw her husband alone, she took him to task. Why, in the name of goodness, didn't you tell me the truth about these people? Oh, said he, abashed, I told you it was a little house. It was you who insisted on bringing that red dress. I told you it was too handsome. Handsome, she cried in tears. I don't own anything half good enough to compare with the least article in this house. That simple little woman, as you call her, would, I think, almost make a queen seem provincial. And as for her clothes, they are priceless, just as everything is in this little gem of a house. Why, the window curtains are as fine as the best clothes in my trousseau. The two houses contrasted above are two extremes. But each a luxury. The old name's expenditure, though in no way comparable with the worldlies or the gildings, is far beyond any purse that can be called moderate. The really moderate purse inevitably precludes a woman from playing an important role as hostess, for not even the greatest magnetism and charm can make up to spoiled guests for lack of essential comfort. The only exceptions are a bungalow at the seashore. Or a camp in the woods, where a confirmed luxury lover is desperately uncomfortable for the first twenty-four hours, but invariably gets used to the lack of comfort almost as soon as he gets dependent upon it, and plunging into a lake for a bath, or washing in a little tin basin, sleeping on pine boughs without any sheets at all, eating tinned foods and flapjacks on tin plates with tin utensils, he seems to lack nothing. When the air is like champagne, and the company first choice. End of chapter twenty-five, part one. Read by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org, on April sixteenth, two thousand seven, in Oceanside, California. Chapter Twenty Five, Part Two of Etiquette. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. Etiquette in society, in business, in politics, and at home, by Emily Post. Chapter Twenty Five, The Country House. And its hospitality. Part two. Guest room service. If a visitor brings no maid of her own, the personal maid of the hostess, if she has one, otherwise the housemaid, always unpacks the bags or trunks, lays toilet articles out on the dressing table and in the bathroom, puts folded things in the drawers, and hangs dresses on hangers in the closet. If when she unpacks she sees that something of importance has been forgotten, she tells her mistress, or in the case of a servant who has been long employed, she knows what selection to make herself and supplies the guest without asking with such articles as comb and brush, or clothes brush, or bathing suit and bathrobe. The valet of the host performs the same service for men. In small establishments where there is no lady's maid or valet, the housemaid is always taught to unpack guests' belongings and to press and hook up ladies' dresses. And gentlemen's clothes are sent to a tailor to be pressed after each wearing. In big houses, breakfast trays for women guests are usually carried to the bedroom floor by the butler. Some butlers delegate this service to a footman, and are handed to the lady's maid. Who takes the tray into the room? In small houses, they are carried up by the waitress. Trays for men visitors are rare, but when ordered, are carried up and into the room by the valet or butler. If there are no men servants, the waitress has to carry up the tray. When a guest rings for breakfast, the housemaid or the valet goes into the room, opens the blinds. And in cold weather, lights the fire if there is an open one in the room. Asking whether a hot, cool, or cold bath is preferred, he goes into the bathroom, 
spreads a bath mat on the floor, a big bath towel over a chair, with the help of a thermometer draws the bath, and sometimes lays out the visitor's clothes. As few people care for more than one bath a day, and many people prefer their bath before dinner instead of before breakfast, this office is often performed at dinner dressing time instead of in the morning. Tips The tip roll in a big house seems to us rather appalling, but compared with the amounts given in a big English house, ours are mere pittances. Pleasant to think that something is less expensive in our country than in Europe. Fortunately, in this country, when you dine in a friend's house, you do not tip the butler, nor do you tip a footman or parlor maid who takes your card to the mistress of the house, nor when you leave a country house do you have to give more than five dollars to any one whatsoever. A lady for a weekend stay gives two or three dollars to the lady's maid, if she went without her own. And one or two dollars to every one who waited on her. Intimate friends in a small house send tips to all the servants, perhaps only a dollar apiece, but no one is forgotten. In a very big house, this is never done, and only those are tipped who have served you. If you had your maid with you, you always give her a tip, about two dollars, to give the cook, often the second one. Who prepared her meals, and one dollar for the kitchen maid who set her table. A gentleman scarcely ever remembers any of the women servants, to their chagrin, except a waitress, and tips only the butler and the valet, and sometimes the chauffeur. The least he can offer any of the men servants is two dollars, and the most ever is five. No woman gets as much as that for such short service. In a few houses, the tipping system is abolished, and in every guest room, in a conspicuous place on the dressing table or over the bathtub, where you are sure to read it, is a sign saying, "Please do not offer tips to my servants. Their contract is with this special understanding, and proper arrangements have been made to meet it. You will not only create a situation, but cause immediate dismissal of any one who may be persuaded by you to break this rule of the house." The notice is signed by the host. The arrangement referred to is one whereby every guest means a bonus added to their wages of so much per person per day for all employees. This system is much preferred by servants for two reasons: first, self-respecting ones dislike the demeaning effect of a tip; an occasional few won't take them. Secondly, they can absolutely count that. So many visitors will bring them precisely such an amount. Breakfast downstairs or up. Breakfast customs are as varied in this country as the topography of the land. Communities of people who have lived or travelled much abroad have nearly all adopted the continental breakfast habit of a tray in their room, especially on Sunday mornings. In other communities, it is the custom to go down to the dining room for a heavy American or English meal. In communities where the latter is the custom and where people are used to assembling at a set hour, it is simple enough to provide a breakfast typical of the section of the country: corn bread and kidney stew and hominy in the south, doughnuts and codfish balls way down east. Kippered herring, liver and bacon, and griddle cakes elsewhere. But downstairs breakfast, as a continuous performance, is, from a housekeeper's point of view, a trial to say the least. However, in big houses where men refuse to eat in their rooms and equally refuse to get up until they feel like it, a dining room breakfast is managed as follows: continuous breakfast downstairs. The table is set with a place for all who said they were coming down. At one end is a coffee urn kept hot over a spirit lamp. Milk is kept hot under a tea cozy or in a double pitcher made like a double boiler. On the sideboard or on the table are two or three hot water dishes, with or without spirit lamps underneath. In one is cereal, in the other hash or creamed beef, 
sausage, or codfish cakes, or whatever the housekeeper thinks of, that can stand for hours and still be edible. Fruit is on the table, and bread and butter and marmalade, and the cook is supposed to make fresh tea and eggs and toast for each guest as he appears. Preparing Breakfast Tray The advantage of having one's guests choose breakfast upstairs is that unless there is a separate breakfast room, a long delayed breakfast prevents the dining room from being put in order or the lunch table set. Trays, on the other hand, stand all set in the pantry, and interfere much less with the dining room work. The trays are either of the plain white pantry variety, or regular breakfast ones with folding legs. On each is put a tray cloth. It may be plain linen, hem-stitched or scalloped, or it may be much embroidered, and have mosaic or fillet lace. Every bedroom has a set of breakfast china to match it but it is far better to send a complete set of blue china to a rose-colored room than a rose set that has pieces missing. Nothing looks worse than old crockery. It is like unmatched paper and envelopes, or odd shoes, or a woman's skirt and waist that do not meet in the back. There is nothing unusual in a tray set. Every china and department store carries them, but only in open-stock patterns can one buy extra dishes or replace broken ones, a fact it is well to remember. There is a tall coffee pot, hot milk pitcher, a cream pitcher and sugar bowl, a cup and saucer, two plates, an egg cup, and a covered dish. A cereal is usually put in the covered dish, toast in a napkin on a plate, or eggs and bacon in place of cereal. This, with fruit, is the most elaborate tray breakfast ever provided. Most people who breakfast in bed take only coffee or tea, an egg, toast, and possibly fruit. THE COURTEOUS HOST Of those elaborate ceremonials between host and guest, familiar to all readers of the Bible and all travelers in the East, only a few faint traces remain in our country and generation. It is still unforgivable to eat a man's bread and remain his enemy. It is unforgivable to criticize your host, or in his presence to criticize his friends. It is unforgivable to be rude to anyone under your own roof or under the roof of a friend. If you must quarrel with your enemy, seek public or neutral ground, since quarrels and hospitality must never be mingled. The Spaniard says to his guest, All I have is yours. It is supposed to be merely a pretty speech, but in a measure it is true of every host's attitude toward his house-guest. If you take someone under your roof, he becomes part of, and sharer in, your life and possessions, your horse, your fireside, your armchair, your servants, your time, your customs, all are his. Your food is his food, your roof his shelter. You give him the best spare room, you set before him the best refreshments you can offer, and your best china and glass. His bed is made up with your best company linen and blankets. You receive your guest with a smile, no matter how inconvenient or troublesome or straining to your resources his visit may be. And on no account do you let him suspect any of this. Keeping one's guests occupied. In popular houses where visitors like to go again and again, there is always a happy combination of some attention on the part of the host and hostess, and the perfect freedom of the guests to occupy their time as they choose. The host and the men staying in the house arrange among themselves to rest or play games or fish or ride or shoot clay pigeons or swim, etc. The hostess, unless at the seashore where people go bathing in the morning, generally leaves her guests to their own devices until lunchtime, though they are always offered whatever diversions the place or the neighborhood afford. They are told there is bathing, fishing, golf, and if they want to do any of these things, it is arranged for them. But unless something special, such as driving to a picnic or clam-bake, has been planned, 
or there is a tennis tournament or golf match of importance, the hostess makes her first appearance just before luncheon. This is the same as any informal family meal. If there are thirty guests, it makes no difference. Sometimes there are place cards, especially if other people have been invited in. Sometimes people find places for themselves. After luncheon, something is usually arranged. Perhaps those who play golf go out for their game, and others who do not play go to the country club at the hour the players are supposed to be coming in, so that they can all have tea together. Those who like motoring perhaps go for a drive, or to a neighbor's house for bridge, or neighbors come in for tea. There is always bridge. Sometimes there is dancing. In very big houses, musicians are often brought in after dinner, and dancing and bridge alternate till bedtime. A house full of young people very easily look after their own amusement. As said before, a big house is run very much like a country club, and guests are supposed to look after themselves. Making an especial effort to entertain a guest who is to stay for a week or longer has gone out of custom in the fashionable world, except for an important personage. A visit from the President of the United States, for instance, would necessitate the most punctiliously formal etiquette, no matter how close a friend of the family he may always have been. For such a visitor, a hostess would either arrange a series of entertainments or none. According to her visitor's inclination, a guest can look after his own comfort. The most trying thing to people of very set habits is an unusual breakfast hour. When you have the unfortunate habit of waking with the dawn, and the household you are visiting has the custom of sleeping on Sunday morning, the long wait for your coffee can quite actually upset your whole day. On the other hand, to be aroused at seven on the only day when you do not have to hurry to business, in order to yawn through an early breakfast and then sit around and kill time, is quite as trying. The guest with the early habit can, in a measure, prevent discomfort. He can carry in a small case, locked if necessary, a very small solidified alcohol outfit, and either a small package of tea. Or powdered coffee, sugar, powdered milk, and a few crackers. He can then start his day all by himself in the barnyard hours, without disturbing anyone, and in comfort to himself. Few people care enough to fuss, but if they do, this equipment of an habitual visitor with incurably early waking hours is given as a suggestion. Or perhaps the entire guest situation may be put in one sentence. If you are an inflexible person, very set in your ways, don't visit. At least don't visit without carefully looking the situation over from every angle to be sure that the habits of the house you are going to are in accord with your own. A solitary guest is naturally much more dependent on his host or her hostess, but on the other hand, he or she is practically always a very intimate friend. Who merely adapts himself or herself like a chameleon to the customs and hours and diversions of the household. Don'ts for the hostess. When a guest asks to be called half an hour before breakfast, don't have him called an hour and a half before, because it takes you that long to dress. Nor allow him a scant ten minutes because the shorter time is seemingly sufficient. Too often the summons on the door wakes him out of sound sleep. He tumbles exhausted out of bed into clothes and downstairs, to wait perhaps an hour for breakfast. If a guest prefers to sit on the veranda and read, don't interrupt him every half page to ask if he really does not want to do something else. If, on the other hand, a guest wants to exercise, don't do everything in your power to obstruct his starting off by saying that it will surely rain, or that it is too hot, or that you think it senseless to spend days that should be a rest to him in utterly exhausting himself. Don't, when you know that a young man cares little for feminine society, 
fine-tooth comb the neighbourhood for the dullest or silliest young woman to be found. Don't, on the other hand, when you have an especially attractive young woman staying with you, ask a stolid middle-aged couple and an octogenarian professor for dinner, because the charm and beauty of the former is sure to appeal to the latter. Don't, because you personally happen to like a certain young girl, who is utterly old-fashioned in outlook and type from ultra-modern others who are staying with you, try to bring them together. Never try to make any two people like each other. If they do, they do. If they don't, they don't, and that is all there is to it. But it is of vital importance to your own success as hostess to find out which is the case, and collect or separate them accordingly. THE CASUAL HOSTESS The most casual hostess in the world is the fashionable leader in Newport, she who should by the rules of good society be the most punctilious, since no place in America or Europe is more conspicuously representative of luxury and fashion. Nowhere are there more guests or half so many hostesses, and yet hospitality, as it is understood everywhere else, is practically unknown. No one ever goes to stay in a Newport house excepting on his own, as it were. It is not an exaggerated story, but quite true, that in many houses of ultra-fashion a guest on arriving is told at which meals he is expected to appear, that is, at dinners or luncheons given by his hostess. At all others he is free to go out or stay in by himself. No effort is assumed for his amusement or responsibility for his well-being. It is small wonder that only those who have plenty of friends care to go there, or, in fact, are ever invited. Those who like to go to visit the most perfectly appointed but utterly impersonal house find no other visiting to compare with its unhampering delightfulness. The hostess simply says on his or her arrival, "'Oh, how do, Freddy?' or Constance. They've put you in the Chinese room, I think. Ring for tea when you want it. Struthers telephoned he'd be over around five. Mrs. Toplofty asked you to dinner tonight, and I accepted for you. Hope that was all right. If not, you'll have to telephone and get out of it yourself. I want you to dinner tomorrow night and for lunch on Sunday. Sorry to leave you, but I'm late for bridge now. Goodbye. And she is off. The Newport hostess is, of course, an extreme type that is seldom met away from that one small watering place in Rhode Island. The energetic hostess. The energetic hostess is the antithesis of the one above and far more universally known. She is one who fusses and plans continually, who thinks her guests are not having a good time unless she rushes them, cooks tourist fashion, from this engagement to that, and crowds with activity and diversion. Never mind what, so long as it is something to see or do. Every moment of their stay. She walks them through the garden to show them all the nooks and vistas. She dilates upon the flowers that bloomed here last month and are going to bloom next. She insists upon their climbing over rocks to a summer-house to see the view. She insists on taking them in another direction to see an old mill. And again every one is trooped to the cupola of the house to see another view. She insists on every one's playing croquet before lunch, to which she gathers in a curiously mixed collection of neighbors. Immediately after lunch every one is driven to a country club to see some duffer golf. For some reason there is never time in all the prepared pleasures for any of her guests to play golf themselves. After twenty minutes at the golf club, they are all taken to a church fair. The guests are all introduced to the ladies at the booth, and those who were foolish enough to bring their purses with them, from now on carry around an odd assortment of fancy work. There is another entertainment that her guests must not miss— a flower pageant of the darlingest children fourteen miles away. Everyone is dashed to that. On someone's front lawn, daisies and lilies and roses trip and skip. It is all sweetly pretty, but the sun is hot, and the guests have been on the go for a great many hours. Soon, however, their hostess leaves. 
Home at last, think they. Not at all. They are going somewhere for tea and French recitations. But why go on? The portrait is fairly complete, though this account covers only a few hours, and there is still all the evening and tomorrow to be filled in just as liberally. THE ANXIOUS HOSTESS The anxious hostess does not insist on your ceaseless activity, but she is no less persistent in filling your time. She is always asking you what you would like to do next. If you say you are quite content as you are, she nevertheless continues to shower suggestions. Shall she play the phonograph to you? Would you like her to telephone to a friend who sings too wonderfully? Would you like to look at a portfolio of pictures? If you are a moment silent, she is sure you are bored, and wonders what she can do to divert you. THE PERFECT HOSTESS The ideal hostess must have so many perfections of sense and character that were she described in full, no one seemingly but a combination of seer and angel could ever hope to qualify. She must first of all consider the inclinations of her guests. She must not only make them as comfortable as the arrangements and limits of her establishment permit, but she must subordinate her own inclinations utterly. At the same time, she must not fuss and flutter and get agitated and seemingly make efforts in their behalf. Nothing makes a guest more uncomfortable than to feel his host or hostess is being put to a great deal of bother or effort on his account. A perfect hostess, like a perfect housekeeper, has seemingly nothing whatever to do with household arrangements, which apparently run in oiled grooves and of their own accord. Certain rules are easy to observe once they are brought to attention. A hostess should never speak of annoyances of any kind, no matter what happens. Unless she is actually unable to stand up, she should not mention physical ills any more than mental ones. She has invited people to her house, and as long as they are under her roof, hospitality demands that their sojourn shall be made as pleasant as lies in her power. If the cook leaves, then a picnic must be made of the situation, as though a picnic were the most delightful thing that could happen. Should a guest be taken ill, she must assure him that he is not giving the slightest trouble. At the same time, nothing that can be done for his comfort must be overlooked. Should she herself or someone in her family become suddenly ill, she should make as light of it as possible to her guests, even though she withdraw from them. In that event, she must ask a relative or intimate friend to come in and take her place. Nor should the deputy hostess dwell to the guests on the illness, or whatever it is that has deprived them of their hostess. THE GUEST NO ONE INVITES AGAIN The guest no one invites a second time is the one who runs a car to its detriment and a horse to a lather, who leaves a borrowed tennis racket out in the rain, who dog-ears the books, leaves a cigarette on the edge of a table and burns a trench in its edge, who uses towels for boot rags, who stands a wet glass on polished wood, who tracks muddy shoes into the house and leaves his room looking as though it had been through a cyclone. Nor are men the only offenders. Young women have been known to commit every one of these offenses, and the additional one of bringing a pet dog that was not house-trained. Besides these actually destructive shortcomings, there are evidences of bad upbringing in many modern youths whose lack of consideration is scarcely less annoying. Those who are late for every meal. Cheeky others who invite friends of their own to meals without the manners or the decency to ask their hostess's permission. Who help themselves to a car and go off and don't come back for meals at all. And who write no letters afterwards, nor even take the trouble to go up and speak to a former hostess when they see her again. On the other hand, a young person who is considerate is a delight immeasurable, such a delight as only a hostess of much experience can perhaps appreciate. A young girl who tells where she is going, first asking if it is all right, and who finds her hostess, as soon as she is in the house at night, 
to report that she is back, is one who very surely will be asked again and often. A young man is, of course, much freer, but a similar deference to the plans of his hostess and to the hours and customs of the house will result in repeated invitations for him also. The lack of these things is not only bad form, but want of common civility and decency, and reflects not only on the girls and boys themselves, but on their parents, who failed to bring them up properly. THE CONSIDERATE GUEST Courtesy demands that you, when you are a guest, shall show neither annoyance nor disappointment, no matter what happens. Before you can hope to become even a passable guest, let alone a perfect one, you must learn, as it were, not to notice if hot soup is poured down your back. If you neither understand nor care for dogs or children, and both insist on climbing all over you, you must seemingly like it, just as you must be amiable and polite to your fellow guests, even though they be of all the people on earth the most detestable to you. You must, with the very best dissimulation at your command, appear to find the food delicious, though they offer you all of the viands that are especially distasteful to your palate, or antagonistic to your digestion. You must disguise your hatred of red ants and scrambled food, if everyone else is bent on a picnic. You must pretend that six is a perfect dinner hour, though you never dine before eight, or, on the contrary, you must wait until eight-thirty or nine with stoical fortitude, though your dinner hour is six, and by seven your chest seems securely pinned to your spine. If you go for a drive and it pours and there is no top to the carriage or car and you are soaked to the skin and chilled to the marrow so that your teeth chatter, your lips must smile and you must appear to enjoy the refreshing coolness. If you go to stay in a small house in the country and they give you a bed full of lumps in a room of mosquitoes and flies in a chamber over that of a crying baby under the eaves with a temperature of over a hundred, you can... The next morning, walk to the village and send yourself a telegram and leave. But though you feel starved, exhausted, wilted, and are mosquito bitten until you resemble a well developed case of chicken pox or measles, by not so much as a facial muscle must you let the family know that your comfort lacked anything that your happiest imagination could picture. Nor must you confide in anyone afterwards, having broken bread in the house. How desperately wretched you were! If you know any one who is always in demand, not only for dinners, but for trips on private cars and yachts, and long visits in country houses, you may be very sure of one thing. The popular person is first of all unselfish or else extremely gifted, very often both. The perfect guest not only tries to wear becoming clothes, but tries to put on an equally becoming mental attitude. No one is ever asked out very much who is in the habit of telling people all the misfortunes and ailments she has experienced or witnessed, though the perfect guest listens with apparent sympathy to everyone else's. Another attribute of the perfect guest is never to keep people waiting. She is always ready for anything or nothing. If a plan is made to picnic, she likes picnics above everything and proves her liking by enthusiastically making the sandwiches or the salad dressing or whatever she thinks she makes best. If, on the other hand, no one seems to want to do anything, the perfect guest has always a book she is absorbed in or a piece of sewing she is engrossed with. Or else, beyond everything, she would love to sit in an easy chair and do nothing. She never for one moment thinks of herself, but of the other people she is thrown with. She is a person of sympathy always, and instantaneous discernment. She is good tempered no matter what happens, and makes the most of everything as it comes. At games, she is a good loser and a quiet winner. She has a pleasant word, an amusing story, And agreeable comment for most occasions, but she is neither gushing nor fulsome. She has merely acquired a habit 
born of many years of arduous practice, of turning everything that looks like a dark cloud as quickly as possible for the glimmer of a silver lining. She is as sympathetic to children as to older people. She cuts out wonderful paper dolls and soldier hats, always leisurely and easily, as though it cost neither time nor effort. She knows a hundred stories or games. Every baby and every dog goes to her on sight, not because she has any especial talent, except that one she has cultivated, the talent of interest in everyone and everything except herself. Few people know that there is such a talent, or that it can be cultivated. She has more than mere beauty. She has infinite charm, and she is so well born that she is charming to everyone. Her manner to a duke who happens to be staying in the house is not a bit more courteous than her manner to the kitchen maid whom she chances to meet in the kitchen gardens, whither she has gone with the children to see the new kittens, as though new kittens were the apex of all delectability. She always calls the servants by name, always says, How do you do? when she arrives, Good morning while there, and good bye when she leaves. And do they presume, because of her familiarity, when she remembers to ask after the parlor maid's mother and the butler's baby? They wait on her as they wait on no one else who comes to the house, neither the senator nor the governor nor his grace of over there. The ideal guest is an equally ideal hostess. The principle of both is the same. A ready smile, a quick sympathy, a happy outlook, consideration for others, Tenderness toward everything that is young or helpless, and forgetfulness of self, which is not far from the ideal of womankind. The Guest on a Private Car or Yacht The sole difference between being a guest at a country house and a guest on a private car or a yacht is that you put to a very severe test your adaptability as a traveler. You live in very close quarters with your host and hostess and fellow guests, and must therefore be particularly on your guard against being selfish or out of humor. If you are on shore and don't feel well, you can stay home. But off on a cruise, if you are ill, you have to make the best of it, and a seasick person's best is very bad indeed. Therefore, let it be hoped you are a good sailor. If not, Think very, very carefully before you embark. End of chapter 25, part 2. Read by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org, on April 16th, 2007, in Oceanside, California. Etiquette. Chapter 26. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. Etiquette in Society, in Business, in Politics, and at Home by Emily Post. Chapter 26. The House Party in Camp. Roughing it, in the fashionable world, on the Atlantic coast, is rather suggestive of the dairymaid playing of Marie Antoinette, the rough part being mostly picturesque effect, with little taste of actual discomfort. Often, of course, the roughing it is real, especially west of the Mississippi, and sometimes in the east, too, so real that it has no place in a book of etiquette at all. In the following picture of a fashionable camping party, it should perhaps be added that not only the worldlies, but most of the women, really think they are roughing it. At the same time, there is nothing that a genuine dependent upon luxury resents more than to be told he is dependent. It is he who has but newly learned the comforts of living who protests his inability to endure discomfort. The very same people, therefore, who went a short time before to great estates, women who arrived with their maids and luggage containing personal equipment of amazing perfection and unlimited quantity, 
to say nothing of jewels worth a king's ransom, and men who usually travel with their own man-servants and every variety of raiment and paraphernalia, on being invited to rough it with the kindharts at Mountain Summit Camp, are the very ones who most promptly and enthusiastically telegraph their delighted acceptance. At a certain party a few years ago, the only person who declined was a young woman of so little position that she was quite offended that Mrs. Kindhart should suppose her able to endure discomfort such as her invitation implied. This year, the Worldlies, the Normans, the Lovejoys, the Bobo Gildings, the Little Houses, Constance Stile, Jim Smartlington and his bride, Club Window and Young Struthers make up the party. No one declined, not even the Worldlies, though there is a fly in the amber of their perfect satisfaction. Mrs. Kindhart wrote not to bring a maid. Mrs. Worldly is very much disturbed, because she cannot do her hair herself. Mr. Worldly is even more perturbed at the thought of going without his valet. He has never, in the twenty years since he left college, been twenty-four hours away from Ernest. He knows perfectly well that Ernest is not expected, but he means to take him. He will say nothing about it. He can surely find a place for Ernest to stay somewhere. The other men all look upon a holiday away from formality, which includes valeting, as a relief, like the opening of a window in a stuffy room, and none of the women except Mrs. Worldly would take her maid if she could. The Clothes They Take The men all rummage in attics and trunk rooms for those disreputable-looking articles of wearing apparel dear to all sportsmen. Oil-soaked boots, water-soaked and sun-bleached woolen, corduroy, leather, or canvas garments and hats, each looking too shabby from their wives, or valet's point of view, to be offered to a tramp. Every evening is spent in cleaning guns, rummaging for unprepossessing treasures of shooting and fishing equipment. The women also give thought to their wardrobes, consisting chiefly in a process of elimination. Nothing perishable, nothing requiring a maid's help to get into or to take care of. Golf clothes are the first choice, and any other old country clothes, skirts and sweaters, and lots of plain shirt waists to go under the sweaters. An old polo coat and a mackintosh is chosen by each, and for evenings something comfortable and easy to put on in the way of a house gown or ordinary summer day dress. One or two decide to take tea gowns in dark color and plainest variety. All the women who sew or knit take something to work on in unoccupied moments, such as the hours of silent sitting in a canoe while husbands fish. Finally the day arrives. Everyone meets at the railroad station. They are all as smart-looking as can be. There is no sign of rough clothes anywhere, though nothing in the least like a jewel case or parasol is to be seen. At the end of somewhere between eight and eighteen hours, they arrive at a shed which sits on the edge of the single track and is labeled Dustville Junction, and hurrying down the narrow platform is their host. Except that his face is clean-shaven and his manners perfect, he might be taken for a tramp. Three far from smart-looking teams, two buckboards and an express wagon, are standing nearby. Kindhart welcomes everyone with enthusiasm, except the now emerging Ernest. For once Kindhart is nonplussed, and he says to Worldly, "'This isn't Newport, you know.' Of course we can give him a bed somewhere, but this is really no place for Ernest, and there's nothing for him to do. Worldly, for the moment at a loss, explains lamely, I thought he might be useful. If you could find some corner for him tonight, then we can see. That's all right, isn't it? Kindhart, as host, can't say anything further except to agree. Everyone is bundled into the buckboards, except Ernest, who goes on top of the luggage in the express wagon, and a corduroy drive of six or eight miles begins. What the Camp is Like Summit Camp is a collection of wooden shacks like a group of packing cases dumped in a clearing among the pine trees at the edge of a mountain lake. Those who have never been there before feel some misgivings, 
Those who have been there before remember with surprise that they had liked the place. The men alone are filled with enthusiasm. The only person who is thoroughly apprehensive of the immediate future is Ernest. In front of the largest of the shacks, Mrs. Kindhart, surrounded by dogs and children, waves and hurries forward, beaming. Her enthusiasm is contagious. The children look blooming. That the hardship is not hurting them is evident. And when the guests have seen the inside of the camps, most of them are actually as pleased as they look. The biggest shack is a living room. The one nearest is the dining camp. Four or five smaller ones are sleeping camps for guests, and another is the Kindhart's own. The living camp is nothing but a single room, about thirty feet wide and forty long, with an open raftered roof for ceiling. It has windows on four sides, and a big porch built on the southeast corner. There is an enormous open fireplace, and a floor good enough to dance on. The woodwork is of rough lumber, and has a single coat of leaf green paint. The shelves between the uprights are filled with books. All the new novels and magazines are spread out on a long table. The room is furnished with Navajo blankets, wicker furniture, steamer chairs, and hammocks are hung across two of the corners. Two long divan sofas on either side of the fireplace are the only upholstered pieces of furniture in the whole camp, except the mattresses on the beds. The guest camps are separate shacks, each one set back on a platform, leaving a porch in front. Inside they vary in size. Most have two, some have four rooms, but each is merely one pointed roofed space. The front part has a fireplace and is furnished as a sitting room. The rear half is partitioned into two or more cubicles, like box stalls, with partitions about eight feet high and having regular doors. In each of the single rooms there is a bed, bureau, washstand, chair, and two shelves about six or seven feet high, with a calico curtain nailed to the top one and hanging to the floor, making a hat shelf and clothes closet. The few double rooms are twice the size and have all furniture in duplicate. There is also a matting or a rag rug on the floor, and that is all. Each cottage has a bathroom, but the hot water supply seems complicated. A sign says your guide will bring it to you when needed. Mrs. Worldly, feeling vaguely uncomfortable and hungry, is firmly determined to go home on the next morning train. Before she has had much time to reflect, Mrs. Kindhart reports that lunch is nearly ready. Guides come with canisters of hot water, and everyone goes to dress. Town clothes disappear, and woods clothes emerge. This by no means makes a dowdy picture. Good sport clothes never look so well or becoming as when long use has given them an accustomed set characteristic of their wearer. The men put on their oldest country clothes, too, not their fishing treasures to sit at table with ladies. The treasured articles go on in the early dawn, and the guides are the only humans, except themselves, supposed worthy to behold them. Presently a gong is sounded. The Kinhart children run to the guest houses to call out that the gong means dinner is ready, and dinner means lunch. Dining Room Details In a short while, the very group of people who only ten days before were being shown to their places in the worldly's own tapestry hung marble dining room at great estates by a dozen footmen in satin knee breeches. File into the dining camp and take their places at a long pine table painted turkey red on ordinary wooden kitchen chairs, also red. The floral decoration is of laurel leaves in vases made of preserve jars covered with birch bark. Glass and china is of the cheapest, but there are a long centerpiece of hem stitched crash and crashed oilies, and there are real napkins. And at each plate a birch bark napkin ring with a number on it. Mrs. Worldly looks at her napkin ring as though it were an insect. One or two of the others who have not been there before look mildly surprised. Mrs. Kinhart smiles. I'm sorry, but I told you it was roughing it. Anyone who prefers innumerable paper napkins to using a washed one twice is welcome, but one napkin a day apiece is camp rule. 
Mrs. Worldly tries to look amiable. All the rest succeed. The food is limited in variety, but delicious. There are fresh trout from the lake and venison steak, both well cooked in every way that can be devised appear at every meal. All other supplies come in hampers from the city. The head cook is the Kindhart's own, and so is the butler, with one of the chauffeurs went home to help him wait on table. They wear liveries evolved by Mrs. Kindhart of grey flannel trousers, green flannel blazers, very light grey flannel shirts, black ties, and moccasins. The table service, since there are only two to wait on twenty, including the children, is necessarily somewhat farmer style. Ice, tea, rolls, butter, marmalade, cake, fruit are all on the table so that people may help themselves. The amusements offered. After luncheon, Kindhart points out a dozen guides who are waiting at the boathouse to take anyone who wants to be paddled or to sail or to go out into the woods. There is a small swimming pool which can be warmed artificially. Those who like it cold swim in the lake. All the men disappear in groups or singly with a guide. The women go with their husbands or two together with a guide. Should any not want to go out, she can take to one of the hammocks or a divan in the living room and a book. At first sight, this hospitality seems inadequate, but its discomfort is one of outward appearance only. The food is abundant and delicious, whether cooked in the house or by the guides in the woods. The beds are comfortable. There are plenty of warm and good quality, though not white, blankets. Sheets are flannel or cotton as preferred. Pillowcases are linen. Towels of the bath variety, because washing can be done by natives nearby, but ironing is difficult. Let no one, however, think that this is a simple, by that meaning either easy or inexpensive, form of entertainment. Imagine the budget. A dozen guides, teams and drivers, natives to wash and clean and to help the cook. Food for two or three dozen people sent hundreds of miles by express. It is true that the buildings are of the most primitive, and the furnishings too. The bureau drawers do stick, and there is only curtained closet room, and mirrors are few and diminutive, and orders for hot water have to be given ahead of time, but there is no discomfort except bathing in the cold. The huge fire, lighted early every morning by one of the guides in each guest house, keeps the main part fairly warm, but the temperature of one of the bathrooms on a cold morning is scarcely welcoming. Camp manners. People do not dress for dinner, that is, not in evening clothes. After coming in from walking or shooting or fishing, if it is warm, they swim in the pool or have their guides bring them hot water for a bath. Women change into house gowns of some sort. Men put on flannel trousers, soft shirts, and flannel or serge sack coats. In the evening, if it is a beautiful night, everyone sits on steamer chairs. Wrapped in rugs around the big fire built outdoors in front of a sort of penthouse or windbreak. If it is stormy, they sit in front of a fire almost as big in the living room. Sometimes younger ones pop corn or roast chestnuts or perhaps make taffy. Perhaps someone tells a story or someone plays and everyone sings. Perhaps one who has parlor tricks amuses the others. But as a rule, those who have been all day in the open are tired and drowsy. And want nothing but to stretch out for a while in front of the big fire, and then turn in. The etiquette of this sort of a party is so apparently lacking that its inclusion perhaps seems out of place, but it is meant merely as a picture of a phase of fashionable life that is not much exploited, and to show that well bred people never deteriorate in manner. Their behavior is precisely the same, whether at great estates or in camp. A gentleman may be in his shirt sleeves actually, but he never gets into shirt sleeves mentally. He has no inclination to. To be sure, on the particular party described above, Mrs. Worldly wore a squirrel fur cap in the evening as well as the daytime. She said it was because it was so warm and comfortable. It was really because she could not do her hair. Perhaps someone asks about Ernest. At the end of two days of aloof and distasteful idleness, Ernest became quite a human being. 
invaluable as baiter of worms for the children's fish-hooks, as extra butler, and did not scorn even temporary experiments as kitchen-maid. In fact, he proved the half-hearted recommendation that he might be useful so thoroughly that the first person of all to be especially invited for next year and future years was, exactly, Ernest. End of chapter 26 of Etiquette Read by Kara Schallenberg on April 29, 2007, in Oceanside, California. Chapter 27, Part 1 of Etiquette. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. Etiquette in Society, in Business, in Politics, and at Home by Emily Post. Chapter 27, Part 1. Notes and Shorter Letters In writing notes or letters, as in all other forms of social observance, the highest achievement is in giving the appearance of simplicity, naturalness, and force. Those who use long periods of flowered prolixity and pretentious phrases, who write in complicated form with meaningless flourishes, do not make an impression of elegance and erudition upon their readers, but flaunt instead unmistakable evidence of vain glory and ignorance. The letter you write, whether you realize it or not, is always a mirror which reflects your appearance, taste, and character. A sloppy letter, with the writing all pouring into one corner of the page, badly worded, badly spelled, and with unmatched paper and envelope, even possibly a blot, proclaims the sort of person who would have unkempt hair, unclean linen, and broken shoelaces, just as a neat, precise, evenly written note portrays a person of like characteristics. Therefore, while it cannot be said with literal accuracy that one may read the future of a person by study of his handwriting, it is true that if a young man wishes to choose a wife in whose daily life he is sure always to find the unfinished task, the untidy mind, and the syncopated housekeeping, he may do it quite simply by selecting her from her letters. HOW TO IMPROVE A LETTER'S APPEARANCE Some people are fortunate in being able easily to make graceful letters, to space their words evenly, and to put them on a page so that the picture is pleasing. Others are discouraged at the outset because their fingers are clumsy, and their efforts crude, but no matter how badly formed each individual letter may be, if the writing is consistent throughout, the page as a whole looks fairly well. You can make yourself write neatly and legibly. You can, with the help of a dictionary if necessary, spell correctly. You can be sure that you understand the meaning of every word you use. If it is hard for you to write in a straight line, use the lined guide that comes with nearly all stationery. If impossible to keep an even margin, draw a perpendicular line at the left of the guide so that you can start each new line of writing on it. You can also make a guide to slip under the envelope. Far better to use a guide than to send envelopes and pages of writing that slide uphill and down in uncontrolled disorder. And here is an illustration of two such guides, an illustration of a piece of paper with heavy lines running horizontally and one vertically for the margin, and an envelope-shaped guide with horizontal lines to guide the placement of the address. Choice of writing paper. Suitability should be considered in choosing note paper as well as in choosing a piece of furniture for a house. For a handwriting which is habitually large, a larger sized paper should be chosen than for writing which is small. The shape of paper should also depend somewhat upon the spacing of the lines, which is typical of the writer and whether a wide or narrow margin is used. Low, spread-out writing looks better on a square sheet of paper. 
Tall, pointed writing looks better on paper that is high and narrow. Selection of paper, whether rough or smooth, is entirely a matter of personal choice, so that the quality be good and the shape and color conservative. Paper should never be ruled, or highly scented, or odd in shape, or have elaborate or striking ornamentation. Some people use smaller paper for notes or correspondence cards cut to the size of the envelopes. Others use the same size for all correspondence and leave a wider margin in writing notes. The flap of the envelope should be plain and the point not unduly long. If the flap is square instead of being pointed, it may be allowed greater length without being eccentric. Colored linings to envelopes are at present in fashion. Thin white paper with monogram or address stamped in gray to match gray tissue lining of the envelope is, for instance, in very best taste. Young girls may be allowed quite gay envelope linings, but the device on the paper must be minute in proportion to the gaiety of the color. Here are five illustrations of envelopes, showing the back of the envelope where the flap sticks down. The first three are noted that they are in good taste. They have even proportions. The flap of the envelope ends a little more than halfway down the back of the envelope, except for the squared off flap, which ends lower. Of the two which are in bad taste, one has an unevenly shaped flap, and the other has a point that extends all the way down to the bottom of the envelope. Writing paper for a man should always be strictly conservative. Plain white or gray or granite paper, large in size and stamped in the simplest manner. The size should be five and three quarter inches by seven and a half inches, or six by eight, or five and one eighth inches by eight and one eighth inches, or thereabouts. A paper suitable for the use of all the members of a family has the address stamped in black or dark color in plain letters at the top of the first page. More often than not, the telephone number is put in very small letters under that of the address, a great convenience in the present day of telephoning. For example, 350 Park Avenue, telephone 7572 Plaza. Devices for Stamping As there is no such thing as heraldry in America, the use of a coat of arms is as much a foreign custom as the speaking of a foreign tongue. But in certain communities where old families have used their crests continuously since the days when they brought their device and their right to it from Europe, the use of it is suitable and proper. The sight of this or that crest on a carriage or automobile in New York or Boston announces to all those who have lived their lives in either city that the vehicle belongs to a member of this or that family. But for someone without an inherited right to select a lion rampant or a stag couchant because he thinks it looks stylish is as though, for the same reason, he changed his name from Muggins to Marmaduke and quite properly subjects him to ridicule. Strictly speaking, a woman has the right to use a lozenge only, since in heraldic days women did not bear arms, but no one in this country follows heraldic rule to this extent. THE PERSONAL DEVICE It is occasionally the fancy of artists or young girls to adopt some especial symbol associated with themselves. The butterfly of Whistler, for instance, is as well known as his name. A painter of marines has the small outline of a ship stamped on his writing paper, and a New York architect the capital of an ionic column. A generation ago young women used to fancy such an intriguing symbol as a mask, a sphinx, a question mark, or their own names, if their names were such as could be pictured. There can be no objection to one's appropriation of an emblem if one fancies it, but Lily, Belle, Dolly, and Kitten are Lillian, Isabel, Dorothy, and Catherine in these days, and appropriate hallmarks are not easily found. 
Country House Stationery For a Big House In selecting paper for a country house, we go back to the subject of suitability. A big house in important grounds should have very plain, very dignified letter paper. It may be white or tinted blue or gray. The name of the place should be engraved, in the center usually, at the top of the first page. It may be placed left or right as preferred. Slanting across the upper corners or in a list at the upper left side may be put as many addresses as necessary. Many persons use a whole row of small devices in outline, the engine of a train and beside it Ardmore, meaning that Ardmore is the railroad station. A telegraph pole, an envelope, a telephone instrument and beside each an address. These devices are suitable for all places, whether they are great or tiny, that have different addresses for railroad, post office, telephone, or telegraph. Then an illustration of a train engine with Sterlington, New York. Then telegraph poles and envelopes, Ringwood, New Jersey. Then a little telephone, Slotesburg, 732. For the little house. On the other hand, farmhouses and little places in the country may have very bright colored stamping, as well as gay lined envelopes. Places with easily illustrated names quite often have them pictured. The bird cage, for instance, may have a bright blue paper with a bird cage in supposed red lacquer. The band box, a fantastically decorated milliner's box on oyster gray paper, the envelope lining of black and gray pinstripes, and the doll's house might use the outline of a doll's house in grass green on green bordered white paper and white envelopes lined with grass green. Each of these devices must be as small as the outline of a cherry pit and the paper of the smallest size that comes. Envelopes three and a half by five inches or paper four by six, and envelopes the same size to hold paper without folding. Then an illustration of these three devices, the birdcage, the bandbox, and the dollhouse. It is foolish, perhaps, to give the description of such papers, for their fashion is but of the moment. A jeweler from Paris has been responsible for their present vogue in New York, and his clientele is only among the young and smart. Older and more conservative women, and of course all men, keep to the plain fashion of yesterday, which will just as surely be the fashion of tomorrow. Morning Paper Persons who are in mourning use black-edged visiting cards, letter paper, and envelopes. The depth of black corresponds with the depth of mourning, and the closeness of relation to the one who has gone the width decreasing as one's morning lightens. The width of black to use is a matter of personal taste and feeling. A very heavy border, from three-eighths to seven-sixteenths of an inch, announces the deepest retirement. Dating a letter Usually the date is put at the upper right hand of the first page of a letter, or at the end and to the left of the signature of a note. It is far less confusing for one's correspondent to read January 9, 1920, than 1, 9, 20. Theoretically, one should write out the date in full, the 9th of January, 1921. That, however, is the height of pedantry, and an unswallowable mouthful at the top of any page, not a document. At the end of a note, Thursday is sufficient, unless the note is an invitation for more than a week ahead, in which case write, as in a letter, January 9, or the 9th of January. The year is not necessary, since it can hardly be supposed to take a year for a letter's transportation. Sequence of Pages If a note is longer than one page, the third page is usually next, as this leaves the fourth blank and prevents the writing from showing through the envelope. With heavy or tissue-lined envelopes, the fourth is used as often as the third. In letters, one may write first, second, third, fourth in regular order, or first and fourth, 
then opening the sheet and turning it sideways, write across the two inside pages as one. Many prefer to write on first, third, then sideways across second and fourth. In certain cities, Boston for instance, the last word on a page is repeated at the top of the next. It is undoubtedly a good idea, but makes a stuttering impression upon one not accustomed to it. Folding a note. As to whether a letter is folded in such a way that the recipient shall read the contents without having to turn the paper, is giving too much importance to nothing. It is sufficient if the paper is folded neatly, once, of course, for the envelope that is half the length of the paper, and twice for the envelope that is a third. Sealing Wax If you use sealing wax, let us hope you are an adept at making an even and smoothly finished seal. Choose a plain colored wax rather than one speckled with metal. With the sort of paper described for country houses or for young people or those living in studios or bungalows, gay sealing wax may be quite alluring, especially if it can be persuaded to pour smoothly like liquid and not to look like a streaked and broken off slice of dough. In days when envelopes were unknown, all letters had to be sealed. Hence, when envelopes were made, the idea obtained that it was improper to use both gum arabic and wax. Strictly speaking, this may be true, but since all envelopes have mucilage, it would be unreasonable to demand that those who like to use sealing wax have their envelopes made to order. Form of address. The most formal beginning of a social letter is, My dear Mrs. Smith. The fact that in England, dear Mrs. Smith, is more formal does not greatly concern us in America. Dear Mrs. Smith, dear Sarah, dear Sally, Sally dear, dearest Sally, darling Sally, are increasingly intimate. Business letters begin Smith, Johnson and Company, 20 Broadway, New York, dear sirs. Or, if more personal, John Smith and Company, 20 Broadway, New York, my dear Mr. Smith. End of chapter 27, part 1 of Etiquette. Read by Kara Schallenberg on April 26, 2007 in Oceanside, California. Chapter 27, part 2 of Etiquette. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. Etiquette in Society, in Business, in Politics, and at Home by Emily Post. Chapter 27 Notes and Shorter Letters Part 2 The Complimentary Close The close of a business letter should be Yours Truly or Yours very truly. Respectfully is used only by a tradesman to a customer, an employee to an employer, or by an inferior, never by a person of equal position. No lady should ever sign a letter respectfully, not even were she writing to a queen. If an American lady should have occasion to write to a queen, she should conclude her letter, I have the honor to remain, madam, your most obedient. For address and close of letters to persons of title, see table at the end of this chapter. Close of personal notes and letters. It is too bad that the English language does not permit the charming and graceful closing of all letters in the French manner, those little flowers of compliment that leave such a pleasant fragrance after reading. But ever since the eighteenth century, the English speaking have been busy pruning away all ornament of expression even the last remaining graces, kindest regards, with kindest remembrances, are fast disappearing, leaving us nothing but an abrupt, yours truly, or sincerely yours. 
closing a formal note. The best ending to a formal social note is Sincerely, Sincerely yours, Very sincerely, Very sincerely yours, Yours always sincerely, or Always sincerely yours. I remain, dear madam, is no longer in use, but Believe me is still correct when formality is to be expressed in the close of a note. Believe me, very sincerely yours, or Believe me, my dear Mrs. Worldly, most sincerely yours. This last is an English form, but it is used by quite a number of Americans, particularly those who have been much abroad. Appropriate for a man. Faithfully or faithfully yours is a very good signature for a man in writing to a woman or in any uncommercial correspondence, such as a letter to the President of the United States, a member of the cabinet, an ambassador, a clergyman, etc. The intimate closing. Affectionately yours. Always affectionately. Affectionately, devotedly, lovingly, your loving. Are in increasing scale of intimacy. Lovingly is much more intimate than affectionately, and so is devotedly. Sincerely in formal notes and affectionately in intimate notes are the two adverbs most used in the present day, and between these two there is a blank. In English we have no expression to fit sentiment more friendly than the first, nor one less intimate than the second. Not good form. Cordially was coined, no doubt, to fill this need, but its self-consciousness puts it in the category with residence and retire and all the other offenses of pretentiousness, and in New York, at least, it is not used by people of taste. Warmly yours is unspeakable. Yours in haste or hastily yours is not bad form, but is rather carelessly rude. In a tearing hurry is a termination dear to the boarding school girl, but its truth does not make it any more attractive than the vision of that same young girl rushing into a room with her hat and coat half on to swoop upon her mother with a peck of a kiss and with a bye, mamma, whirl out again. Turmoil and flurry may be characteristic of the manners of today. Both are far from the ideal of beautiful manners which should be as assured. As smooth, as controlled as the running of a high grade automobile. Flea like motions are no better suited to manners than to motors. Other endings. Gratefully is used only when a benefit has been received, as to a lawyer who has skillfully handled a case, to a surgeon who has saved a life dear to you, to a friend who has been put to unusual trouble to do you a favor. In an ordinary letter of thanks, the signature is sincerely, affectionately, devotedly, as the case may be. The phrases that a man might devise to close a letter to his betrothed or his wife are bound only by the limit of his imagination and do not belong in this or any book. The signature. Abroad, the higher the rank, the shorter the name. A duke, for instance, signs himself Marlborough, nothing else, and a queen her first name, Victoria. The social world in Europe, therefore, laughs at us for using our whole names, or worse yet, inserting meaningless initials in our signatures. Etiquette in accord with Europe also objects strenuously to initials and demands that names be always engraved and, if possible, written in full, but only very correct people strictly observe this rule. In Europe, all persons have so many names given them in baptism that they are forced, naturally, to lay most of them aside, selecting one, or at most two, for use. In America, The names bestowed at baptism become inseparably part of each individual, so that if the name is overlong, a string of initials is the inevitable result. Since in America it is not customary for a man to discard any of his names, 
and John Hunter Titherington Smith is far too much of a penful for the one who signs thousands of letters and documents, it is small wonder that he chooses J. H. T. Smith instead, or perhaps, at the end of personal letters, John H. T. Smith. Why shouldn't he? It is, after all, his own name to sign as he chooses, and in addressing him deference to his choice should be shown. A married woman should always sign a letter to a stranger, a bank, business firm, etc., with her baptismal name, and add, in parenthesis, her married name. Thus, Very truly yours, Sarah Robinson Smith, Mrs. J. H. Titherington Smith. Never, under any circumstances, sign a letter, Mr., Mrs., or Miss, except a note written in the third person. If, in the example above, Sarah Robinson Smith were Miss, she would put Miss in parenthesis to the left of her signature. Miss, Sarah Robinson Smith. The Superscription Formal invitations are always addressed to Mr. Stanley Smith. All other personal letters may be addressed to Stanley Smith, Esquire. The title of Esquire formerly was used to denote the eldest son of a knight or members of a younger branch of a noble house. Later, all graduates of universities, professional and literary men, and important landholders were given the right to this title, which even today denotes a man of education, a gentleman. John Smith Esquire is John Smith Gentleman. Mr. John Smith may be a gentleman or may not be one. And yet, as noted above, all engraved invitations are addressed, Mr. Never under any circumstances address a social letter or note to a married woman, even if she is a widow, as Mrs. Mary Town. A widow is still Mrs. James Town. If her son's wife should have the same name, she becomes Mrs. James Town Sr., or simply Mrs. Town. A divorced woman, if she was the innocent person, retains the right, if she chooses, to call herself Mrs. John Brown Smith, but usually she prefers to take her own surname. Supposing her to have been Mary Simpson, she calls herself Mrs. Simpson Smith. If a lady is the wife or widow of the head of a family, she may call herself Mrs. Smith, even on visiting cards and invitations. The eldest daughter is Miss Smith, her younger sister, Miss Jane Smith. Invitations to children are addressed Miss Catherine Smith and Master Robert Smith. Do not write the Messrs. Brown in addressing a father and son. The Messrs. Brown is correct only for unmarried brothers. Although one occasionally sees an envelope addressed to Mr. and Mrs. Jones, and Miss Jones written underneath the names of her parents, it is better form to send a separate invitation addressed to Miss Jones alone. A wedding invitation addressed to Mr. and Mrs. Jones and family is not in good taste. Even if the Jones children are young, the Mrs. Jones should receive a separate envelope, and so should Master Jones. One last remark. Write the name and address on the envelope as precisely and as legibly as you can. The post office has enough to do in deciphering the letters of the illiterate without being asked to do unnecessary work for you. Business Letters Business letters written by a private individual differ very little from those sent out from a business house. A lady never says, Yours of the sixth received and contents noted, or yours to hand, nor does she address the firm as gentleman, nor does she ever sign herself respectfully. A business letter should be as brief and explicit as possible. For example, Tuxedo Park, New York, May 17, 1922. I Paint and Company, 22 Branch Street, New York. Dear Sirs, Your estimate for painting my dining room, 
library, south bedroom, and dressing room is satisfactory, and you may proceed with the work as soon as possible. I find, on the other hand, that wainscoting the hall comes to more than I had anticipated, and I have decided to leave it as it is, for the present. Very truly yours, C. R. Town, Mrs. Jamestown. THE SOCIAL NOTE There should be no more difficulty in writing a social note than in writing a business letter. Each has a specific message for its sole object, and the principle of construction is the same. DATE ADDRESS, ON BUSINESS LETTER ONLY SALUTATION THE STATEMENT OF WHATEVER IS THE PURPOSE OF THE NOTE COMPLIMENTARY CLOSE SIGNATURE or date here. The difference in form between a business and a social note is that the full name and address of the person written to is never put in the latter. Better quality stationery is used, and the salutation is My dear, or Dear, instead of Dear Sir. Example 350 Park Avenue Dear Mrs. Robinson, I am enclosing the list I promised you. Louberge makes the most beautiful things. Mower, the dressmaker, has for years made clothes for me, and I think Revaux the best milliner in Paris. Léonie is a little milliner, who often has pretty blouses, as well as hats, and is very reasonable. I do hope the addresses will be of some use to you, and that you will have a delightful trip. Very sincerely, Martha Kindhart. Thursday. THE NOTE OF APOLOGY EXAMPLES Number 1. Broadlawns. Dear Mrs. Town, I do deeply apologize for my seeming rudeness in having to send the message about Monday night. When I accepted your invitation, I stupidly forgot entirely that Monday was a holiday, and that all of my own guests, naturally, were not leaving until Tuesday morning, and Arthur and I could not therefore go out by ourselves and leave them. We were too disappointed, and hope that you know how sorry we were not to be with you. Very sincerely, Ethel Norman, Tuesday morning. 2. Dear Mrs. Neighbor, My gardener has just told me that our chickens got into your flower beds and did a great deal of damage. The chicken netting is being built higher at this moment, and they will not be able to damage anything again. I shall, of course, send Patrick to put in shrubs to replace those broken, although I know that ones newly planted cannot compensate for those you have lost, and I can only ask you to accept my contrite apologies. Always sincerely yours. Catherine de Puster, Eminent End of chapter 27, part 2 of Etiquette. Read by Kara Schallenberg on April 27th, 2007 in Oceanside, California. Chapter 27, part 3 of Etiquette. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. Etiquette in Society, in Business, in Politics and at Home by Emily Post. Chapter 27. Notes and Shorter Letters. Part 3. Letters of Thanks. In the following examples of letters intimate and from young persons, such profuse expressions as divine, awfully, petrified, too sweet, too wonderful, are purposely inserted, because to change all of the above enthusiasms into pleased with, very, feared, most kind, would be to change the vitality of the real letters into smug and self-conscious utterances at variance with anything ever written by young men and women of today. Even the letters of older persons, although they are more restrained than those of youth, avoid anything suggesting pedantry and affectation. 
Do not from this suppose that well-bred people write badly. On the contrary, perfect simplicity and freedom from self-consciousness are possible only to those who have acquired at least some degree of cultivation. For flagrant examples of pretentiousness, which is the infallible sign of lack of breeding, see chapter 8. For simplicity of expression, such as is unattainable to the rest of us, but which we can at least strive to emulate, read first the Bible, then at random one might suggest such authors as Robert Louis Stevenson, E. S. Martin, Agnes Repellier, John Galsworthy, and Max Baerbohm. E. V. Lucas has written two novels in letter form, which illustrate the best type of present-day letter-writing. Letters of Thanks for Wedding Presents Although all wedding presents belong to the bride, she generally words her letters of thanks as though they belonged equally to the groom, especially if they have been sent by particular friends of his. Two Intimate Friends of the Groom Dear Mrs. Norman, to think of your sending us all this wonderful glass, it is simply divine, and Jim and I both thank you a thousand times. The presents are, of course, to be shown on the day of the wedding, but do come in on Tuesday at tea-time for an earlier view. Thanking you again, and with love from us both, affectionately, Mary. Formal Example 1 Dear Mrs. Gilding, it was more than sweet of you and Mr. Gilding to send us such a lovely clock. Thank you very, very much. Looking forward to seeing you on the tenth. Very sincerely, Mary Smith. Sometimes, as in the two examples above, thanks to the husband are definitely expressed in writing to the wife. Usually, however, you is understood to mean you both. Example 2. Dear Mrs. Worldly, All my life I have wanted a piece of jade, but in my wanting I have never imagined one quite so beautiful as the one you have sent me. It was wonderfully sweet of you, and I thank you more than I can tell you for the pleasure you have given me. Affectionately, Mary Smith. Example 3. Dear Mrs. Eminent, Thank you for these wonderful prints. They go too beautifully with some old English ones that Jim's uncle sent us, and our dining-room will be quite perfect, as to walls. Hoping that you are surely coming to the wedding, very sincerely, Mary Smith. To a friend who is in deep mourning. Dear Susan, with all you have on your heart just now, it was so sweet and thoughtful of you to go out and buy me a present, and such a beautiful one. I love it, and your thought of me in sending it, and I thank you more than I can tell you. Devotedly, Mary. Very Intimate Dear Aunt Kate, Really, you are too generous. It is outrageous of you, but, of course, it is the most beautiful bracelet, and I am so excited over it, I hardly know what I am doing. You are too good to me, and you spoil me, but I do love you and it, and thank you with all my heart. Mary. Intimate. Dear Mrs. Neighbor, The tea-cloth is perfectly exquisite. I have never seen such beautiful work. I appreciate your lovely gift more than I can tell you, both for its own sake and for your kindness in making it for me. Don't forget, you are coming in on Tuesday afternoon to see the presents. Lovingly, Mary. Sometimes pushing people send presents when they are not asked to the wedding in the hope of an invitation. Sometimes others send presents when they are not asked merely through kindly feeling toward a young couple on the threshold of life. It ought not to be difficult to distinguish between the two. Example 1 My dear Mrs. Upstart, thank you for the very handsome candlesticks you sent us. They were a great surprise— but it was more than kind of you to think of us. Very sincerely, Mary Smith. Example 2 Dear Mrs. Kindly, I can't tell you how sweet I think it of you to send us such a lovely present, and Jim and I both hope that when we are in our own home, 
you will see them often at our table. Thanking you many times for your thought of us, very sincerely, Mary Smith. For a present sent after the wedding. Dear Mrs. Chatterton, the mirror you sent us is going over our drawing room mantel just as soon as we can hang it up. It is exactly what we most needed, and we both thank you ever so much. Please come in soon to see how becoming it will be to the room. Yours affectionately, Mary Smith Smartlington. Thanks for Christmas or other presents. Dear Lucy, I really think it was adorable of you to have a chair like yours made for me. It was worth adding a year to my age for such a nice birthday present. Jack says I am never going to have a chance to sit in it, however, if he gets there first, and even the children look at it with longing. At all events, I am perfectly enchanted with it, and thank you ever and ever so much. Affectionately, Sally. Dear Uncle Arthur, I know I oughtn't to have opened it until Christmas, but I couldn't resist the look of the package, and then putting it on at once. So I am all dressed up in your beautiful chain. It is one of the loveliest things I have ever seen, and I certainly am lucky to have it given to me. Thank you a thousand, and then more times for it. Rosalie. Dear Kate, I am fascinated with my utility box. It is too beguiling for words. You are the cleverest one anyway for finding what no one else can, and every one wants. I don't know how you do it. And you certainly were sweet to think of me. Thank you, dear. Ethel. Thanks for present to a baby. Dear Mrs. Kindheart, of course it would be, because no one else can sew like you. The sack you made the baby is the prettiest thing I have ever seen, and is perfectly adorable on her. Thank you, as usual, you dear Mrs. Kindheart, for your goodness to your affectionate Sally. Dear Mrs. Norman, thank you ever so much for the lovely Afghan you sent the baby. It is by far the prettiest one he has. It is so soft and close. He doesn't get his fingers tangled in it. Do come in and see him, won't you? We are both allowed visitors, especial ones, every day between four and five thirty. Affectionately always, Lucy. THE BREAD AND BUTTER LETTER When you have been staying over Sunday or for longer in someone's house, it is absolutely necessary that you write a letter of thanks to your hostess within a few days after the visit. Bread and butter letters, as they are called, are the stumbling blocks of visitors. Why they are so difficult for nearly every one is hard to determine, unless it is that they are often written to persons with whom you are on formal terms, and the letter should be somewhat informal in tone. Very likely you have been visiting a friend, and must write to her mother, whom you scarcely know. Perhaps you have been included in a large and rather formal house party, and the hostess is an acquaintance rather than a friend. Or perhaps you are a bride, and have been on a first visit to relatives or old friends of your husband's, but strangers until now to you. As an example of the first, where you have been visiting a girlfriend and must write a letter to her mother, you begin, Dear Mrs. Town, at the top of a page, and nothing in the forbidding memory of Mrs. Town encourages you to go further. It would be easy enough to write to Pauline, the daughter. Very well. Write to Pauline, then, on an odd piece of paper in pencil, what a good time you had, how nice it was to be with her. Then copy your note composed to Pauline off on the page beginning, Dear Mrs. Town. You have only to add, Love to Pauline, and thanking you again for asking me. Sign it, very sincerely, and there you are. Don't be afraid that your note is too informal. Older people are always pleased with any expressions from the young that seem friendly and spontaneous. Never think, because you cannot easily write a letter, that it is better not to write one at all. The most awkward note that can be imagined is better than none, for to write none is the depth of rudeness, whereas the awkward note merely fails to delight. Examples From a young woman to a formal hostess after a house party Dear Mrs. Norman, 
I don't know when I ever had such a good time as I did at Broadlawn's. Thank you a thousand times for asking me. As it happened, the first persons I saw on Monday at the town's dinner were Celia and Donald. We immediately had a threesome conversation on the wonderful time we all had over Sunday. Thank you again for your kindness to me. Very sincerely yours, Grace Smalltalk. To a formal hostess after an especially amusing weekend. Dear Mrs. Worldly, every moment at great estates was a perfect delight. I am afraid my work at the office this morning was down to zero in efficiency, so perhaps it is just as well, if I am to keep my job, that the average weekend in the country is different, very. Thank you all the same for the wonderful time you gave us all, and believe me, faithfully yours, Frederick Batchelor. Dear Mrs. Worldly, Every time I come from great estates, I realize again that there is no house to which I always go with so much pleasure, and leave on Monday morning with so much regret. Your party over this last weekend was simply wonderful, and thank you ever so much for having included me. Always sincerely, Constance Style. From a young couple. Dear Mrs. Town, we had a perfect time at Tuxedo over Sunday, and it was so good of you to include us. Jack says he is going to practice putting the way Mr. Town showed him, and maybe the next time he plays in a foursome he won't be such a handicap to his partner. Thanking you both for the pleasure you gave us. Affectionately yours, Sally Titherington Littlehouse. From a bride to her new relatives in law. A letter that was written by a bride after paying a first visit to her husband's aunt and uncle won for her at a stroke the love of the whole family. This is the letter. Dear Aunt Annie, now that it is all over, I have a confession to make. Do you know that when Dick drove me up to your front door, and I saw you and Uncle Bob standing on the top step, I was simply paralyzed with fright? Suppose they don't like me, was all that I could think. Of course I knew you loved Dick, but that only made it worse. How awful if you couldn't like me! The reason I stumbled coming up the steps was because my knees were actually knocking together. You remember, Uncle Bob sang out it was good I was already married, or I wouldn't be this year. And then, you were both so perfectly adorable to me, and you made me feel as though I had always been your niece, and not just the wife of your nephew. I loved every minute of our being with you, dear Aunt Annie, just as much as Dick did, and we hope you are going to let us come soon again. With best love from both, your affectionate niece, Helen. The above type of letter would not serve, perhaps, if Dick's aunt had been a forbidding and austere type of woman, but even such a one would be far more apt to take a new niece to her heart if the new niece herself gave evidence of having one. After visiting a friend. Dear Kate, it was hideously dull and stuffy in town this morning after the fresh coolness of Strandholm. The back yard is not an alluring outlook after the wide spaces and delicious fragrance of your garden. It was good being with you, and I enjoyed every moment. Don't forget you are lunching here on the 16th, and that we are going to hear Chrysler together. Devotedly always, Caroline. From a man who has been ill and convalescing at a friend's house. Dear Martha, I certainly hated taking that train this morning and realizing that the end had come to my peaceful days. You and John and the children and your place, which is the essence of all that a home ought to be, have put me on my feet again. I thank you much, much more than I can say for the wonderful goodness of all of you. Fred from a woman who has been visiting a very old friend. I loved my visit with you, dear Mary. It was more than good to be with you and have a chance for long talks at your fireside. Don't forget your promise to come here in May. I told Sam and Hetty you were coming, and now the whole town is ringing with the news, and everyone is planning a party for you. David sends his best to you and Charlie, and you know you always have the love of 
Your devoted, Pat. To an acquaintance. After a visit to a formal acquaintance, or when someone has shown you a special hospitality in a city where you are a stranger. My dear Mrs. Duluth, it was more than good of you to give my husband and me so much pleasure. We enjoyed and appreciated all your kindness to us more than we can say. We hope that you and Mr. Duluth may be coming east before long, and that we may then have the pleasure of seeing you at Strandholm. In the meanwhile, thanking you for your generous hospitality, and with kindest regards to you both, in which my husband joins, believe me. Very sincerely yours, Catherine de Puster Eminent. An Engraved Card of Thanks An engraved card of thanks is proper only when sent by a public official to acknowledge the overwhelming number of congratulatory messages he must inevitably receive from strangers when he has carried an election or otherwise been honored with the confidence of his state or country. A recent and excellent example follows. Executive Mansion My dear blank, I warmly appreciate your kind message of congratulation which has given me a great deal of pleasure, and sincerely wish that it were possible for me to acknowledge it in a less formal manner. Faithfully, Signed by hand. An engraved form of thanks for sympathy, also from one in public life, is presented in the following example. Mr. John Smith wishes to express his deep gratitude and to thank you for your kind expression of sympathy. But remember, an engraved card sent by a private individual to a personal friend is not stylish or smart but rude. See also Engraved Acknowledgement of Sympathy, Chapter 24. End of Chapter 27, Part 3 of Etiquette. Read by Kara Schallenberg on April 27, 2007, in Oceanside, California. Etiquette, Chapter 27, Part 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. Etiquette in Society, in Business, in Politics, and at Home by Emily Post. Chapter 27. Notes and Shorter Letters. Part 4. THE LETTER OF INTRODUCTION A letter of business introduction can be much more freely given than a letter of social introduction. For the former it is necessary merely that the persons introduced have business interests in common, which are much more easily determined than social compatibility, which is the requisite necessary for the latter. It is, of course, proper to give your personal representative a letter of introduction to whomever you send him. On the subject of letters of social introduction, there is one chief rule. Never ask for letters of introduction, and be very sparing in your offers to write or accept them. Seemingly few persons realize that a letter of social introduction is actually a draft for payment on demand. The form might as well be the bearer of this has, because of it, the right to demand your interest, your time, your hospitality, liberally and at once, no matter what your inclination may be. Therefore, it is far better to refuse in the beginning than to hedge and end by committing the greater error of unwarrantedly inconveniencing a valued friend or acquaintance. When you have a friend who is going to a city where you have other friends, and you believe that it will be a mutual pleasure for them to meet, a letter of introduction is proper, and very easy to write, but sent to a casual acquaintance, no matter how attractive or distinguished the person to be introduced, it is a gross presumption. THE MORE FORMAL NOTE OF INTRODUCTION Dear Mrs. Marks, Julian Gibbs is going to Buffalo on January 10th, 
to deliver a lecture on his polar expedition, and I am sending him a card of introduction to you. He is very agreeable personally, and I think that perhaps you and Mr. Marx will enjoy meeting him as much as I know he would enjoy knowing you. With kindest regards, in which Arthur joins, very sincerely, Ethel Norman. If Mr. Norman were introducing one man to another, he would give his card to the former, inscribed as follows. Introducing Julian Gibbs, Mr. Arthur Lees Norman, Broadlawns. Also Mr. Norman would send a private letter by mail, telling his friend that Mr. Gibbs is coming, as follows. Dear Marks, I am giving Julian Gibbs a card of introduction to you when he goes to Buffalo on the 10th to lecture. He is an entertaining and very decent fellow, and I think possibly Mrs. Marks would enjoy meeting him. If you can conveniently ask him to your house, I know he would appreciate it. If not, perhaps you will put him up for a day or two at a club. Faithfully, Arthur Norman. Informal Letter of Introduction Dear Claire, A very great friend of ours, James Dawson, is to be in Chicago for several weeks. Any kindness that you can show him will be greatly appreciated by, yours as always, Ethel Norman. At the same time a second and private letter of information is written and sent by mail. Dear Claire, I wrote you a letter today introducing Jim Dawson. He used to be on the Yalverd football team, perhaps you remember. He is one of the best sort in the world, and I know you will like him. I don't want to put you to any trouble, but do ask him to your house if you can. He plays a wonderful game of golf and a good game of bridge, but he is more a man's than a woman's type of man. Maybe if Tom likes him, he will put him up at a club, as he is to be in Chicago for some weeks. Affectionately always, Ethel. Another example. Dear Caroline, a very dear friend of mine, Mrs. Fred West, is going to be in New York this winter, while her daughter is at Barnard. I am asking her to take this letter to you, as I want very much to have her meet you, and have her daughter meet Pauline. Anything that you can do for them will be the same as for me. Yours affectionately, Sylvia Greatlake. The private letter by mail to accompany the foregoing. Dearest Caroline, Mildred West, for whom I wrote to you this morning, is a very close friend of mine. She is going to New York with her only daughter, who, in spite of wanting a college education, is as pretty as a picture, with plenty of come hither in the eye, so do not be afraid that the typical blue-stocking is to be thrust upon Pauline. The mother is an altogether lovely person, and I know that you and she will speak the same language. If I didn't, I wouldn't give her a letter to you. Do go and see her as soon as you can. She will be stopping at the Fitzcherry, and probably feeling rather lost at first. She wants to take an apartment for the winter, and I told her I was sure you would know the best real estate and intelligence offices, etc., for her to go to. I hope I am not putting you to any trouble about her, but she is really a darling, and you will like her, I know. Devotedly yours, Sylvia. Directions for procedure upon being given or receiving a letter of introduction will be found in Chapter 2. THE THIRD PERSON In other days, when even verbal messages began with the presenting of compliments, a social note, no matter what its length or purport, would have been considered rude, unless written in the third person. But as in a communication of any length, the difficulty of this form is almost insurmountable, to say nothing of the pedantic effect of its accomplishment, it is no longer chosen, aside from the formal invitation, acceptance, and regret, except for notes to stores or subordinates. For example, Will B. Stern and Company, please send and charge to Mrs. John H. Smith, 2 Madison Avenue, one paper of needles, number 9, two spools of white sewing cotton, number 70, one yard of material, sample enclosed, January 6th. To a servant. 
Mrs. Eminent wishes Patrick to meet her at the station on Tuesday the 8th at 11.03. She also wishes him to have the shutters opened and the house aired on that day and a fire lighted in the northwest room. No provisions will be necessary as Mrs. Eminent is returning to town on the 5.16. Tuesday, March 1st. Letters in the third person are no longer signed unless the sender's signature is necessary for identification or for some action on the part of the receiver, such as Will Mr. Cash please give the bearer six yards of material to match the sample enclosed and oblige Mrs. John H. Smith? A note in third person is the single occasion when a married woman signs Mrs. before her name. The Letter of Recommendation A letter of recommendation for membership to a club is addressed to the secretary and should be somewhat in this form. To the secretary of the town club. My dear Mrs. Brown, Mrs. Titherington Smith, whose name is posted for membership, is a very old and close friend of mine. She is the daughter of the late Reverend Samuel Eminent, and is therefore a member in her own right, as well as by marriage, of representative New York families. She is a person of much charm and distinction, and her many friends will agree with me, I am sure, in thinking that she would be a valuable addition to the club. Very sincerely, Ethel Norman. Recommendation of Employees Although the written recommendation that is given to the employee carries very little weight, compared to the slip from the employment agencies where either yes or no has to be answered to a list of specific and important questions, one is nevertheless put in a trying position when reporting on an unsatisfactory servant. Either a poor reference must be given, possibly preventing a servant from earning her living, or one has to write what is not true. Consequently, it has become the custom to say what one truthfully can of good, and leave out the qualifications that are bad, except in the case of a careless nurse, where evasion would border on the criminal. That solves the poor recommendation problem pretty well, but unless one is very careful, this consideration for the poor one is paid for by the good. In writing for a very worthy servant, therefore, it is of the utmost importance in fairness to her, or him, to put in every merit that you can think of, remembering that omission implies demerit in each trait of character not mentioned. All good references should include honesty, sobriety, capability, and a reason other than their unsatisfactoriness for their leaving. The recommendation for a nurse cannot be too conscientiously written. A lady does not begin a recommendation to whom it may concern, nor, this is to certify, although housekeepers and head servants writing recommendation use both of these forms, and third-person letters are frequently written by secretaries. A lady, in giving a good reference, should write, 200 Park Square. Selma Johnson has lived with me for two years as cook. I have found her honest, sober, industrious, neat in person as well as her work, of amiable disposition, a very good cook. She is leaving to my great regret because I am closing my house for the winter. Selma is an excellent servant in every way, and I shall be glad to answer personally any inquiries about her. Josephine Smith, Mrs. Titherington Smith, October 1921. The form of all recommendations is the same. Blank has lived with me, blank months slash years, as blank. I have found him slash her blank. He slash she is leaving because blank. Any special remark of added recommendation or showing interest. Signed blank. Mrs. blank. Date. Letters of congratulation. Letter of congratulation on engagement. Dear Mary, while we are not altogether surprised, we are both delighted to hear the good news. Jim's family and ours are very close, as you know, and we have always been especially devoted to Jim. He is one of the finest, and now luckiest, of young men, and we send you both every good wish for all possible happiness. Affectionately, Ethel Norman. Just a line, dear Jim, 
to tell you how glad we all are to hear of your happiness. Mary is everything that is lovely, and, of course, from our point of view, we don't think her exactly unfortunate either. Every good wish that imagination can think of goes to you from your old friends, Ethel and Arthur Norman. I can't tell you, dearest Mary, of all the wishes I send for your happiness. Give Jim my love and tell him how lucky I think he is, and how much I hope all good fortune will come to you both. Lovingly, Aunt Kate. Congratulation on some especial success. My dear Mrs. Brown, we have just heard of the honors that your son has won. How proud you must be of him. We are both so glad for him and for you. Please congratulate him for us, and believe me, very sincerely, Ethel Norman. Or, Dear Mrs. Brown, we are so glad to hear the good news of David's success. It was a very splendid accomplishment, and we are all so proud of him and of you. Please give him our love and congratulations, and with full measure of both to you, affectionately, Martha Kindhart. Congratulating a friend appointed to high office. Dear John, we are overjoyed at the good news. For once the reward has fallen where it is deserved. Certainly no one is better fitted than yourself for a diplomat's life, and we know you will fill the position to the honor of your country. Please give my love to Alice, and with renewed congratulations to you from us both. Yours always, Ethel Norman. Another example. Dear Michael, we all rejoice with you in the confirmation of your appointment. The state needs just such men as you. If we had more of your sort, the ordinary citizen would have less to worry about. Our best congratulations. John Kindhart The Letter of Condolence Intimate letters of condolence are like love letters, in that they are too sacred to follow a set form. One rule, and one only, should guide you in writing such letters. Say what you truly feel. Say that, and nothing else. Sit down at your desk. Let your thoughts dwell on the person you are writing to. Don't dwell on the details of illness or the manner of death. Don't quote endlessly from the poets and scriptures. Remember that eyes filmed with tears and an aching heart cannot follow rhetorical lengths of writing. The more nearly a note can express a hand-clasp, a thought of sympathy, above all a genuine love or appreciation of the one who has gone, the greater comfort it brings. Write as simply as possible, and let your heart speak as truly and as briefly as you can. Forget, if you can, that you are using written words. Think merely how you feel, then put your feelings on paper. That is all. Supposing it is a young mother who has died— You think how young and sweet she was, and of her little children, and, literally, your heart aches for them, and her husband, and her own family. Into your thoughts must come some expression of what she was, and what their loss must be. Or maybe it is the death of a man who has left a place in the whole community that will be difficult, if not impossible, to fill, and you think of all he stood for that was fine and helpful to others, and how much and sorely he will be missed. Or suppose that you are a returned soldier, and it is a pal who has died. All you can think of is, Poor old Steve, what a peach he was. I don't think anything will ever be the same again without him. Say just that. Ask if there is anything you can do at any time to be of service to his people. There is nothing more to be said. A line, into which you have unconsciously put a little of the genuine feeling that you had for Steve, is worth pages of eloquence. A letter of condolence may be abrupt, badly constructed, ungrammatical, never mind. Grace of expression counts for nothing. Sincerity alone is of value. It is the expression, however clumsily put, of a personal something which was loved, and will ever be missed, that alone brings solace to those who are left. Your message may speak merely of a small incident, something so trifling that in the seriousness of the present seems not worth recording, but your letter, and that of many others, each bringing a single sprig, may plant a whole memory garden in the hearts of the bereaved. EXAMPLES OF NOTES AND TELEGRAMS 
As has been said above, a letter of condolence must above everything express a genuine sentiment. The few examples are inserted merely as suggestive guides for those at a loss to construct a short but appropriate note or telegram. Conventional Note to an Acquaintance I know how little the words of an outsider mean to you just now, but I must tell you how deeply I sympathize with you in your great loss. Note or telegram to a friend. All my sympathy and all my thoughts are with you in your great sorrow. If I can be of any service to you, you know how grateful I shall be. Telegram to a very near relative or friend. Words are so empty, if only I knew how to fill them with love and send them to you. Or, if love and thoughts could only help you, Margaret dear, you should have all the strength of both that I can give. Letter where death was release. The letter to one whose loss is, for the best, is difficult in that you want to express sympathy, but cannot feel sad that one who has long suffered has found release. The expression of sympathy in this case should not be for the present death, but for the illness, or whatever it was that fell long ago. The grief for a paralyzed mother is for the stroke which cut her down many years before, and your sympathy, though you may not have realized it, is for that. You might write, Your sorrow during all these years, and now, is in my heart, and all my thoughts and sympathy are with you. End of chapter 27, part 4 of Etiquette Read by Kara Schallenberg on April 27, 2007 in Oceanside, California Chapter 27, part 5 of Etiquette This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. Etiquette in Society, in Business, in Politics, and at Home by Emily Post. Chapter 27. Notes and Shorter Letters. Part 5. How to Address Important Personages. The President. If you are speaking, you say... Mr. President, and occasionally throughout a conversation, Sir. Envelope addressed, The President of the United States, or merely, The President, Washington, D.C. There is only one President. Formal beginning of a letter, Sir. Informal beginning, My dear Mr. President. Formal close, I have the honor to remain most respectfully yours, or, I have the honor to remain, sir, your most obedient servant. Informal close. I have the honor to remain yours faithfully. Or, I am, dear Mr. President, yours faithfully. Correct titles in introduction. The President. The Vice President. If you are speaking, you say, Mr. Vice President, and then, Sir. Envelope addressed, The Vice President, Washington, D.C. Formal beginning of a letter, Sir. Informal beginning, My dear Mr. Vice President. Formal close, Same as for President. Informal close, Believe me, yours faithfully. Correct titles in introduction, The Vice President. Justice of Supreme Court. If you are speaking, you say, Mr. Justice. Envelope addressed, The Honorable William H. Taft, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Washington, D.C. Formal beginning of a letter, Sir. Informal beginning, Dear Mr. Justice Taft. Formal close, Believe me, yours very truly, or... I have the honor to remain yours very truly. Informal close. Believe me, yours faithfully. Correct titles in introduction. The Chief Justice, or, if an Associate Justice, Mr. Justice Holmes. 
Member of the President's Cabinet. If you are speaking, you say, Mr. Secretary. Envelope addressed, The Secretary of Commerce, Washington, D.C., or The Honorable Herbert Hoover, Secretary of Commerce, Washington, D.C. Formal beginning of a letter, Dear Sir, or Sir. Informal beginning, My dear Mr. Secretary. Formal close, same as above. Informal close, same as above. Correct titles in introduction. The Secretary of Commerce. United States, or State, Senator. If you are speaking, you say, Senator Lodge. Envelope addressed, Senator Henry Cabot Lodge, Washington, D.C., or a private letter, Senator Henry Cabot Lodge, his house address. Formal beginning of a letter, Dear Sir, or Sir. Informal beginning, Dear Senator Lodge. Formal close, same as above. Informal close, same as above. Correct titles in introduction. Senator Lodge. On very formal and unusual occasions, Senator Lodge of Massachusetts. Member of Congress or Legislature. If you are speaking, you say, Mr. Bell, or you may say, Congressman. Envelope addressed, The Honorable H. C. Bell, Jr., House of Representatives, Washington, D.C., or State Assembly, Albany, New York. Formal beginning of a letter, Dear Sir or Sir. Informal beginning, Dear Mr. Bell, or Dear Congressman. Formal close, Believe me, yours very truly. Informal close, Yours faithfully. Correct titles in introduction, Mr. Bell. Governor. If you are speaking, you say, Governor Miller. The governor is not called Excellency when spoken to, and very rarely when he is announced, but letters are addressed and begun with this title of courtesy. Envelope addressed, His Excellency, the Governor, Albany, New York. Formal beginning of a letter, Your Excellency. Informal beginning, Dear Governor Miller. Formal close, I have the honor to remain yours faithfully. Informal close, Believe me, yours faithfully. Correct titles in introduction. The Governor, in his own state, or out of it, the Governor of Michigan. Mayor. If you are speaking, you say, Mr. Mayor. Envelope addressed, His Honor, the Mayor, City Hall, Chicago. Formal beginning of a letter, Dear Sir, or Sir. Informal beginning, Dear Mayor Rolf. Formal close, Believe me, very truly yours. Informal close, Yours faithfully. Correct titles in introduction, Mayor Rolf. Cardinal. If you are speaking, you say, Your Eminence. Envelope addressed, His Eminence John Cardinal Gibbons, Baltimore, Maryland. Formal beginning of a letter, Your Eminence. Informal beginning, Your Eminence. Formal close, I have the honor to remain Your Eminence's humble servant. Informal close, Your Eminence's humble servant. Correct titles in introduction, His Eminence. Roman Catholic Archbishop. There is no Protestant Archbishop in the United States. If you are speaking, you say, Your Grace. Envelope addressed, The Most Reverend Michael Corrigan, Archbishop of New York. Formal beginning of a letter, Most Reverend and Dear Sir. Informal beginning, Most Reverend and Dear Sir. Formal close, I have the honor to remain your humble servant. Informal close, same as formal close. 
correct titles in introduction, the Most Reverend the Archbishop. Bishop, whether Roman Catholic or Protestant. If you are speaking, you say, Bishop Manning. Envelope addressed, to the Right Reverend William T. Manning, Bishop of New York. Formal beginning of a letter. Most Reverend and Dear Sir. Informal beginning. My dear Bishop Manning. Formal close. I have the honor to remain your obedient servant, or to remain respectfully yours. Informal close. Faithfully yours. Correct titles in introduction. Bishop Manning. Priest. If you are speaking, you say, Father or Father Duffy. Envelope addressed, The Reverend Michael Duffy. Formal beginning of a letter, Reverend and Dear Sir. Informal beginning, Dear Father Duffy. Formal close, I beg to remain yours faithfully. Informal close, Faithfully yours. Correct titles in introduction, Father Duffy. Protestant clergyman. If you are speaking, you say, Mr. Saintly. If he is D.D. or L.L.D., you call him Dr. Saintly. Envelope addressed, The Reverend George Saintly. If you do not know his first name, write The Reverend Saintly, rather than The Reverend Mr. Saintly. Formal beginning of a letter. Sir, or My Dear Sir. Informal beginning. Dear Dr. Saintly, or Dear Mr. Saintly, if he is not a D.D. Formal close. Same as above. Informal close. Faithfully yours, or sincerely yours. Correct titles in introduction. Dr. or Mr. Saintly. Rabbi. If you are speaking, you say, Rabbi Wise. If he is D.D. or L.L.D., he is called Dr. Wise. Envelope addressed. Dr. Stephen Wise, or Rabbi Stephen Wise, or Reverend Stephen Wise. Formal beginning of a letter. Dear Sir. Informal beginning. Dear Dr. Wise. Formal close. I beg to remain yours sincerely. Informal close, yours sincerely. Correct titles in introduction, Rabbi Wise. Ambassador. If you are speaking, you say, Your Excellency, or Mr. Ambassador. Envelope addressed, His Excellency, the American Ambassador. Footnote. Although our ambassadors and ministers represent the United States of America, it is customary both in Europe and Asia to omit the words United States and write to and speak of the American Embassy and Legation. In addressing a letter to one of our representatives in countries of the Western Hemisphere, the United States of America is always specified by way of courtesy to the Americans of South America. End footnote. American Embassy, London. Formal beginning of a letter. Your Excellency. Informal beginning. Dear Mr. Ambassador. Formal close. I have the honor to remain yours faithfully, or yours very truly, or yours respectfully, or very formally. I have the honor to remain, sir, your obedient servant. Informal close. Yours faithfully. Correct titles in introduction. The American Ambassador. Minister Plenipotentiary. If you are speaking, you say... In English, he is usually called Mr. Prince, though it is not incorrect to call him Mr. Minister. The title Excellency is also occasionally used in courtesy, though it does not belong to him. In French, he is always called Monsieur le Minister. 
envelope addressed. The Honorable J. D. Prince, American Legation, Copenhagen, or, more courteously, His Excellency, the American Minister, Copenhagen, Denmark. Formal beginning of a letter. Sir is correct, but Your Excellency is sometimes used in courtesy. Informal beginning. Dear Mr. Minister, or Dear Mr. Prince. Formal close. Same as above. Informal close. Yours faithfully. Correct titles in introduction. Mr. Prince, the American minister, or merely the American minister, as everyone is supposed to know his name or find it out. Counsel. If you are speaking, you say Mr. Smith. Envelope addressed. If he has held office as assemblyman or commissioner so that he has the right to the title of honorable, he is addressed the Honorable John Smith, otherwise John Smith Esquire, American Consul, Rue Kelke, chose Paris. Formal beginning of a letter. Sir, or my dear sir. Informal beginning. Dear Mr. Smith. Formal close. I beg to remain yours very truly. Informal close. Faithfully. Correct titles in introduction. Mr. Smith. Foreign persons of title are not included in the foregoing diagram because an American, unless in the diplomatic service, would be unlikely to address any but personal friends to whom he would write as to any others. An envelope would be addressed in the language of the person written to, His Grace, the Duke of Over There, or merely the Duke of Over There, Hyde Park, London. Madame la Princesse de Quecia, Avenue du Bois, Paris. Il Principe di Capri, Cusano sul Seveso. Lady Alwyn, Cragmere, Scotland, etc. The letter would begin, Dear Duke of Over There, or Dear Duke. Dear Princess, dear Countess Aix, dear Lady Alwyn, dear Sir Hubert, etc., and close, sincerely, faithfully, or affectionately, as the case might be. Should an American have occasion to write to royalty, he would begin, Madam, or Sir, and end, I have the honor to remain, Madam, or Sir, your most obedient. Your most obedient servant is a signature reserved usually for our own president, or vice-president. End of Part 5, and the end of Chapter 27 of Etiquette. Read by Kara Schallenberg on April 27, 2007, in Oceanside, California. Chapter 28 of Etiquette this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Etiquette in Society, in Business, in Politics, and at Home by Emily Post Chapter 28 Longer Letters The art of general letter writing in the present day is shrinking until the letter threatens to become a telegram, a telephone message, a postcard. Since the events of the day are transmitted in newspapers with far greater accuracy, detail, and dispatch than they could be by the single effort of even Voltaire himself, the circulation of general news, which formed the chief reason for letters of the stagecoach and sailing vessel days, has no part in the correspondence of today. Taking the contents of an average mailbag as sorted in a United States post office, about 50% is probably advertisement or appeal, 40% business, and scarcely 10% personal letters and invitations. Of course, love letters are probably as numerous as need be, though the long-distance telephone must have lowered the average of these, too. Young girls write to each other, no doubt, much as they did in olden times, and letters between young girls and young men flourish today like unpolled weeds in a garden where weeds were formerly never allowed to grow. It is the letter from the friend in this city to the friend in that, or from the traveling relative to the relative at home that is gradually dwindling. As for the letter which younger relatives dutifully used to write, it is gone already with old-fashioned grace of speech and deportment. Still, people do write letters in this day, 
and there are some who possess a divinely flexible gift for a fresh turn of phrase, for delightful keenness of observation. It may be, too, that in other days the average writing was no better than the average of today. It is, naturally, the letters of those who had unusual gifts which have been preserved all these years, for the failures of a generation are made to die with it, and only its successes survive. The difference, though, between letter writers of the past and of the present is that in other days they all tried to write and to express themselves the very best they knew how. Today people don't care a bit whether they write well or ill. Mental effort is one thing that the younger generation of the smart world seems to consider it unreasonable to ask, and just as it is the fashion to let their spines droop until they suggest nothing so much as Tenniel's drawing in Alice in Wonderland of the caterpillar sitting on the toadstool, so do they let their mental faculties relax, slump, and atrophy. To such as these, to whom effort is an insurmountable task, it might be just as well to say frankly, if you have a mind that is entirely bromidic, if you are lacking in humor, all power of observation, and facility for expression, you would best join the ever-growing class of people who frankly confess, I can't write letters to save my life, and confine your literary efforts to picture postcards with the engaging captions, X is my room, or beautiful weather, wish you were here. It is not at all certain that your friends and family would not rather have frequent postcards than occasional letters, all too obviously displaying the meagerness of their messages in halting orthography. Beginning a Letter For most people, the difficulty in letter writing is in the beginning and the close. Once they are started, the middle goes smoothly enough until they face the difficulty of the end. The direction of the professor of English to begin at the beginning of what you have to say and go on until you have finished and then stop is very like a celebrated artist's direction for painting. You simply take a little of the right color paint and put it on the right spot. How not to begin. Even one who loves the very sight of your handwriting could not possibly find any pleasure in a letter beginning. I have been meaning to write you for a long time but haven't had a minute to spare. Or... I suppose you've been thinking me very neglectful, but you know how I hate to write letters. Or, I know I ought to have answered your letter sooner, but I haven't had a thing to write about. The above sentences are written time and again by persons who are utterly unconscious that they are not expressing a friendly or loving thought. If one of your friends were to walk into the room and you were to receive him stretched out and yawning in an easy chair, no one would have to point out the rudeness of such behavior. Yet countless kindly-intentioned people begin their letters mentally reclining and yawning in just such a way. How to begin a letter. Suppose you merely change the wording of the above sentences, so that instead of slamming the door in your friend's face, you hold it open. Do you think I have forgotten you entirely? You don't know, dear Mary, how many letters I have written you in thought. Or, time and time again I have wanted to write you, but each moment that I say for myself was always interrupted by... something... One of the frequent difficulties in beginning a letter is that your answer is so long delayed that you begin with an apology, which is always a lame duck. But these examples indicate a way in which even an opening apology may be attractive rather than repellent. If you are going to take the trouble to write a letter, you are doing it because you have at least remembered someone with friendly regard, or you would not be writing at all. You certainly would like to convey the impression that you want to be with your friend in thought for a little while at least. Not that she, through some malignant force, is holding you to a grindstone and forcing you to the task of making hateful schoolroom pothooks for her selfish gain. A perfect letter has always the effect of being a light dipping off the top of a spring. A poor letter suggests digging into the dried ink at the bottom of an inkwell. It is easy to begin a letter if it is an answer to one that has just been received. The news contained in it is fresh, and the impulse to reply needs no prodding. Nothing can be simpler than to say, we were all overjoyed to hear from you this morning, or your letter was the most welcome thing the postman has brought for ages, or it was more than good to have news of you this morning, or your letter from Capri brought all the allure of Italy back to me, or you can't imagine, dear Mary, how glad I was to see an envelope with your writing this morning. And then you take up the various subjects of Mary's letter, which should certainly launch you without difficulty upon topics of your own. Ending a Letter just as the beginning of a letter should give the reader an impression of greeting, so should the end express friendly or affectionate leave-taking. Nothing can be worse than to seem to scratch helplessly around in the air for an idea that will affect your escape. 
Well, I guess I must stop now. Well, I must close, or... You are probably bored with this long epistle, so I had better close. All of these are as bad as they can be, and suggest the untutored man who stands first on one foot and then in the other, running his finger around the brim of his hat, or the country girl twisting the corner of her apron. How to end a letter. An intimate letter has no end at all. When you leave the house of a member of your family, you don't have to think up in a special sentence in order to say goodbye. Leave-taking in a letter is the same. Goodbye, dearest, for today, devotedly Kate, or Best love to you all, Martin, or We'll write again in a day or two, lovingly Mary, or Luncheon was announced half a page ago, so goodbye, dear Mary, for today. The close of a less intimate letter, like taking leave of a visitor in your drawing room, is necessarily more ceremonious. And the ceremonious close presents to most people the greatest difficulty in letter writing. It is really quite simple, if you realize that the aim of the closing paragraph is merely to bring in a personal hyphen between the person writing and the person written to. The mountains were beautiful at sunset. It is a bad closing sentence because the mountains have nothing personal to either of you. But if you can add, they reminded me of the time we were in Colorado together, or how different from our wide prairies at home, you've crossed a bridge, as it were, or... We have had a wonderful trip, but I do miss you all at home and long to hear from you soon again. Or, from one at home, Your closed house makes me very lonely to pass. I do hope you are coming back soon. Sometimes an ending falls naturally into a sentence that ends with your signature. If I could look up now and see you coming into the room, there would be no happier woman in the whole state than your devoted mother. Letters No One Cares to Read Letters of Calamity First and foremost in the category of letters that no one can possibly receive with pleasure might be put the Letter of Calamity, the Letter of Gloomy Apprehension, the Letter Filled with Petty Annoyances. Less disturbing to receive, but far from enjoyable, are such letters as the Blank, the Meandering, the Letter of the Capital I, the Plaintiff, the Apologetic. There is scarcely anyone who has not one or more relatives or friends whose letters belong in one of these classes. Even in so personal a matter as a letter to an absent member of one's immediate family, it should be borne in mind not to write needlessly of misfortune or unhappiness. To hear from those we love how ill or unhappy they are is to have our distress intensified in direct proportion to the number of miles by which we are separated from them. This last example, however, has nothing in common with the choosing of calamity and gloom as a subject of welcome tidings in ordinary correspondence. The chronic calamity writers seem to wait until the skies are darkest and then, rushing to their desk, luxuriate and pouring all of their troubles and fears of troubles out on paper to their friends. Letters of Gloomy Apprehension My little Betty, my little adds to the pathos much more than saying merely Betty, has been feeling miserable for several days. I am worried to death about her, as there are so many sudden cases of typhoid and appendicitis. The doctor says the symptoms are not at all alarming as yet, but doctors see so much of illness and death, they don't seem to appreciate what anxiety means to a mother, etc. Another writes, The times seem to be getting worse and worse. I always said we would have to go through a long night before any chance of daylight. You can mark my words, the night of bad times isn't much more than begun. Or, I have scarcely slept for nights, worrying about whether Junior has passed his examinations or not. Letters of Petty Misfortunes Other perfectly well-meaning friends fancy that they are giving pleasure when they write such news as, My cook has been sick for the past ten days, and follow this with a page or two descriptive of her ailments, or, I have a slight cough. I think I must have caught it yesterday when I went out in the rain without rubbers, or the children have not been doing as well in their lessons this week as last. Johnny's arithmetic marks were dreadful, and Katie got an E in spelling and an F in geography. Her husband and her mother would be interested in the children's weekly reports and her own slight cough, but no one else. How could they be? If the writers of all such letters would merely read over what they have written and ask themselves if they could find pleasure in receiving messages of like manner and matter, perhaps they might begin to do a little thinking and break the habit of cataleptic unthinkingness that seemingly descends upon them as soon as they are seated at their desk. The Blank 
The writer of the blank letter begins fluently with the date and dear Mary, and then sits and chews his penholder or makes little dots and squares and circles on the blotter, utterly unable to attack the cold, forbidding blankness of that first page. Mentally, he seems to say, Well, here I am, and now what? He has not an idea. He can never find anything of sufficient importance to write about. A murder next door, a house burned to the ground, a burglary, or an elopement could alone furnish material, and that, too, would be finished off in a brief sentence stating the bare fact. A person whose life is a revolving wheel of routine may have really very little to say, but a letter does not have to be long to be welcome. It can be very good indeed if it has a message that seems to have been spoken. Dear Lucy, life here is as dull as ever, duller if anything, just the same old things done in the same old way, not even a fire engine out or a new face in town, but this is to show you that I am thinking of you and longing to hear from you. Or, I wish something really exciting would happen so that I might have something with a little thrill in it to write you, but everything goes on and on. If there were any check in its sameness, I think we'd all land in a heap against the edge of the town. The meandering letter, as its name implies, the meandering letter is one which dawdles through disconnected subjects, like a trolley car gone down grade off the track, through fences and fields and flower beds indiscriminately. Mrs. Blake's cow died last week. The governor and his wife were on the reception committee. Mary Selfridge went to stay with her aunt in Riverview. I think the new shade called Harding Blue is perfectly hideous. Another, that is almost akin to it, runs glibly on page after page of meaningless repetition and detail. I thought at first that I would get a gray dress. I think gray is such a pretty color, and I have had so many blue dresses. I can't decide this time whether to get blue or gray. Sometimes I think gray is more becoming to me than blue. I think gray looks well on fair-haired people. I don't know whether you could call my hair fair or not. I am certainly not dark, and yet fair hair suggests a sort of straw color. Maybe I might be called medium fair. Do you think I'm light enough to wear gray? Maybe blue would be more serviceable. Gray certainly looks pretty in the spring. It is so clean and fresh-looking. There is a lovely French model at Benson's in gray, but I can have it copied for less in blue. Maybe it won't be as pretty, though, as the gray, etc., etc. By the above method of cud-chewing, any subject, clothes, painting the house, children's school, planting a garden, or even the weather, need be limited only by the supply of paper and ink. The Letter of the Capital I The Letter of the Capital I is a pompous effusion which strives through pretentiousness to impress its reader with its writer's wealth, position, ability, or whatever possession or attribute is thought to be rated most highly. None but unfortunate dependents or the cringing in spirit would subject themselves to a second letter of this kind by answering the first. The letter which hints at hoped-for benefits is no worse. The Letter of Chronic Apology the letter written by a person with an apologetic habit of mind is different totally from the sometimes necessary letter of genuine apology. The former is as senseless as it is irritating. It was so good of you to come to my horrid little shanty. The house and the food she served were both probably better than that of the person she is writing to. I know you had nothing fit to eat, and I know that everything was just all wrong. Of course, everything is always so beautifully done at everything you give— I wonder I have the courage to ask you to dine with me. The Dangerous Letter A pitfall that those of sharp wit have to guard against is the thoughtless tendency toward writing ill-natured things. Ridicule is a much more amusing medium for the display of a subject than praise, which is always rather bromidic. The amusing person catches foibles and exploits them, and it is easy to forget that wit flashes all too irresistibly at the expense of other people's feelings, and the brilliant tongue is all too often sharpened to rapier point. Admiration for the quickness of a spoken quip somewhat mitigates its cruelty. The exuberance of the retailer of verbal gossip eliminates the implication of scandal, but both quip and gossip become deadly poison when transferred permanently to paper. Permanence of Written Emotion for all emotions, written words are a bad medium. The light jesting tone that saves a quip from offense cannot be expressed, and remarks that if spoken would amuse can but pique and even insult their subject. Without the interpretation of the voice, gaiety becomes levity, raillery becomes accusation. 
Moreover, words of a passing moment are made to stand forever. Anger in the letter carries with it the effect of solidified fury. The words spoken in reproof melt with the breath of the speaker once the cause is forgiven. The written words on the page fix them for eternity. Love in a letter endures likewise forever. Admonitions from parents to their children may very properly be put on paper. They are meant to endure and be remembered. But momentary annoyance should never be more than briefly expressed. There is no better way of ensuring his letters against being read than for a parent to get into the habit of writing irritable or fault-finding letters to his children. THE LETTERS OF TWO WIVES Do you ever see a man look through a stack of mail and notice that suddenly his face lights up as he seizes a letter from home? He tears it open eagerly, his mouth upcurving at the corners as he lingers over every word. You know without being told that the wife he had to leave behind puts all the best she can devise and save for him into his life, as well as on paper. Do you ever see a man go through his mail and see him suddenly droop, as though a fog had fallen upon his spirits? Do you see him reluctantly pick out a letter, start to open it, hesitate, and then push it aside? His expression says plainly, I can't face that just now. Then by and by... When his lips have been set in a hard line, he will doggedly open his letter to see what the trouble is now. If for once there is no trouble, he sighs with relief, relaxes, and starts the next thing he has to do. Usually, though, he frowns, looks worried, annoyed, harassed, and you know that every small unpleasantness is punctiliously served to him by one who promised to love and to cherish, and who probably thinks she does. The Letter Everyone Loves to Receive the letter we all love to receive is one that carries so much of the writer's personality that she seems to be sitting beside us, looking at us directly and talking just as she really would could she have come on a magic carpet instead of sending her proxy in ink-made characters on mere paper. Let us suppose we have received one of those perfect letters from Mary, one of those letters that seem almost to have written themselves, so easily do the words flow, so bubbling and effortless is their spontaneity. There was a great deal in the letter about Mary, not only about what she has been doing, but what she has been thinking, or perhaps feeling. And there is a lot about us in the letter, nice things that make us feel rather pleased about something that we have done, or are likely to do, or that someone has said about us. We know that all things of concern to us are of equal concern to Mary. And though there will be nothing of it in actual words, we are made to feel that we are just as secure in our corner of Mary's heart as ever we were. And we finish the letter with a very vivid remembrance of Mary's sympathy and a sense of loss in her absence and a longing for the time when Mary herself may again be sitting on the sofa beside us and telling us all the details her letter cannot but leave out. The letter no woman should ever write. The males carry letters every day that are so many packages of TNT should their contents be exploded by falling into the wrong hands. Letters that should never have been written are put in evidence in courtrooms every day. Many cannot, under any circumstances, be excused. But often silly girls and foolish women write things that sound quite different from what they innocently but stupidly intended. Few persons, except professional writers, have the least idea of the value of words and the effect that they produce, and the thoughtless letters of emotional women and underbred men add sensation to news items in the press almost daily. Of course, the best advice to a young girl who is impelled to write letters to men can be put in one word. Don't. However, if you are a young girl or woman and are determined to write letters to an especial or any other man, no matter how innocent your intention may be, there are some things you must remember. Remember so intensely that no situation in life, no circumstances, no temptation can ever make you forget. There are a few set rules, not of etiquette, but of the laws of self-respect. Never send a letter without reading it over and making sure that you have said nothing that can possibly sound different from what you intend to say. Never, so long as you live, write a letter to a man, no matter who he is, that you would be ashamed to see in a newspaper above your signature. Remember that every word of writing is immutable evidence for or against you, and words which are thoughtlessly put on paper may exist a hundred years hence. Never write anything that can be construed as sentimental. Never take a man to task about anything. Never ask for explanations. To do so implies too great an intimacy. 
never put a single clinging tentacle into writing. Say nothing ever that can be construed as demanding, asking, or even being eager for his attentions. Always keep in mind, and never for one instant forget that a third person, and that the very one you would most object to, may find and read the letter. One word more. It is not alone bad form, but laying yourself open to every sort of embarrassment and danger to correspond with a man you slightly know. PROPER LETTERS OF LOVE OR AFFECTION If you are engaged, of course you should write love letters, the most beautiful that you can. But don't write baby talk and other silliness that would make you feel idiotic if the letter were to fall into strange hands. On the other hand, few can find objection to the natural, friendly, and even affectionate letter from a young girl to a young man she has been brought up with. It is such a letter as she would write to her brother. There is no hint of coquetry or self-consciousness, no word from first to last that might not be shouted aloud before her whole family. Her letter may begin, Dear, or even Dearest, Jack, then follows all the home news she can think of that might possibly interest him, about the Simpsons dance, Tom and Pauline's engagement, how many trout Bill Henderson got at Duck Brook, how furious Mrs. Davis was because some distinguished visitor accepted Mrs. Brown's dinner instead of hers, how the new people who have moved on to the rush farm don't know the first thing about farming, and so on. Perhaps there will be one personal line, such as, We all missed you at the picnic on Wednesday. Ollie made the flapjacks, and they were too awful. Everyone groaned, If Jack were only here. Or, We all hope you are coming back in time for the town's dance. Kate has at last inveigled her mother into letting her have an all-black dress, which we rather suspect was bought with the especial purpose of impressing you with her advanced age and dignity. Mother came in just as I wrote this and says to tell you she has a new recipe for chocolate cake that is even better than her old one, and that you had better have a piece added to your belt before you come home. Carrie will write you very soon, she says, and we all send love. Affectionately, Ruth. The letter No Gentleman Writes one of the fundamental rules for the behavior of any man who has the faintest pretension to being a gentleman is that never by word or gesture must he compromise a woman. He never, therefore, writes a letter that can be construed even by a lawyer as damaging to any woman's good name. His letters to an unmarried woman may express all the ardor and devotion that he cares to subscribe to, but there must be no hint of his having received special favors from her. Don't for correspondence. Never typewrite an invitation, acceptance, or regret. Never typewrite a social note. Be chary of underscorings and postscripts. Do not write across a page already written on. Do not use unmatched paper and envelopes. Do not write in pencil. Accept a note to one of your family, written on a train, or where ink is unprocurable, or unless you are flat on your back because of illness. Never send a letter with a blot on it. Never sprinkle French, Italian, or any other foreign words through a letter written in English. You do not give an impression of cultivation, but of ignorance of your own language. Use a foreign word if it has no English equivalent. Not otherwise, unless it has become anglicized. If hesitating between two words, always select the one of Saxon origin, rather than Latin. For the best selection of words to use, study the King James Version of the Bible. End of chapter 28。Chapter 29 of Etiquette This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chris Gladys. Etiquette in Society, in Business, in Politics, and at Home by Emily Post. Chapter 29 The Fundamentals of Good Behavior. Far more important than any mere dictum of etiquette is the fundamental code of honor, without strict observance of which no man, no matter how polished, can be considered a gentleman. The honor of a gentleman, 
demands the inviability of his word, and the incorruptibility of his principles. He is the descendant of the knight, the crusader. He is the defender of the defenseless, and the champion of justice. Or, he is not a gentleman. Decencies of Behavior A gentleman does not, and a man who aspires to be one, must not, ever, borrow money from a woman. Nor should he, except in unexpected circumstances, borrow money from a man. Money borrowed without security is a debt of honor, which must be paid without fail and promptly as possible. The debts incurred by a deceased parent, brother, sister, or grown child are assumed by honorable men and women as debts of honor. A gentleman never takes advantage of a woman in a business dealing, nor of the poor or the helpless. One who is not well off does not sponge, but pays his own way to the utmost of his ability. One who is rich does not make a display of his money or his possessions. Only a vulgarian talks ceaselessly about how much this or that cost him. A very well-bred man intensely dislikes the mention of money, and never speaks of it, out of business hours, if he can avoid it. A gentleman never discusses his family affairs, either in public or with acquaintances, nor does he speak more than casually about his wife. A man is a cad who tells anyone, no matter who, what his wife told him in confidence, or describes what she looks like in her bedroom. To impart details of her beauty is scarcely better than to publish her blemishes. To do either is unspeakable. Nor does a gentleman ever criticize the behavior of a wife whose conduct is scandalous. What he says to her in the privacy of their own apartments is no one's affair but his own. But he must never treat her with disrespect before their children, or a servant, or anyone. A man of honor never seeks publicly to divorce his wife, no matter what he believes her conduct to have been. But for the protection of his own name and that of the children, he allows her to get her freedom on other than criminal grounds. No matter who he may be, whether rich or poor, in high life or low, the man who publicly besmirches his wife's name besmirches still more his own and proves that he is not, was not, and never will be a gentleman. No gentleman goes to a lady's house if he is affected by alcohol. A gentleman, seeing a young man who is not entirely himself in the presence of ladies, quietly induces the youth to depart. An older man, addicted to the use of too much alcohol, need not be discussed since he ceases to be asked to the houses of ladies. A gentleman does not lose control of his temper. In fact, in his own self-control under difficult or dangerous circumstances lies his chief ascendancy over others, who impulsively betray every emotion which animates them. Exhibitions of anger, fear, hatred, embarrassment, Ardor or hilarity are all bad form in public, and bad form is merely an action which jars the sensibilities of others. A gentleman does not show a letter written by a lady, unless perhaps to a very intimate friend, if the letter is entirely impersonal and written by someone who is equally the friend of the one to whom it is shown. But the occasions when the letter of a woman may be shown properly by a man are so few that it is safest to make it a rule never to mention a woman's letter. A gentleman does not bow to a lady from a club window, nor, according to good form, should ladies ever be discussed in a man's club. A man whose social position is self-made is apt to be detected by his continual cataloguing of prominent names. Mr. Parvenu invariably interlards his conversation with, 
when I was dining at the Bobo Gildings, or even at Lucy Gildings, and quite often accentuates, in his ignorance, those of rather second-rate, though conspicuous position, I was spending last weekend with the rich and vulgars, or my great friends the gotocrusts. When a so-called gentleman insists on imparting information interesting only to the social register, shun him. The born gentleman avoids the mention of names exactly as he avoids the mention of what things cost. Both are an abomination to his soul. A gentleman's manners are an integral part of him, and are the same whether in his dressing-room or in a ballroom, whether in talking to Mrs. Worldly or to the laundress bringing in his clothes. He whose manners are only put on in company is a veneered gentleman, not a real one. A man of breeding does not slap strangers on the back, nor so much as lay his fingertips on a lady. Nor does he punctuate his conversation by pushing or nudging or patting people, nor take his conversation out of the drawing-room. Notwithstanding the advertisements in the most dignified magazines, a discussion of underwear and toilet articles and their merit or their use is unpleasant in polite conversation. All thoroughbred people are considerate of the feelings of others, no matter what the station of the others may be. Thackeray's climber, who licks the boots of those above him and kicks the faces of those below him on the social ladder, is a very good illustration of what a gentleman is not. A gentleman never takes advantage of another's helplessness or ignorance, and assumes that no gentleman will take advantage of him. Simplicity and Unconsciousness of Self These words have been literally sprinkled through the pages of this book, yet it is doubtful if they convey a clear idea of the attributes meant. Unconsciousness of self is not so much unselfishness as it is the mental ability to extinguish all thoughts of oneself, exactly as one turns out the light. Simplicity is like it, in that it also has a quality of self-effacement, but it really means a love of the essential and of directness. Simple people put no trimmings on their phrases nor in their manners. But remember, simplicity is not crudeness nor anything like it. On the contrary, simplicity of speech and manners means language in its purest, most limpid form, and manners of such perfection that they do not suggest manner at all. THE INSTINCTS OF A LADY The instincts of a lady are much the same as those of a gentleman. She is equally punctilious about her debts, equally averse to pressing her advantage, especially if her adversary is helpless or poor. As an unhappy wife, her dignity demands that she never show her disapproval of her husband, no matter how publicly he slights or outrages her. If she has been so unfortunate as to have married a man not a gentleman, to draw attention to his behavior would put herself on his level. If it comes actually to the point where she divorces him, she discusses her situation, naturally, with her parents or her brother or whoever are her nearest and wisest relatives. But she shuns publicity and avoids discussing her affairs with anyone outside of her immediate family. One cannot too strongly censure the unspeakable vulgarity of the woman so unfortunate as to be obliged to go through divorce proceedings who confides the private details of her life to reporters. THE HALLMARK OF THE CLIMBER Nothing so blatantly proclaims a woman climber as the repetition of prominent names, the owners of which she must have struggled to know. Otherwise, 
Why so eagerly boast of the achievement? Nobody cares whom she knows. Nobody, that is, but a climber like herself. To those who were born and who live, no matter how quietly, in the security of a perfectly good ledge above and away from the social ladder's rungs, the evidence of one frantically climbing and trying to vault her exalted position is merely ludicrous. All thoroughbred women and men are considerate of others less fortunately placed, especially of those in their employ. One of the tests by which to distinguish between the woman of breeding and the woman merely of wealth is to notice the way she speaks to dependents. Queen Victoria's duchesses, those great ladies of grand manner, were the very ones who, on entering the house of a close friend, said, How do you do, Hawkins, to a butler, and to a sister duchess's maid, Good morning, Jenkins. A Maryland lady, still living on the estate granted to her family three generations before the Revolution, is quite as polite to her friend's servants as to her friends themselves. When you see a woman in silks and sables and diamonds speak to a little errand girl or a footman or a scullery maid as though they were the dirt under her feet, you may be sure of one thing. She hasn't come a very long way from the ground herself. End of chapter 29「Chapter thirty Etiquette in Society This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Lucy Burgoyne. Etiquette in Society, in Business, in Politics, and at Home by Emily Post. Chapter thirty clubs and club etiquette. A club, as everyone knows, is merely an organization of people, men or women or both, who establish club rooms in which they meet at specified times for specified purposes, or which they use casually and individually. A club's membership may be limited to a dozen or may include several thousands and a procedure in joining a club may be easy or difficult, according to the type of club and the standing of the would-be member. Membership in many athletic associations may be had by walking in and paying dues. Also, many country golf clubs are as free to the public as country inns, but joining a purely social club of rank and exclusiveness is a very different matter. A man to be eligible for membership in such a club must not only be completely a gentleman, but he must have friends among the members who like him enough to be willing to propose him and second him and write letters for him. And furthermore, he must be disliked by no one, at least not sufficiently for any member to object seriously to his company. There are two ways of joining a club, by invitation and by making application or having it made for you. To join by invitation means that you are invited when the club is started to be one of the founders or charter members, or if you are a distinguished citizen, you may, at the invitation of the governors, become an honorary member or in a small or informal club, you may become an ordinary member by invitation or suggestion of the governors that you would be welcome. A charter member pays dues, but not always an initiation fee. An honorary member pays neither dues nor initiation. He is really a permanent guest of the club. A life member is one who pays his dues for twenty years or so in a lump sum, and is exempted from dues even if he lives to be a hundred. Few clubs have honorary members, and none have more than half a dozen, 
so that this type of membership may as well be disregarded. The ordinary members of a club are either resident, meaning that they live within 50 miles of the club, or non-resident, living beyond that distance and paying less dues but having the same privileges. In certain of the London clubs, one or two New York ones, and the leading club in several other cities, it is not unusual for a boy's name to be put up for membership as soon as he is born. If his name comes up while he is a minor, it is laid aside until after his twenty-first birthday, and then put at the head of the list of applicants, and voted upon at the next meeting of the governors. In all clubs in which membership is limited and much sought after, the waiting list is sure to be long, and a name takes anywhere from five to more than ten years to come up. How a name is put up. Since a gentleman is scarcely likely to want to join a club in which the members are not his friends, he tells a member of his family, or an intimate friend, that he would like to join the nearby club, and adds, Do you mind putting me up? I will ask Dick to second me. The friend says, I'll be glad to, and Dick says the same. It is still more likely that the suggestion to join comes from a friend who says one day, Why don't you join the nearby club? It would be very convenient for you. The other says, I think I should like to, and the first replies, Let me put you up, and Dick will be only too glad to second you. It must be remembered that a gentleman has no right to ask anyone who is not really one of his best friends to propose or second him. It is an awkward thing to refuse in the first place, and in the second it involves considerable effort, and on occasion a great deal of annoyance and trouble. For example, let us suppose that Jim Smarlington asks Donald Lovejoy to propose him, and Club Wind Doe to second him. His name is written in the book kept for the purpose and signed by both proposer and seconder. Smarlington, James, proposer, Donald Lovejoy, seconder, Club Wind Doe. Nothing more is done until the name is posted, meaning that it appears among a list of names put up on the bulletin board in the club house. It is then the duty of Lovejoy and Doe each to write a letter of endorsement to the governors of the club, to be read by them when they hold the meeting at which his name comes up for election. Example Board of Governors The Nearby Club Dear Sirs, It affords me much pleasure to propose for membership in the nearby club Mr. James Marlington. I have known Mr. Smarlington for many years, and consider him qualified in every way for membership. He is a graduate of Yalvard, class 1916, rode on the varsity crew, and served in the 118th as first lieutenant overseas during the war. He is now in his father's firm, Jones, Smarlington and Co. Yours very truly, Donald Lovejoy. Lovejoy must also at once tell Smarlington to ask about six friends who are club members but not governors to write letters endorsing him. Furthermore, the candidate cannot come up for election unless he knows several of the governors personally, who can vouch for him at the meeting. Therefore, Lovejoy and Doe must one or the other take Smarlington to several governors, at their offices generally, and personally present him, or very likely they invite two or three of the governors and Smarlington to lunch. Even under the best of circumstances, it is a nuisance for a busy man to have to make appointments at the offices of other busy men. 
and since it is uncertain which of the governors will be present at any particular meeting, it is necessary to introduce the candidate to a sufficient number so that at least two among those at the meeting will be able to speak for him. In the example we have chosen, Club Window, having himself been a governor and knowing most of the present ones very well, has less difficulty in presenting his candidate to them than many other members might have, who, though they have for years belonged to the club, have used it so seldom that they know few, if any, of the governors even by sight. At the leading women's club of New York, the governors appoint an hour on several afternoons before elections when they are in the visitors' rooms at the clubhouse on purpose to meet the candidates whom their proposers must present. This would certainly seem a more practicable method, to say nothing of its being easier for everyone concerned than the masculine etiquette which requires that the governors be stalked one by one to the extreme inconvenience and loss of time and occasionally the embarrassment of everyone. As already said, Jim Smarlington, having unusually popular and well-known sponsors, and being also very well liked himself, is elected with little difficulty. But take the case of young Breezy. He was put up by two not well-known members, who wrote half-hearted endorsements themselves and did nothing about getting letters from others. They knew none of the governors, and trusted that two who knew Breezy slightly would do. His casual proposer forgot that enemies write letters as well as friends, and that, moreover, enmity is active where friendship is often passive. Two men who disliked his manner wrote that they considered him unsuitable, and as he had no friends strong enough to stand up for him, he was turned down. A gentleman is rarely blackballed, as such an action could not fail to endure him in the eyes of the world. The expression blackball comes from the custom of voting for a member by putting a white ball in a ballot box or against him by putting in a black one. If a candidate is likely to receive a black ball, the governors do not vote on him at all, but inform the proposer that the name of his candidate would better be withdrawn. Later on, if the objection to him is disproved or overcome, his name can again be put up. The more popular the candidate the less work there is for his proposer and seconder. A stranger, if he is not a member of the representative club in his own city, would have need of strong friends to elect him to an exclusive one in another, and an unpopular man has no chance at all. However, in all except very rare instances events run smoothly, the candidate is voted on at a meeting of the Board of Governors and is elected. A notice is mailed to him next morning, telling him that he has been elected and that his initiation fee and his dues make a total of so much. The candidate thereupon at once draws his cheque for the amount and mails it. As soon as the secretary has had ample time to receive the cheque, the new member is free to use the club as much or as little as he cares to. The new member The new member usually, but not necessarily, goes for the first time to a club with his proposer or his seconder, or at least an old member, for since in exclusive clubs visitors living in the same city are never given the privilege of the club. None but members can know their way about. Let us say he goes for lunch or dinner, at which he is host, and his friend imparts such unwritten information as, That chair in the window is where old Gottrex always sits. Don't occupy it when you see him coming in. 
or he will be disagreeable to everybody for a week, or they always play double stakes at this table, so don't sit at it unless you mean to, or that's double coming in now, avoid him at bridge as you would the plague. The roasts are always good, and that waiter is the best in the room, etc. A new member is given, or should ask for, a copy of the club book, which contains, besides the list of the members, the constitution and the by-laws, or house rules, which he must study carefully and be sure to obey. Country Clubs Country clubs are as a rule less exclusive and less expensive than the representative city clubs, but those like the Myopopia Hunt, the Tuxedo, the Saddle and Cycle, the Burlingame, and countless others in between are many of them more expensive to belong to than any clubs in London or New York, and are precisely the same in matters of membership and management. They are also quite as difficult to be elected to as any of the exclusive clubs in the cities, more so, if anything, because they are open to the family and friends of every member, whereas in a man's club in a city his membership gives the privilege of the club to no one but himself personally. The test question always put by the governors at elections is, are the candidate's friends, as well as his family, likely to be agreeable to the present members of the club? If not, he is not admitted. Nearly all country clubs have, however, one open door, unknown to city ones. People taken houses in the neighbourhood are often granted season privileges, meaning that on being proposed by a member, and upon paying a season subscription, new householders are accepted as transient guests. In some clubs, this season subscription may be indefinitely renewed. In others, a man must come up for regular election at the end of three months or six or a year. Apart from what may be called the few representative and exclusive country clubs, there are hundreds, more likely thousands, which have very simple requirements for membership. The mere form of having one or two members vouch for a candidate's integrity and good behaviour is sufficient. Golf clubs, hunting clubs, political or sports clubs have special membership qualifications. All good golf players are, as a rule, welcomed at all golf clubs, all huntsmen at hunting clubs, and yet the myopia would not think of admitting the best rider ever known if he was not unquestionably a gentleman. But this is unusual. As a rule, the great player is welcomed in any club, specially devoted to the sport in which he excels. In many clubs, a stranger may be given a three, sometimes it is six, months transient membership, available in some instances to foreigners only, in others to strangers living beyond a certain distance. A name is proposed and seconded by two members, and then voted on by the governors or the house committee. The best known and most distinguished club of New England has an annex in which there are dining rooms to which ladies as well as gentlemen who are not members are admitted, and this annex plan has since been followed by others elsewhere. All men's clubs have private dining rooms in which members can give stag dinners, but the representative men's clubs exclude ladies absolutely from ever crossing their thresholds. Women's Clubs Excepting that the luxurious women's club has an atmosphere that a man really knows how to give to the interior of a house, no matter how architecturally perfect it may be, there is no difference between women's and men's clubs. 
In every state of the Union there are women's clubs of every kind and grade, social, political, sports, professional, some housed in enormous and perfect buildings constructed for them, and some perhaps in only a room or two. When the Pioneer Women's Club of New York was started, a club that aspired to be in the same class as the most important men's club, various governors of the latter were unflatteringly outspoken. Women could not possibly run a club as it should be run. It was unthinkable that they should be foolish enough to attempt it, and the husbands and fathers of the founders expected to have to dig down in their pockets to make up the deficit, forgetting entirely that the running of a club is merely the running of a house on a large scale, and that women, not men, are the perfect housekeepers. Today, no clubs anywhere are more perfect in appointment or better run than the representative women's clubs. In fact, some of the men's clubs have been forced to follow the lead of the foremost of them and to realize that a club in which members merely sit about and look out of the window is a pretty dull place to the type of younger members they most want to attract and that the combination of the comfort and smartness of a perfectly run private house with every equipment for athletics is becoming the ideal in club life and club building today. Good manners in clubs Good manners in clubs are the same as good manners elsewhere, only a little more so. A club is for the pleasure and convenience of many, it is never intended as a stage setting for a star or clown or monologist. There is no place where a person has greater need of restraint and consideration for the reserves of others than in a club. In every club there is a reading room or library where conversation is not allowed. There are books and easy chairs and good light for reading both by day and night and it is one of the unbreakable rules not to speak to anybody who is reading or writing. When two people are sitting by themselves and talking, another should on no account join them unless he is an intimate friend of both. To be a mere acquaintance, or, still less, to have been introduced to one of them gives no privilege whatever. The fact of being a club member does not, except in a certain few, especially in formal clubs, grant any one the right to speak to strangers. If a new member happens to find no one in the club whom he knows, he goes about his own affairs. He either sits down and reads or writes, or looks out of the window, or plays solitaire, or occupies himself as he would if he were alone in a hotel. It is courteous of a governor or habitual member on noticing a new member or a visitor, especially one who seems to be rather at a loss, to go up and speak to him, but the latter must on no account be the one to speak first. Certain New York and Boston clubs, as well as those of London, have earned a reputation for snobbishness because the members never speak to those they do not know, through no intent to be disagreeable, but just because it is not customary. New York people do not speak to those they do not know, and it does not occur to them that strangers feel slighted until they themselves are given the same medicine in London or going elsewhere in America. They appreciate the courtesy and kindness of the South and West. The fundamental rule for behavior in a club is the same as in the drawing room of a private house. In other words, heels have no place on furniture. Ashes belong in ash receivers. Books should not be abused. And all evidence of exercising should be confined to the courts, all courses and the locker room. Many people who wouldn't think of lolling around the house in unfit attire 
come trooping into a country club's with their steaming faces, clammy shirts, and rumpled hair, giving too awful evidence of recent exertion and present fitness for the bathtub. The Perfect Clubman The perfect clubman is another word for the perfect gentleman. He never allows himself to show irritably to anyone. He makes it a point to be courteous to a new member or an older member's guest. He scrupulously observes the rules of the club. He discharges his card debts at the table. He pays his share always, with an instinctive horror of sponging. And lastly, he treats everyone the same consideration which he expects and demands from them. THE INFORMAL CLUB The informal club is often more suggestive of a fraternity than a club, in that every member speaks to every other, always. In one of the best known of this type, the members are artists, authors, scientists, sportsmen, and other thinkers and doers. There is a long table set every day for lunch, at which the members gather and talk. Every one to every one else. There is another dining room where solitary members may sit by themselves or bring in outsiders if they care to. None but members sit at the round table, which isn't round in the least. The informal club is always a comparatively small one, but the method of electing members varies. In some it is customary to take the vote of the whole club. In others, members are elected by the governors first, and then asked to join. In this case, no man may ask to have his name put up. In others, the conventional methods are followed. The Visitors in a Club In every club in the United States, a member is allowed to introduce a stranger living at least fifty miles away, for a length of time varying with the by-laws of the club. In some clubs guests may be put up for a day only. In others the privilege extends for two weeks or more. Many clubs allow each member a certain number of visitors a year. In others visitors are unlimited. But in all city clubs the same guest cannot be introduced twice within the year. In country clubs, visitors may always be brought in by members in unlimited numbers. As a rule, when a member introduces a stranger, he takes him to the club personally, writes his name in the visitor's book, and introduces him to those who may be in the room at the time, very possibly asking another member whom he knows particularly well to look out for his guest. If for some reason it is not possible for the stranger's host to take him to the club, he writes to the secretary of the club for a card of introduction. Example. Secretary. The Town Club. Dear Sir, Kindly send Mr. A.M. Strangely a card extending the privileges of the club for one week. Mr. Strangely is a resident of London. Yours very truly, Club Window. The secretary then sends a card to Mr. Strangely. The town club extends its privileges to Mr. Strangely from January the 2nd to January the 14th through the courtesy of Mr. Club Window. Mr. Strangely goes to the club by himself. A visitor who has been given the privileges of the club has, during the time of his visit, all the rights of a member, excepting that he is not allowed to introduce others to the club, and he cannot give a dinner in the private dining room. Strict etiquette also demands, if he wishes to ask several members to dine with him, that he take them to a restaurant rather than into the club dining room, since the club is their home and he is a stranger in it. He may ask a member whom he knows well to lunch 
quit him in the club rooms, but he must not ask one whom he knows only slightly. As accounts are sent to the member who put him up, unless the guest arranges at the club's office to have his charges rendered to himself, he must be punctilious to ask for his bill upon leaving, and pay it without question. Putting a man up at a club never means that the member is host. The visitor's status throughout his stay is founded on the courtesy of the member who introduced him, and he should try to show an equal courtesy to every one about him. He should remember not to obtrude on the privacy of the members he does not know. He has no right to criticize the management, the rules or the organization of the club. He has, in short, no actual rights at all, and he must not forget that he hasn't. Club Etiquette in London, Paris and New York in a very smart London club, the words quoted are club win, does. You keep your hat on and glare about. In Paris, you take your hat off and behave with such courtesy and politeness as seems to you an affection. In New York, you take your hat off and behave as though the rooms were empty, but as though you were being observed through loopholes in the walls. In New York you are introduced occasionally, but you may never ask to be introduced, and you speak only to those you have been introduced to. In London you are never introduced to anyone, but if the member who has taken you with him joins a group and you all sit down together, you talk as you would after dinner in a gentleman's house. But if you are made a temporary member and meet those you have been talking to when you are alone the next day, you do not speak unless spoken to. In Paris, your host punctiliously introduces you to various members, and you must just as punctiliously go the next day to their houses and leave your card upon each one. This is customary in the strictly French clubs only. In any one which has members of other nationalities, especially with Americans predominating, or seeming to, American customs obtain. In French clubs, a visitor cannot go to the club unless he is with a member, but there are no restrictions on the number of times he may be taken by the same member or another one. Unbreakable Rules Failure to pay one debts, or behaviour unbefitting a gentleman, is cause for expulsion from every club, which is looked upon in much the same light as expulsion from the army. In certain cases, expulsion for debt may seem unfair, since one may find himself in unexpectedly straitened circumstances, and the greatest fault or crime could not be more severely dealt with than being expelled from his club. But club honour, except under very temporary and mitigating conditions, takes no account of any reason for being unable to meet his obligations. He must, or he is not considered honourable. If a man cannot afford to belong to a club, he must resign while he is still in good standing. If later on he is able to rejoin, his name is put at the head of the waiting list, and if he was considered a desirable member, he is re-elected at the next meeting of the governors. But a man who has been expelled, unless he can show cause why his expulsion was unjust and be reinstated, can never again belong to that, or be elected to any other club. End of chapter 30「Chapter thirty one of Etiquette. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. Etiquette in Society, in Business, in Politics, and at Home by Emily Post. Chapter 31 Games and Sports. The popularity of bridge whist began a quarter of a century ago with the older people, and has increased slowly but steadily, until it is scarcely an exaggeration to say that those who do not play bridge, which means auction, are seldom asked out. And the epidemic is just as widespread among girls and boys as among older people. Bridge is always taken seriously. A bumble-puppy game won't do at all, even among the youngest players, and other qualifications of character and of etiquette must be observed by every one who would be sought after to make up a four. People charming to play bridge with. That no one likes a poor partner, or even a poor opponent, goes without saying. The ideal partner is one who never criticizes, or even seems to be aware of your mistakes, but on the contrary recognizes a good maneuver on your part, and gives you credit for it, whether you win the hand or lose, whereas the inferior player is apt to judge you merely by what you win, and blame your make if you go down, though your play may have been exceptionally good, and the loss even occasioned by wrong information which he himself gave you. Also, to be continually found fault with makes you play your worst, whereas appreciation of good judgment on your part acts as a tonic, and you play seemingly better than you know how. People disliked at the bridge table. There is nothing which more quickly reveals the veneered gentleman than the card-table, and his veneer melts equally with success or failure. Being carried away by the game, he forgets to keep on his company polish, and if he wins, he becomes grasping or overbearing because of his skill. If he loses, he sneers at the luck of others, and seeks to justify himself for the same fault that he criticized a moment before in another. A trick that is annoying to moderately skilled players is to have an overconfident opponent throw down his hand, saying, The rest of the tricks are mine, and often succeed in putting it over when it is quite possible that they might not be his if the hand were played out. Knowing themselves to be poorer players, the others are apt not to question it, but they feel none the less that their rights have been taken from them. A rather trying partner is the nervous player, who has no confidence in his own judgment, and will invariably pass a good hand in favor of his partner's bid. If, for instance, he has six perfectly good diamonds, he doesn't mention them because, his partner having declared a heart, he thinks to himself, "'Her hearts must be better than my diamonds,' but a much more serious failing, and one that is far more universal, is the habit of overbidding." Overbidding. In poker you play alone, and can therefore play as carefully or as foolishly as you please, but in bridge your partner has to suffer with you, and you therefore are honour-bound to play the best you know how, and the best you know how is as far as can possibly be from overbidding. Remember that your partner, if he is a good player, counts on you for certain definite cards that you announce by your bid to be in your hand, and raises you accordingly. If you have not these cards, you not only lose that particular hand, but destroy his confidence in you, and the next time, when he has a legitimate raise for you, he will fail to give it. He disregards you entirely because he is afraid of you. You must study the rules for makes, and never under any circumstances give your partner misinformation. This is the most vital rule there is, and any one who disregards it is detested at the bridge-table. No matter how great the temptation to make a gambler's bid, you are in honour bound to refrain. The next essential, if you would be thought charming, is never to take your partner to task, no matter how stupidly he may have thrown the hand. Don'ts for those who would be sought after. Don't hold a post-mortem on anybody's delinquencies, unless you are actually teaching. 
If luck is against you, it will avail nothing to sulk or complain about the awful cards that you are holding. Your partner is suffering just as much in finding you a poison vine as you are in being one, and you can scarcely expect your opponents to be sympathetic. You must learn to look perfectly tranquil and cheerful, even though you hold nothing but Yarborough's for days on end, and you must on no account try to defend your own bad play, ever. When you have made a play of poor judgment, the best thing you can say is, I'm very sorry, partner, and let it go at that. Always pay close attention to the game. When you are dummy, you have certain duties to your partner, and so do not wander around the room until the hand is over. If you don't know what your duties are, read the rules until you know them by heart, and then begin all over again. It is impossible to play any game without a thorough knowledge of the laws that govern it, and you are at fault in making the attempt. Don't be offended if your partner takes you out of a bid, and don't take him out for the glory of playing the hand. He is quite as anxious to win the rubber as you are. It is unbelievable how many people regard their partner as a third opponent. Mannerisms at the card table Mannerisms must be avoided like the plague. If there is one thing worse than the horrible post-mortem, it is the incessant repetition of some jarring habit by one particular player. The most usual and most offensive is that of snapping down a card as played, or bending a trick one has taken into a letter U, or picking it up and trotting it up and down on the table. Other pet offenses are drumming on the table with one's fingers, making various clicking, whistling, or humming sounds, massaging one's face, scratching one's chin with the cards, or waving the card one is going to play aloft in the air in smart aleck fashion, as though shouting, I know what you are going to lead, and my card is ready. All mannerisms that attract attention are in the long run equally unpleasant, even unendurable to one's companions. Many people whose game is otherwise admirable are rarely asked to play because they have allowed some such silly and annoying habit to take its hold upon them. THE GOOD LOSER The good loser makes it an invariable rule never to play for stakes that it will be inconvenient to lose. The neglect of this rule has been responsible for more bad losers than anything else, and needless to say a bad loser is about as welcome at a card table as rain at a picnic. Of course there are people who can take losses beyond their means with perfect cheerfulness and composure. Some few are so imbued with the gambler's instinct that a heavy turn of luck in either direction is the salt of life but the average person is equally embarrassed in winning or losing a stake that matters, and the only answer is to play for one that doesn't. Golf Golf is a particularly severe strain upon the amiability of the average person's temper, and in no other game, except bridge, is serenity of disposition so essential. No one easily ruffled can keep a clear eye on the ball, and exasperation at lost balls seemingly bewitches successive ones into disappearing with the completeness and finality of puffs of smoke. In a race or other test of endurance, a flare of anger might even help, but in golf it is safe to say that he who loses his temper is pretty sure to lose the game. Golf players, of course, know the rules and observe them, but it quite often happens that idlers— having nothing better to do, walk out over a course and watch the players. If they know the players well, that is one thing, but they have no right to follow strangers. A person who is nervous is easily put off his game, especially if those watching him are so ill-bred as to make audible remarks. Those playing matches, of course, expect an audience, and erratic or nervous players ought not to go into tournaments— or at least not in two-ball foursomes, where they are likely to handicap a partner. In following a match, onlookers must be careful to stand well within bounds, and neither talk nor laugh nor do anything that can possibly distract the attention of the players. 
The rule that you should not appoint yourself mentor holds good in golf as well as in bridge and every other game. Unless your advice is asked for, you should not instruct others how to hold their clubs or which ones to use, or how they ought to make the shot. A young woman must on no account expect the man she happens to be playing with to make her presents of golf balls or to caddy for her, nor must she allow him to provide her with a caddy. If she can't afford to hire one of her own, she must either carry her own clubs or not play golf. Other Games and Sports There are fixed rules for the playing of every game and for proper conduct in every sport. The details of these rules must be studied in the books of the game, learned from instructors or acquired by experience. A small boy perhaps learns to fish or swim by himself, but he is taught by his father or a guide, at all events someone, how and how not to hold a gun, cast a fly, or ride a horse. But apart from the technique of each sport, or the rules of each game, the etiquette, or more correctly, the basic principles of good sportsmanship, are the same. In no sport or game can any favoritism or evasion of rules be allowed. Sport is based upon impersonal and indiscriminating fairness to everyone alike, or it is not sport. And to be a good sportsman, one must be a stoic and never show rancor in defeat or triumph in victory or irritation, no matter what annoyance is encountered. One who can not help sulking or explaining or protesting when the loser or exulting when the winner has no right to take part in games and contests. Playing the Game If you would be thought to play the game, meaning if you aspire to be a true sportsman, you must follow the rules of sportsmanship the world over. Never lose your temper. Play for the sake of playing rather than to win. Never stop in the middle of a tennis or golf match and complain of a lame ankle, especially if you are losing. Unless it is literally impossible for you to go on, you must stick it out. If you are a novice, don't ask an expert to play with you, especially as your partner. If he should ask you in spite of your shortcomings, maintain the humility proper to a beginner. If you are a woman, don't ape the ways and clothing of men. If you are a man, don't take advantage of your superior strength to set a pace beyond the endurance of a woman opponent. And always give the opponent the benefit of the doubt. Nothing is more important to your standing as a sportsman, though it costs you the particular point in question. A true sportsman is always a cheerful loser, a quiet winner, with a very frank appreciation of the admirable traits in others which he seeks to emulate, and his own shortcomings, which he tries to improve. End of chapter 31. Read by Kara Schallenberg. www.kray.org on May 11th, 2007, in Oceanside, California. Chapter 32 of Etiquette This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kim Vibrock Etiquette in Society, in Business, in Politics, and at Home by Emily Post Chapter 32 Etiquette in Business and Politics A certain rich man whose appointment to a foreign post of importance was about to be ratified came into the corridor of a Washington hotel and stopped to speak with a lady for a few moments. During the whole conversation he kept his hat on his head and a cigar in the corner of his mouth. It happened that the lady was the wife of a prominent senator, and she lost no time in reporting the incident to her husband, who in turn brought the matter to the attention of certain of his colleagues, with the result that the appointment did not go through. It is not unlikely that this man thinks politics played against him, whereas the only factor against him was his exhibition of ill-breeding which proved him unsuitable to represent the dignity of his country. Etiquette would not seem to play an important part in business, and yet no man can ever tell when its knowledge may be of advantage, 
or its lack may turn the scale against him. The man who remains planted in his chair when a lady or an older man speaks to him, who receives customers in his shirt sleeves, who does not take off his hat when talking with a lady and take his cigar out of his mouth when bowing or when addressing her, can never be sure that he is not preparing a witness for the prosecution. Etiquette in smoking. The above does not mean that a gentleman may never smoke in the presence of ladies, especially in the presence of those who smoke themselves. But a gentleman should not smoke under the following circumstances: when walking on the street with a lady, when lifting his hat or bowing, in a room, an office, or an elevator when a lady enters, in any short conversation where he is standing near or talking with a lady. If he has seated himself for a conversation with a lady on a veranda, in a hotel, in a private house, anywhere where smoking is permitted, first he asks, "Do you mind if I smoke?" And if she replies, "Not at all," or "Do by all means," it is then proper for him to do so. He should, however, take his cigar, pipe, or cigarette out of his mouth while he is speaking. One who is very adroit can say a word or two without an unpleasant grimace. But one should not talk with one's mouth either full of food, or barricaded with tobacco. In the country, a gentleman may walk with a lady and smoke at the same time, especially a pipe or cigarette. Why a cigar is less admissible is hard to determine, unless a pipe somehow belongs to the country. A gentleman in golf or country clothes, with a pipe in his mouth and a dog at his heels, suggests a picture fitting to the scene. While a cigar seems as out of place as a cutaway coat, a pipe on the street in a city, on the other hand, is less appropriate than a cigar in the country. In any event, he will, of course, ask his companion's permission to smoke. Manners and business. If you had a commission to give, and you entered a man's office and found him lolling back in a tipped swivel chair, his feet above his head, the ubiquitous cigar in his mouth, and his drowsy attention fixed on the sporting page of the newspaper, you would be impressed not so much by his lack of good manners as by his bad business policy, because of the incompetence that his attitude suggests. It is scarcely necessary to ask: Would you give an important commission to him who has no impaired intention of doing anything but take his ease, or to him who is found occupied at his desk, who gets up with alacrity upon your entrance, and is seemingly on his toes mentally as well as actually, or would you go in preference to a man whose manners resemble those of a bear at the zoo, if you could go to another whose business ability is supplemented by personal charm? And this again is merely an illustration of bad manners and good. An advantage of polish. One advantage of polish is that one's opponent can never tell what is going on under the glazed surface of highly finished manners, whereas an unfinished surface is all too easily penetrated. And since business encounters are often played like poker hands, it is surely a bad plan to be playing with a mind reader who can plainly divine his opponent's cards. While his own are unrevealed, manners that can, by any possibility, be construed as mincing, foppish, or effeminate, are not recommended. But a gentleman who says "Good morning" to his employees and who invariably treats all women as ladies does not half so much flatter their vanity as win their respect for himself as a gentleman. Again, good manners are, after all, nothing but courteous consideration of other people's interests and feelings. That being true, does it not follow that all customers, superior officers, and employees prefer an executive whose good manners imply consideration of his customers, his companies, and his employees' interest, as well as merely his own? Perfect polish that is unsuspected. The president of a great industry, whose mastery of etiquette is one of his chief assets, so submerges this asset in other and more apparent qualifications. That every plain man he comes in contact with takes it for granted that he is an equally plain man himself. He is plain in so far as he is straightforward in attitude and simple in manner. No red tape is required apparently to penetrate into this president's private office, whereas many small men are guarded with pretentiousness that is often an effort to give an impression of importance. In this big man's employ, there is an especial assistant chosen purposely because of his tact and good manners. 
If an unknown person asks to see Mr. President, this deputy is sent out, as from most offices, to find out what the visitor's business is. But instead of being told bluntly the boss doesn't know him and can't see him, the visitor is made to feel how much the president will regret not seeing him. Perhaps he is told, "Mr. President is in conference just now. I know he would not like you to be kept waiting. Can I be of any service to you? I am his junior assistant." If the visitor's business is really with the president, he is admitted to the chief executive's office, since it is the latter's policy to see every one that he can. He has a courteous manner that makes everyone feel there is nothing in the day's work half so important as what his visitor has come to see him about. Nor is this manner insincere, for whatever time one sees him, he gives his undivided attention. Should his time be short and the moment approach when he is due at an appointment. His secretary enters, a purposely arranged ten minutes ahead of the time necessary for the close of the present interview, and apologetically reminds him, "I'm sorry, Mr. President, but your appointment with the Z Committee is due." Mr. President, with seeming unconcern, uses up most of the ten minutes, and his lingering close of the conversation gives his visitor the impression that he must have been late at his appointment, and wholly because of the unusual interest felt in his caller. This is neither sincerity nor insincerity, but merely bringing social knowledge into business dealing. To make a pleasant and friendly impression is not alone good manners, but equally good business. The crude man would undoubtedly show his eagerness to be rid of his visitor, and after offending the latter's self-pride because of his inattentive discourtesy, be late for his own appointment. The man of skill saw his visitor for fewer actual minutes. But gave the impression that circumstances over which he had no control forced him unwillingly to close the interview. He not only gained the good will of his visitor, but arrived at his own appointment in plenty of time. To listen attentively when one is spoken to is merely one of the rules of etiquette. The man who, while someone is talking to him, gazes out of the window or up at the ceiling. Who draws squares and circles on the blotter, or is engrossed in his fingernails or his shoes, may in his own mind be finessing, or very likely he is bored. In the first case, the chances are he will lose the game. In the second, lots of people are bored, hideously bored, and most often the fault is their own. Always they are at fault who show it. Good manners and good mixers. When one thinks of a man who is known in politics and business as a good mixer, one is apt to think of him as a rough diamond rather than a polished one. In picturing a gentleman, a man of high cultivation, one instinctively thinks of one who is somewhat aloof and apart. A good mixer among uncouth men may quite accurately be one who is also uncouth, but the best mixer of all is one who adjusts himself equally well to finer as well as to plainer society. Education that does not confer flexibility of mind is an obviously limited education. The man of broadest education tunes himself in unison with whomever he happens to be. The more subjects he knows about, the more people he is in sympathy with, and therefore the more customers or associates or constituents he is sure to have. The really big man. It makes little difference whether he was born with a gold spoon in his mouth or no spoon at all. Is always one whose interest in people, things, and events is a stimulating influence upon all those he comes in contact with. He who says that does not interest me or that bores me defines his own limitations. He who is unable to project sympathy into other problems or classes than his own is an unimportant person, though he have the birth of a Cecil and the manners of a Chesterfield. Every gentleman has an inalienable right to his own reserves. That goes without saying, and because he can project sympathy and understanding where and when he chooses, does not for one moment mean that he thereby should break down the walls of his instinctive defenses. It is not the latter type, but the gentleman limited who has belittled the name of gentleman in the world of work, not so much because he is a gentleman as because he is not entirely one. He who is every inch a gentleman, as well as every inch a man, is the highest type in the world today, just as he has always been. The do-nothing gentleman is equally looked down upon everywhere. Etiquette in reverse gear. 
Etiquette, remember, is merely a collection of forms by which all personal contacts in life are made smooth. The necessity for a rough man to become polished so that he may meet men of cultivation on an equal footing has an equally important reverse. The time has gone by when a gentleman, by grace of God, which placed him in a high-born position, can control numbers of other men placed beneath him. Every man takes his place today according to born position plus the test of his own experience. And just as an unlettered expert in business is only half authoritative to men of high cultivation. So also is the gentleman, no matter how much he knows of Latin, Greek, history, art, and polish of manner, handicapped according to his ignorance on the subject of another's expertness. Etiquette, in reverse, prescribes this necessity for complete knowledge in every contact in life. Through knowledge alone does one prove one's right to authority. For instance, a man in a machine shop is working at a lathe. An officer of the company comes into the shop, a gentleman in white collar and good clothes. He stands behind the mechanic and curses him out because his work is inefficient. When he turns away, the man at the lathe says, "Who was that guy anyway? What business has he to teach me my job?" Instead of accepting the criticism, he resents what he considers unwarranted interference by a man in another class. But supposing instead of standing by and talking about inefficiency, the gentleman had said, "Get out of there a moment," and throwing off his coat and rolling up his silk shirt sleeves, he had operated the lathe with a smoothness and rapidity that could only have been acquired through long experience at a bench. The result would be that the next time he came on a tour of inspection, that particular man, as well as all those who were witnesses of the former scene, would not only listen to him with respect. But without resentment of his class, because his expertness proved that he had earned his right to good clothes and silk shirts, and to tell those beneath him how work should be done. The same test applies to any branch of experience. A man who knows as much about any specialty as an expert does himself makes the expert think at once, "This man is a wonder." The very fact that the first man is not making the subject his specialty intensifies the achievement. Everything he says after that on subjects of which the second man knows nothing is accepted without question. Whenever you know as much as the other man, whether you are socially above or below him, you are on that subject his equal. When you know more than he does, you have the advantage. The self-made man and world-made manners. It is not in order to shine in society that grace of manner is an asset. Comparatively, few people in a community care a rap about society anyway. A man of affairs whose life is spent in doing a man's work in a man's way is not apt to be thrilled at the thought of putting on glad clothes and going out with his wife to a pink tea or ball. But what many successful men do not realize is that a fundamental knowledge of etiquette is no less an asset in business or public life or in any other contact with people than it is in society. Just as any expert, whether at a machine bench, an accountant's desk, or at golf, gives an impression of such ease as to make his accomplishment seemingly require no skill, a bungler makes himself and everyone watching him uneasy, if not actually fearful, of his awkwardness. And as inexpertness is quite as irritating in personal as in mechanical bungling, so there is scarcely anyone who sooner or later does not feel the need of social expertness. Something. Some day will awaken him to the folly of scorning as soft men who have accomplished manners, despising as effeminate youths who have physical grace, of being contemptuous of the perfect English of the well-bred gentleman, of consoling himself with the thought that his own crudeness is strong and manly and American. The X markers. But let success come to the same inexpert man. Let him be appointed to high office. Let him then shuffle from foot to foot, never knowing what to do or say. Let him meet open derision or ill-concealed contempt from every educated person brought in contact with him. Let opprobrium fall upon his state because its governor is a boor, and let him, as such, be written of in the editorials of the press and in the archives of history. Will he be so pleased with himself then? Does anyone think of Theodore Roosevelt as soft or effeminate because he was one of the greatest masters of etiquette who ever bore the most exalted honor that can be awarded by the people of the United States? 
Washington was completely a gentleman, and so was Abraham Lincoln. Because Lincoln's etiquette was self-taught, it was no less masterly for that. Whether he happened to know a lot of trifling details of pseudo etiquette matters not in the least. Awkward he may have been, but the essence of him was courtesy, unfailing courtesy. No rough, uneducated man has command of perfect English, and Lincoln's English is supreme. One thing that some men of might forget is that lack of polish in its wider aspects is merely lack of education. They themselves look down upon a man who has to make an X mark in place of signing his name, but they overlook entirely that to those more highly educated, they are themselves, in degree, quite as ignorant. Sons of self-made men, and yet speak to self-made men of the need of the social graces for their sons, and nine out of ten stampede for all the world as though it were suggested to put them in petticoats. Do they think a poor, unlettered lout who shambles at the door, who stands unable to speak, who turns his cap in his hands, who sidles into the room and can't for the life of him get out again, well trained for the battle of life? Picture that Mister Strongman who thrusts his thumbs into his armholes and sits tipped back in his chair with a cigar in the corner of his mouth and his heels comfortably reposing on his solid mahogany desk. This is not in criticism of his relaxation; it is his own desk, and certainly he has a right to put his heels on it if he wants to. Likewise, thumbs and armholes are his own. It is merely a picture that leads to another. Supposing a very great man comes into Mister Strongman's office. One whom he may consider a great man, a president perhaps of a big industry or of a railroad, or a senator, and shortly afterwards, strong man's own son comes into the room. Would he like to see his son abashed, awkward, spasmodically jerky, like the poor bumpkin who came the other day to ask about removing the ashes, or worse yet, bold and boisterous or cheeky, or would he like that boy of his to come forward with an entire lack of self-consciousness? And as his father introduces him as my son, have him put out his hand in frank and easy and yet deferential friendliness, and then saying quickly and quietly whatever it was he came to say, as quickly and quietly make his way out again. Would he be sorry that the big man thought fine boy that ability too? Why would he think he had ability? Because the ease and dexterity with which he handled the social incident automatically suggests ability to handle other situations. Etiquette and business authority. Another point: Does the self-made man stop to realize that his authority in business would be even greater than it is if he had the hallmarks of cultivation? For instance, when he comes in contact with college graduates and other cultivated men, his opinions gain or lose in weight exactly in proportion as he proves to be in their own class or below it. A man unconsciously judges the authority of others by the standard of his own expert knowledge. A crude man may be a genius in business management, but in the unspoken opinion of men of education, he is in other contexts inferior to themselves. He is an authority they grant. But in limited lines only. But when a man is met with who combines with business genius the advantage of polished manners and evident cultivation, his opinion on any subject broached at once assumes added weight, doesn't it? End of chapter thirty-two. Recording by Kim Vibrock, www.soaringmountain.com. Chapter Thirty Three, Part One of Etiquette. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. Etiquette in Society, in Business, in Politics, and at Home, by Emily Post. Chapter Thirty Three, Part One. Dress. Clothes are to us what fur and feathers are to beasts and birds. They not only add to our appearance, but they are our appearance. How we look to others entirely depends upon what we wear and how we wear it. Manners and speech are noted afterward, and character last of all. In the community where we live, admirableness of character is the fundamental essential, 
and in order to achieve a position of importance, personality is also essential. But for the transient impression that we make at home, abroad, everywhere in public, two superficial attributes are alone indispensable, good manners and a pleasing appearance. It is not merely a question of vanity and inclination. In New York, for instance, a woman must dress well to pay her way. In Europe, where the title of duchess serves in lieu of a court train of gold brocade, or in bohemian circles where talent alone may count, or in small communities where people are known for what they really are, appearance is of aesthetic rather than essential importance. In the world of smart society, in America at any rate, clothes not only represent our ticket of admission, but our contribution to the effect of a party. What makes a brilliant party? Clothes. Good clothes. A frumpy party is nothing more nor less than a collection of badly dressed persons. People with all the brains, even all the beauty imaginable, make an assemblage of dowds unless they are well dressed. Not even the most beautiful ballroom in the world, decorated like the Garden of Eden, could in itself suggest a brilliant entertainment if the majority of those who filled it were frumps, or worse yet, vulgarians. Rather be frumpy than vulgar. Much. Frumps are often celebrities in disguise, but a person of vulgar appearance is vulgar all through. THE SHEEP Frumps are not very typical of America. Vulgarians are somewhat more numerous, but the greatest number of all are the quietly dressed, unnoticeable men and women who make up the representative backbone in every city, who buy good clothes, but not more than they need, and whose ambition is merely to be well enough dressed to fit in with their background, whatever their background may be. Less numerous, but far more conspicuous, are the dressed-to-the-minute women who, like sheep exactly, follow every turn of latest fashion blindly and without the slightest sense of distance or direction. As each new season's fashion is defined, all the sheep run and dress themselves each in a replica of the other. Their own types and personalities have nothing to do with the case. Fashion says, wear bolster cases tied at the neck and ankle, or a few wisps of gauze held in place with court plaster, and daughter, mother, grandmother, and all the neighbors wear the same. If emerald green is the fashionable color, all of the yellowest skins will be framed in it. When hobble skirts are the thing, the fattest wobble along, looking for all the world like chandeliers tied up in mosquito netting. If ball dresses are cut to the last limit of daring, the ample billows of the fat will vie blandly with the marvels of anatomy exhibited by the thin. Comfort, convenience, becomingness, adaptability, beauty are of no importance. Fashion is followed to the letter. Therefore, they fancy, poor sheep, they are the last word in smartness. Those whom the fashion suits are smart, but they are seldom, if ever, distinguished, because they are all precisely alike. THE WOMAN WHO IS REALLY CHIC The woman who is chic is always a little different. Not different in being behind fashion, but always slightly apart from it. Chic is a borrowed adjective, but there is no English word to take the place of elegant, which was destroyed utterly by the reporter or practical joker who said, Elegant dresses. And yet there is no synonym that will express the individuality of beautiful taste, combined with personal dignity and grace, which gives to a perfect costume an inimitable air of distinction. Undam elegant is all of that. And Mrs. Oldname is just such a person. She follows fashion merely so far as is absolutely necessary. She gets the latest model, perhaps, but has it adapted to her own type, so that she has just that distinction of appearance that the sheep lack. She has even clung with slight modifications to the worth ball dress, and her wrapped or fitted bodice has continued to look the smartest in every ballroom, in spite of the Greek drapery in one-piece meal bag and all the other kaleidoscopic changes of fashion the rest of us have been through. But the average would-be independent who determines to stand her ground, saying, These new models are preposterous, I shall wear nothing of the sort, and keeps her word, soon finds herself not at all an example of dignity, but an object of derision. Fashion has little in common with beauty. Fashion ought to be likened to a tide or epidemic. Sometimes one might define it as a sort of hypnotism, seemingly exerted by the gods as a joke. Fashion has the power to appear temporarily in the guise of beauty. 
though it is the antithesis of beauty nearly always. If you doubt it, look at old-fashioned plates. Even the woman of beautiful taste succumbs occasionally to the epidemics of fashion, but she is more immune than most. All women who have any clothes sense whatever know, more or less, the type of things that are their style, unless they have such an attack of fashionitis as to be irresponsibly delirious. To describe any details of dress that will not be as queer tomorrow as today's fashions are bound to be would seem at the outset pretty much like writing about next year's weather. And yet there is one unchanging principle which must be followed by every woman, man, and child that is well dressed, suitability. Nor does suitability mean merely that you must choose clothes suitable to your age and appearance, and that you must get a ball dress for a ball and a street dress to walk in. It means equally that you must not buy clothes out of proportion to your income, or out of keeping with your surroundings. Disproportionate Expenditure in Bad Taste About fifteen years ago, the extravagance in women's dress reached such a high water mark that it was not unheard of for a New York woman to spend a third of her husband's income on clothes. All women of fashion bought clothes when it would not have occurred to them to buy furniture when it would have seemed preposterous to buy a piece of jewelry. But clothes, clothes, and more clothes, each more hand-embroidered than the last, until just as it seemed that no dress was fit to be seen if it hadn't a month or two of someone's time embroidered on it, the work on clothes subsided. Until now we are at the other extreme. No work is put on them at all. At least clothes today are much more sensible, and let us hope the sense will be lasting." The war did at least make people realize that luxuries in trimmings could go too far. Ten years ago, the American woman who lived in a little cottage, who walked when she went out, or took the street car, wore the same clothes exactly that Mrs. Gilding wore in her Victoria, or trailed over a mean rug. The French woman has always been, and the American woman of taste is now, too great an artist to sit in a little room with its cotton print slipcovers, muslin curtains, and geranium pots on the window ledge, in anything strikingly elaborate and expensive. Charming as her dress may be in line and cut and color, she keeps it, no matter how intrinsically good it may be, in harmony with her geranium pots and her chintz. On the other hand, clothes that are too plain can be equally out of proportion. Last winter, for instance, a committee of ladies met in what might safely be called the handsomest house in New York, in a room that would fit perfectly in the palace of Versailles, filled with treasures such as those of the Wallace collection. The hostess presided in a black serge golf skirt, a businesswoman's white shirt-waist, and stout walking boots, her hair brushed flat and tidily back, and fastened as though for riding, her face and hands redolent of soap. No powder, not a nail manicured. Had she been a girl earning her living, she could not have been more suitably dressed, but her millions and her palace background demand that her clothes be at least moderately in keeping. One does not have to be dowdy as an alternative to being too richly dressed, and to define differences between clothes that are notable because of their distinction and smartness, and clothes that are merely conspicuous and therefore vulgar, is a very elusive point. However, there are certain rules that seem pretty well established. Vulgar Clothes Vulgar clothes are those which, no matter what the fashion of the moment may be, are always too elaborate for the occasion, too exaggerated in style, or have accessories out of proportion. People of uncultivated taste are apt to fancy distortions, to exaggerate rather than modify the prevailing fashions. For example, a conspicuous evidence of bad style that has persisted through numberless changes in fashion is the overdressed and overtrimmed head. The woman of uncultivated taste has no more sense of moderation than the queen of the cannibals. She will elaborate her hairdressing to start with. This is all right if elaboration really suits her type. And then she will decorate it with everything in the way of millinery and jewelry that she can lay her hands on. Or, in the daytime, she fancies equally overweighted hats, and rich-looking fur coats, and the latest edition in the most conspicuous possible footwear. And she much prefers wearing rings to gloves. Maybe she thinks they do not go together? She despises sensible clothing. She also despises plain fabrics and untrimmed models. She also cares little, apparently, for staying at home, since she is perpetually seen at restaurants and at every public entertainment. 
The food she orders is rich. The appearance she makes is rich. In fact, to see her often is like nothing so much as being forced to eat a large amount of butter, plain. Beau Brummel's remark that when one attracted too much notice, one could be sure of not being well-dressed but overdressed, has for a hundred years been the comfort of the dowdy. It is, of course, very often true, but not invariably. A person may be stared at for any one of many reasons. It depends very much on the stare. A woman may be stared at because she is indiscreet, or because she looks like a left-over member of the circus, or because she is enchanting to look at. If you are much stared at, what sort of a stare do you usually meet? Is it bold or mocking, or is it merely that people look at you wistfully? If the first, change your manner. If the second, wear more conventional clothes. If the third, you may be left as you are. But be sure of your diagnosis of this last. Extravagance, not vulgarity. Ostentation is always vulgar, but extravagance is not necessarily vulgar, not by any means. Extravagance can become dishonest if carried beyond one's income. Nearly everything that is beautiful or valuable is an extravagance, for most of us. Always to wear new gloves is an extravagant item for one with a small allowance, but scarcely vulgar. A laundry bill can be extravagant, flowers in one's city house, a piece of beautiful furniture, a good tapestry, each is an extravagance to an income that cannot easily afford the expenditure. To one sufficient to buy the tapestry, the flowers are not an extravagance at all. To buy quantities of things that are not even used after they are bought is sheer wastefulness, and to buy everything that tempts you, whether you can afford to pay for it or not, is, if you can not afford it, verging on the actually dishonest. Dresses for Dinners and Balls Supposing, since clothes suitable to the occasion are the first requisite of good taste, we take up a few details that are apart from fashion. A dinner dress really means every sort of low or half-low evening dress. A formal dinner dress, like a ball dress, is always low-necked and without sleeves, and is the handsomest type of evening dress that there is. A ball dress may be exquisite in detail, but is often merely effective. The perfect ball dress is one purposely designed with a skirt that is becoming when dancing. A long-wrapped type of dress would make Diana herself look like a toy monkey on a stick, but might be dignified and beautiful at dinner. A dinner dress differs from a ball dress in little except that it is not necessarily designed for freedom of movement. Hair ornaments always look well at a ball, but are not especially appropriate, unless universally in fashion, on other occasions. A lady in a ball dress with nothing added to the head looks a little like being hatless in the street. This sounds like a contradiction of the criticism of the vulgarian. But because a tiara is beautiful at a ball, or a spray of feathers, or a high comb, or another ornament, does not mean that all of these should be put on together and worn in a restaurant, which is just what the vulgarian would do. Whether to wear a headdress, however, depends not alone upon fashion, but upon the individual. If the type of hair ornament at the moment in fashion is becoming, wear it, especially to balls and in a box at the opera. But if it is not becoming, don't. Ladies of fashion, by the way, do not have their hair especially dressed for formal occasions. Each wears her hair a certain way, and it is put up every morning just as carefully as for a ball. The only time it is arranged differently is for riding. An informal dinner dress is merely a modified formal one. It is low in front and high in the back, with long or elbow sleeves, or perhaps it is Dutch neck and no sleeves. When trains are in fashion, all older women should wear them. Fashion or no fashion, no woman who has passed forty looks really well in a cut-off evening dress. An effect of train, however, can very adequately be produced with any arrangement or trimming that extends upon the floor. The informal dinner dress is worn to the theater, the restaurant of high class, the concert, and the opera. Informal dinner dresses are worn in the boxes at the opera on ordinary nights, such as when no especially great star is to sing, and when one is not going on to a ball afterward. But a ball dress is never inappropriate, especially without headdress. On gala nights, ball dresses are worn in the boxes, and headdresses, and as many jewels as one chooses, or has. The Tea Gown 
Everyone knows that a tea gown is a hybrid between a wrapper and a ball dress. It has always a train and usually long flowing sleeves, is made of rather gorgeous materials, and goes on easily, and its chief use is not for wear at the tea table so much as for dinner alone with one's family. It can, however, very properly be put on for tea, and if one is dining at home, kept on for dinner. Otherwise, a lady is apt to take tea in whatever dress she had on for luncheon, and dress after tea for dinner. One does not go out to dine in a tea gown, except in the house of a member of one's family or a most intimate friend. One would wear a tea gown in one's own house in receiving a guest to whose house one would wear a dinner dress. When in doubt, there is one rule that is fairly safe to follow. When in doubt, wear the plainer dress. It is always better far to be underdressed than overdressed. If you don't know whether to put on a ball dress or a dinner dress, wear the dinner dress. Or whether to wear cloth or brocade to a luncheon, wear the cloth. On the street, your tea gowns, since they are never worn in public, can literally be as bizarre as you please. And if you are driving in a closed motor, you can also wear an original type of dress. But in walking on the street, if you care to be taken for a well-bred person, never wear anything that is exaggerated. If skirts are short, don't wear them two inches shorter than anyone else's. If they are long, don't go down the street dragging a train and sweeping the dirt up on the under flouncings. Let us hope that fashion never comes back. Don't wear too much jewelry. It is in bad taste in the first place, and in the second is a temptation to a thief. And don't, under any circumstances, distort your figure into a grotesque shape. Country clothes. Nothing so marks the person who doesn't know as inappropriate choice of clothes. To wear elaborate clothes out of doors in the country is quite as out of place as to parade sports clothes on the streets in town. It is safe to say that sport clothes are appropriate country clothes, especially for all young people. Elderly ladies, needless to say, should not don sporting eccentricities nor wear sweaters to lunch parties. But sensible country clothes, such as have for many decades been worn in England, of homespun or serge or jersey cloth, or whatever has replaced these materials, are certainly more appropriate to walk in than a town costume, even for a lady of seventy. Young people going to the country for the day wear sports clothes, which, if seen early in the morning in town and again late in the afternoon, merely show you have been to the country. But town clothes in the country proclaim your ignorance of fitness. Even for a lunch party at Golden Hall or Great Estates, every one who is young wears smart country clothes. Shoes and slippers. Sport shoes are naturally adapted to the sport for which they are intended. High-heeled slippers do not go with any country clothes except organdy or muslins or other distinctly feminine summer dresses. Elaborate afternoon dresses of painted chiffons, embroidered mulls, etc. Are seen only at weddings, lawn parties, or at watering places abroad. A suggestion to those who mind sunburn. No advice is intended for those who have a skin that either does not burn at all or turns a beautiful smooth Hawaiian brown. But a woman whose creamy complexion bursts into freckles as violent as they are hideous at the first touch of the sun need no longer stay perpetually indoors in daytime, or venture out only when swathed like a Turk. If she knows the virtue in orange as a color that defies the sun's rays, a thin veil of red orange is more effective than a thick one of blue or black. Orange shirt waists do not sound very conservative, but they are mercifully conserving to arms sensitive to sunburn. Young Mrs. Gilding, whose skin is as perishable as it is lovely, always wears orange on the golf course. A skirt of burnt orange serge of homespun or linen. And shirt waists of orange linen or crepe de chine, a hat with a brim and a harem veil pinned across her nose under her eyes, of orange marquisette, which is easier to breathe through than chiffon, allows her to play golf or tennis or to motor or even go out in a sailboat and keep her skin without a blemish. Constant Style, who also has a skin that the sun destroys, wears orange playing tennis, but for bathing wears a high neck and long-sleeved bathing suit. And makes her face up, also the backs of her hands, with theatrical grease paint that has a good deal of yellow in it, and flesh-color ordinary powder on top. The grease paint withstands hot sun and water, 
but it is messy. The alternative, however, is a choice between complexion or bathing, as it is otherwise prohibitive for the sun afflicted to have both. End of chapter 33, part 1「Chapter thirty three part two of etiquette this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by Larry Ann Walden etiquette in society in business in politics and at home by Emily post chapter thirty three part two dress writing clothes the distorted circus mirror clothes seen on men who know no better are not a bit worse than the riding clothes seen on actresses in our best theatres and moving pictures who ought to know better nothing looks worse than riding clothes made and worn badly and nothing looks smarter than they when well made and well put on a riding habit no matter what the fashion happens to be is like a uniform in that it must be made and worn according to regulations it must above all be meticulously trig and compact. Nothing must be sticking out a thousandth part of an inch that can be flattened in. A riding habit is the counterpart of an officer's uniform. It is not worn so as to make the wearer look pretty. A woman to look well in a habit must be smart, or she is a sight. And nothing contributes so much to the sights we see at present as the attempt to look pretty instead of looking correct. The criticism is not intended for the woman who lives far off in the open country and jumps on a horse in whatever she happens to have on, but for those who dress for looks and ride in the parks of our cities or walk on the stage and before the camera in scenes meant to represent smart society. To repeat, therefore, the young woman who wants to look pretty should confine her exercise to dancing. She can also hold a parasol over her head and sit in a canoe, or she can be pretty how and where she will, so long as it is not on a horse in the park or hunting field. To mention hunting field is superfluous. The woman who can ride well enough to follow the hounds is too good a sportswoman, too great a lover of good form to be ignorant of the proper outline necessary to smartness of appearance in the saddle. In smartest English society it is not considered best form for a young girl to ride astride in the hunting field or in the park after she is grown. A high-born English girl rides astride as a child, but as soon as she is old enough to be presented at court, she appears at a meet or in the row in a lady's habit, trigly perfect in fit, and on a side saddle. In America this is an extreme opinion, and it is only among the most fashionable that a young girl, having all her life ridden in a man's saddle, finds the world a joyless place and parents cruel when she is no longer allowed to ride like a boy. But she becomes, in spite of her protests, another who looks divine on a horse. And you can look divine, too, if you choose. On second thoughts, the adjective must be qualified. No one looks divine on a horse who is not thin as a shingle. But since diet produces a shingle shape, and every one strong-minded, or vain enough, can diet, you need only care enough to count your calories and be as slim as you please. Next, the best habit possible. And best habits are expensive, and there are no second best. A habit is good, or it is bad. Whatever the present fashion may be, have your habit utterly conventional. Don't wear checks, or have slant pockets, or eccentric cuffs or lapels. Don't have the waist pinched in. Choose a plain, dark, or dust color. A night blue that has a few white hairs in the mixture does not show dust as much as a solid dark color, and a medium-weight, close material holds its shape better than a light, loose weave. You may wear a single white carnation, or a few violets in your buttonhole, but no other trimming. Keep the idea of perfect clothes for men in mind. Get nothing that the smartest man would not wear, and you can't go wrong. Get boots like those of a man, low-heeled, and with a straight line from heel to back of top. Don't have the tops wider than absolutely necessary not to bind, and don't have them curved or fancy in shape. Be sure that there is no elbow sticking out like a horse's hock at the back of the boot, and don't have a corner on the inside edge of the sole and don't try to wear a small size. 
when you put your habit on. First, hair. Never mind if you look like Madame Recamier with your hair fluffed and like a skinned rabbit with it tight back. Tight, flat back it must go. Brush it smooth as you can, braid it or coil it about level with the top of your ears, and wind it in a doormat, not a knob in the back. If you have a great quantity of hair, you should take all the inner part of it, coil it on top of your head so it will go under your hat out of your way, then take the outer edge of it and braid or wind it as flat as possible. A large bun at the back of the head is almost as bad as hair drawn over the ears at the side. If you have short hairs likely to blow, you must wear a hunting hair net, and if it is bobbed, it must be drawn back into a silk riding net and made to look trim. Correct riding clothes are not fashion but form. Whether coat skirts are long or short, full or plain, and waists wasp like or square, the above admonitions have held for many decades and are likely to hold for many more. Gloves must be of heavy leather and at least two sizes bigger than those ordinarily worn. A hat must fit the head and its shape must be conventional. Never wear a hat that would be incorrect on a man, and don't wear it on the back of your head or over your nose. Wear your stock as tight as you comfortably can, not too tight. Tie it smartly so as to make it flat and neat, and anchor whatever you wear so securely that nothing can possibly come loose. And if you want to see a living example of perfection in riding clothes, go to the next horse show where Miss Belle Beach is riding and look at her. What clothes to take for a weekend? Unless fashion turns itself upside down, which it is, of course, perfectly capable of doing, elaborate clothes, except evening ones, are entirely useless even in Newport. We have all of us abandoned Paris fashions for country wear in favor of those of England. The Valenciennes insertions and trailing chiffons of some years ago, still seen at watering places in France, have been entirely superseded by country clothes. In going to any fashionable house in the country, you should take a dinner dress for each evening with stockings and slippers to match. You need a country dress for each day, or if the weather is uncertain, a thick one and two thin ones, with a long coat and a dress suitable for church. This one can perfectly well be a country dress, but not a sports one. If you are not too young and are going to stay in an informal house where you will probably be the only guest, and where it is likely no one will be asked in, a tea gown or two should be taken. If you are going especially for a ball, but not given by your hostess, needless to say you take a ball dress and an evening wrap. In the autumn or winter, a fur coat will do double service for coat and wrap. Do not take a big trunk full of all the things you don't need. Don't take sports clothes for all occasions if you are not a sportswoman. But if you do ride, or play tennis, or golf, or skate, or swim, be sure to take your own clothes and don't borrow other people's. There are plenty of ingeniously arranged week-end trunks, very compact in size, that have a hat compartment, holding from two to six hats, and plenty of room for a half a dozen dresses and their accessories. When the income is limited. No one can dress well on nothing a year. That must be granted at the outset. But a woman who has talent, taste, and ingenuity can be suitably and charmingly dressed on little a year, especially at present. First of all, to mind wearing a dress many times because it indicates a small bank account is to exhibit a false notion of the values in life. Any one who thinks well or ill of her in accordance with her income cannot be too quickly got rid of. But worthwhile people are influenced in her disfavor when she has clothes in number and quality out of proportion to her known financial situation. It is tiresome everlastingly to wear black, but nothing is so serviceable, nothing so unrecognizable, nothing looks so well on every occasion. A very striking dress cannot be worn many times without making others, as well as its owner, feel bored at the sight of it. Here comes the zebra, or the cockatoo, is inevitable if a dress of stripes or flamboyant color is worn often. She who must wear one dress through a season, and have it perhaps made over the next, would better choose black or cream color. Or perhaps a certain color suits her, and this fact makes it possible for her habitually to wear it without impressing others with her lack of clothes. 
but whether her background be black or cerise, it should invariably blend with her whole wardrobe, so that all accessories can be made to do double or quadruple service. Supposing you are a young woman with more beauty than wealth, let us also suppose you have three evening dresses, a blue, a pink, and a green. At the moment you can wear flesh-colored slippers and stockings with everything, which rather weakens the argument. However, a blue fan does not look well with a pink or green dress, nor do the other combinations. Supposing, however, you had instead a cream-colored dress, a flesh-colored, and an orchid one. Flesh-colored slippers look much better with cream and orchid than with either green or blue, at any rate. A watermelon pink fan is lovely in nightlight with all three. So is a cream one. Or perhaps by changing both fan and slippers, a different effect is produced, since the colors of your clothes are background colors. But nothing really can compare with the utility and smartness of black. Take a black tulle dress, made in the simplest possible way. Worn plain, it is a simple dinner dress. It can have a lace slip to go over it and make another dress. With a jet harness, meaning merely trimming that can be added at will, it is still another dress. Or it can have a tunic of silver or of gold trimming, and fans, flowers, and slippers in various colors, such as watermelon or emerald, change it again. In fact, a black tool can be changed almost as easily as though done with a magician's wand. To choose daytime clothes that go with the same hats, shoes, parasols, wrist bags, and gloves is equally important. A snuff-colored dress and a gray one need entirely different accessories. Russet shoes, chamois gloves, and sand-colored hat go also with henna, raspberry, reds, etc., but gray must have gray or white shoes, gloves, and hat, which also go with blues, greens, and violets. Don't get too many clothes. Choose the clothes which you must have carefully, and if you must cut down, cut down on elaborate ones. There is scarcely anywhere that you can not fittingly go in plain clothes. Very few, if any, people need fancy things. All people need plain ones. A very beautiful Chicago woman, who was always perfectly dressed for every occasion, worked out the cost of her own clothes this way. On a sheet of paper, thumb-tacked on the inside of her closet door, she put a complete typewritten list of her dresses and hats, and the cost of each. Every time she put on a dress, she made a pencil mark. By and by, when a dress was discarded, she divided the cost of it by the number of times it had been worn. In this way she found out accurately which were her cheapest and which her most expensive clothes. When getting new ones she has the advantage of very valuable information, since she avoids the dress that is never put on, which is a bigger handicap for the medium-sized allowance than many women realize. What to wear in a restaurant Restaurant dress depends upon the restaurant and the city because women in New York wear low-neck dresses and no hats, does not mean that those who live in Newtown should do the same, if it is not Newtown's custom. But you must never wear an evening dress and a hat, and never wear a day dress without one. If in the city where you live people wear day clothes in the evening, you can only very slightly differ from them. It is never good form to be elaborately dressed in a public place, except in a box at the opera or at a charity ball. At a wedding, a garden party, or afternoon tea. These are the occasions when elaborate day dresses are appropriate. But if you have very few clothes, you can perfectly well wear any sort of day dress that may be in fashion. A coat and skirt is not appropriate, since a skirt and shirt waist is, and always has been, a utility combination. Unless, of course, the waist is of a color to match the skirt, so that it has the appearance of a dress. You need, however, seldom worry about your appearance because you are not as dressed as the others. The time to worry is when you are more dressed than anyone else. For a garden party, a country dress is quite all right, though if you have a very elaborate summer dress, this is the only time you can wear it. No one has to be told what to wear to church. In small country churches at the seashore, people go to church in country clothes. Otherwise, as everyone knows, one puts on town clothes and gloves. At a formal luncheon in town, one sees every sort of dress from velvet to tailor-made. Certain ladies, older ones usually, who like elaborate clothes, wear them. But younger people are usually dressed in worsted materials or silks that are dull in finish, 
and that, although they may be embroidered and very expensive, give an effect of simplicity. One should always wear a simpler dress in one's own house than one wears in going to the house of another. A FEW GENERAL REMARKS The fault of bad taste is usually in overdressing. Quality, not effect, is the standard to seek for. Machine-made pasmin tree on top of conspicuous but sleazy material is always shoddy. Cut and fit are the two items of greatest importance in women's clothes, as well as in men's. But fashion changes too rapidly to make value of material always wise expenditure for one of slender purse. Better usually have two dresses, each cut and made in the whim of the moment, than one which must be worn after the whim has become a freak. In men's clothes, the opposite rule should be followed, since good style in men's clothes is unchanging. To buy things at sales is very much like buying things at an auction. If you really know what you want, and something about values, you can often do marvelously well. But if you are easily bewildered and know little of values, you are apt to spend your good money on trash. A woman of small means must either be, or learn to be, discriminatingly careful, or she would better have her clothes made at home, or, if she is of model type, buy them ready-made. The ready-to-wear clothes in the missus department are growing every year better looking. Unfortunately, and for some inexplicable reason, the usual women's department does not compare in good taste in selection of models with the former. And it is unusual to find a dress that a lady of fashion would choose except among the imported models, for which store prices are as a rule higher than those asked by the greatest dressmakers. Evening clothes are still usually unbuyable by the over-fastidious, except for a certain flapper type, and an undistinguished one at that, and the ultra-smart woman is still obliged to go to the private importers for her debutante daughter's ball dresses, as well as her own, or else into her own sewing-room. Fashion and fat. For years, the thin, even the scrawny, have had everything their own way. The woman who is fat, or even plump, has a rather hopeless problem unless fashion goes to Turkey for its next inspiration, which is so unlikely it is almost possible. Two things the fat woman should avoid, big patterns and the stiff tailor-made. Fat women look better in feminine clothes that follow in the wake, never in the advance of modified fashion. Fat women should never wear elaborate clothes, or clothes in light colors, or heavily feathered hats. The tendency of fat is to take away from one's gracility. Therefore, any one inclined to be fat must be ultra-conservative, in order to counteract the effect. Very tight clothes make fat people look fatter, and thin people thinner. Satin is a bad material, since highlights are too shimmeringly accentuated. Heavy ankles, needless to say, should never be clothed in light stockings and dark shoes. Long, pointed slippers accentuate a thick ankle, and so does a short skirt that has a straight hem. A ragged edge is most flattering. Dress, stockings, and slippers to match are unavoidable in evening dress, but when possible a thick ankle should have a dark stocking, or at least a slipper to match the stocking. People should select colors that go with their skin and elderly women should not wear grass-green or royal blue or purple or any hard color that needs a faultless complexion. Swarthy skin always looks better in colors that have red or yellow in them. A very sallow person in pale blue or apple green looks like a well-developed case of jaundice. Pink and orchid are often very becoming to older women, and pale blue or yellow to those with fair skin. Because a woman is no longer young is no reason why she should wear perpetual black, unless she is fat. Clothes for Traveling in Europe Ideal traveling clothes are those which do not wrinkle or show rain spots, and to find which these are it is necessary to take a sample of each material, sprinkle it with water, and twist it to see how much abuse it will stand. Every woman knows what she likes best and what she considers suitable. Two alternating traveling dresses at least will be necessary, and two or three semi-evening dresses to put on for dinner. One very simple half-dinner dress of black, that has a combination of trimmings such as described earlier in this chapter, is ideally useful. Tourists do not put on evening clothes except in very fashionable centers, such as London, Paris, Monte Carlo, or Deauville, and then only if staying at an ultra-fashionable hotel. 
To be overdressed is always in bad taste, so that unless you are going to visit or make several day stops, the one black evening dress suggested would answer every possible purpose. If you intend staying for a long time in one place, you take all of your season's clothes, and if you are going to visit in England or to stay anywhere in the country, you will need country clothes, but not on ordinary touring. For motoring, space is precious, and clothes should be chosen with the object of packing into small dimensions. Motoring in Europe is cold. A very warm, long wrap is necessary. An old fur one is much the best, and a small, close hat that does not blow. Clothes in Paris It is something like this. You have been hypnotized before, and you vow you won't be again. You make up your mind that you are going to get a black dress and a dark blue and nothing else. You enter the lower reception hall and mount the bronze balustraded stairs halfway when already Mademoiselle Marie is aware of your approach. She greets you not only as though you are the only customer she has ever had, but as though your coming has saved, just saved in time, the prestige of the house. She tells you breathlessly that you are just in time to see the parade of models. She puts you where you may have an uninterrupted view. She then begins her greetings all over again by asking not alone after all the members of your family and an extraordinarily long list of friends, but makes a solicitous inquiry after every dress that she has ever sold you. Did Madame like her white velvet? She coos. Was it not most useful? Was not her black lace charming? And the bisque cloth? Surely Madame has found great satisfaction in wearing the bisque cloth. But your ears are as stone to her blandishments. As a traveling suit, bisque colored cloth had not been serviceable. Black lace with a cerise velvet under petticoat might be effective at Arminonville, but it had seemed queer, to say the least, at the tennis match in August. No, you are at last immune from any of those sudden attacks of new fashion fever that result in a loss of judgment. You open your little book and consult your list. I should like, you say, a navy blue serge trimmed with black braid or satin or something like that. A black crepe de chine, absolutely plain. I really need nothing else. You do not look at Mademoiselle Marie's crestfallen face. You watch the procession of models. But the old spell works. Besides zebra stripes and gold shot with cerise and purple, you think an emerald green charmeuse is really a perfect substitute for the plain black crepe de chine you had in mind. You show that you are hypnotized by remarking absently, It is the color of the grass. Instantly, Mademoiselle Marie, the most skilled vendeuse in Paris, becomes radiant. Listen, madame, she says to you in that insinuating, confidential, yet humbly ingratiating manner of hers. Let me explain, madame. The idea of dress this year is altogether idyllic. Never has there been such charming return to nature. The great originator of our house has taken his suggestion, but yes, from the little animals of the fields and woods, from nature herself. Our dresses this year are intended to follow the example of all the little animals dressed to match their backgrounds. Is not that thought exquisite? Is not that delicious? Is an emerald lizard conspicuous in the tropics? Is a zebra even seen in patches of sun and shade? And in the snow, think of all the little animals who put on white coats in winter. Obviously, white is the color intended for winter wear. And for the spring, green. Emerald green, assuredly. It is as Madame herself said, the color of the grass. The emerald charmeuse on a lawn in summer would be a poem of harmony. The cerise for afternoons at sunset. This orange shading into coral embroidery to wear beside the fire. The dark blue chiffon embroidered in silver is for night. All the colors that Madame at first found so bright, they are but the colors of a summer flower garden. What would Madame wear in a flower garden? Black crepe de chine? Assuredly not. See this shell-pink chiffon, how lovely it would look under trees of apple blossoms. Blue serge, oh, what an escape. And now, if madame will permit me to suggest, the green but assuredly, and the orange and coral, and the pink chiffon garden dress, and the zebra for traveling, and the blue and silver. However, to be serious, people do go to Paris to buy their clothes, beautiful clothes. Of course they do, especially those who go every year. But the woman who goes abroad perhaps every four or five years is apt to be deficient in a transatlantic sense. Match backgrounds like charming little animals? Never. Oh, a very big never again. And yet, 
the next time shall you not find it a temptation to go just out of curiosity to find out what the newest artfully enticing little tune of the Pied Pipers of Paris will be? End of chapter 33, part 2「Chapter thirty four of Etiquette. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Robin Cotter, May two thousand seven. Etiquette in Society, in Business, in Politics, and at Home, by Emily Post. CHAPTER Thirty Four, THE CLOTHES OF A GENTLEMAN It would seem that some of our great clothing establishments, with an eye to our polyglot ancestry, have attempted to incorporate some feature of every European national custom into a harmonious whole, and have thus given us that abiding horror, the freak American suit. You will see it everywhere, on Broadway of every city and Main Street of every town on the boardwalks and beaches of coast resorts, and even in remote farming villages. It comes up to hit you in the face, year after year, in all its amazing variations, waistline under the armpits, trick little belts, what-nots in the cuffs, trousers so narrow you fear they will burst before your eyes, pockets placed in every position, buttons clustered together in a tight little row, or reduced to one. And the worst of it is, few of our younger men know any better until they go abroad and find their wardrobe a subject for jest and derision. If you would dress like a gentleman, you must do one of two things. Either study the subject of a gentleman's wardrobe until you are competent to pick out good suits from freaks and direct your misguided tailor, or, at least until your perceptions are trained, go to an English one. This latter method is the easiest, and, by all odds, the safest. It is not anglomania, but plain common sense, to admit that, just as the Rue de la Paix in Paris is the fountainhead of fashions for women, Bond Street in London is the home of irreproachable clothes for men. And yet, curiously enough, just as a woman shopping in Paris can buy frightful clothes, or the most beautiful, a man can in America by the worst clothes in the world, and the best. The ordinary run of English clothes may not be especially good, but they are, on the other hand, never bad. Whereas American freak clothes are distorted like the reflections seen in the convex and concave mirrors of the amusement parks. But not even the leading tailors of Bond Street can excel the supremely good American tailor, whose clothes, however, are identical in every particular with those of London, and their right to be called best is for greater perfection of workmanship and fit. This last is a dangerous phrase. Fit means perfect set and line, not plaster tightness. However, let us suppose that you are either young, or at least fairly young, that you have unquestioned social position and that you are going to get yourself an entire wardrobe. Let us also suppose your money is not unlimited, so that it may also be seen where you may not, or may, if necessary, economize. Formal Evening Clothes Your full dress is the last thing to economize on. It must be perfect in fit, cut, and material, and this means a first-rate tailor. It must be made of a dull-faced worsted, either black or night blue, on no account of broadcloth. Aside from satin facing and collar, which can have lapels or be cut shawl-shaped, and wide braid on the trousers, it must have no trimming whatever. Avoid satin or velvet cuffs, moire neck ribbons, and fancy coat buttons, as you would the plague. Wear a plain white linen waistcoat, not one of cream-colored silk, or figured, or even black brocade. Have all your linen faultlessly clean, always, and your tie of plain white lawn, tied so it will not only stay in place, but look as though nothing short of a backward somersault could disarrange it. Your handkerchief must be white, gloves, at opera or ball, white, flower in buttonhole, if any, 
white. If you are a normal size, you can in America buy inexpensive shirts and white waistcoats that are above reproach, but if you are abnormally tall or otherwise an outsize, so that everything has to be made to order, you will have to pay anywhere from double to four times as much for each article you put on. When you go out on the street, wear an English silk hat, not one of the taper crowned variety popular in the movies, and wear it on your head, not on the back of your neck. Have your overcoat of plain black or dark blue material, for you must wear an overcoat with full dress even in summer. Use a plain white or black and white muffler. Colored ones are impossible. Wear white buckskin gloves if you can afford them, otherwise gray or khaki doeskin, and leave them in your overcoat pocket. Your stick should be of plain malacca or other wood, with either a crooked or straight handle. The only ornamentation allowable is a plain silver or gold band or top, but perfectly plain is best form. And lastly, wear patent leather pumps, shoes or ties, and plain black silk socks, and leave your rubbers, if you must wear them, in the coat room. THE TUXEDO The tuxedo, which is the essential evening dress of a gentleman, is simply the English dinner coat. It was first introduced in this country at the Tuxedo Club to provide something less formal than the swallowtail, and the name has clung ever since. To a man who cannot afford to get two suits of evening clothes, the tuxedo is of greater importance. It is worn every evening, and nearly everywhere, whereas the tailcoat is necessary only at balls, formal dinners, and in a box at the opera. Tuxedo clothes are made of the same materials, and differ from full-dress ones in only three particulars. The cut of the coat, the braid of the trousers, and the use of a black tie instead of a white one. The dinner coat has no tails and is cut like a sack suit, except that it is held closed in front by one button at the waistline. A full dress coat naturally hangs open. The lapels are satin faced and the collar left in cloth, or if it is shawl shaped, the whole collar is of satin. The trousers are identical with full dress ones, except that braid, if used at all, should be narrowed. Cuffed trousers are not good form, nor should a dinner coat be double breasted. Fancy ties are bad form. Choose a plain black silk or satin one. Wear a white waistcoat if you can afford the strain on your laundry bill, otherwise a plain black one. By no means wear a gray one, nor a gray tie. The smartest hat for town wear is an opera, but a straw or felt, which is proper in the country, is not out of place in town. Otherwise, in the street, the accessories are the same as those already given under the previous heading. THE HOUSE SUIT The house suit is an extravagance that may be avoided, and an old tuxedo suit worn instead. A gentleman is always supposed to change his clothes for dinner, whether he is going out or dining at home alone, or with his family, and for this latter occasion some inspired person evolved the house or lounge suit, which is simply a dinner coat and trousers cut somewhat looser than ordinary evening ones, made of an all-silk or silk and wool fabric in some dark color, and lined with either satin or silk. Nothing more comfortable or luxurious could be devised for sitting in a deep easy chair after dinner, in a reclining position that is ruinous to best evening clothes. Its purpose is really to save wear on evening clothes, and to avoid some of their discomfort also, because they cannot be given hard or careless usage, and long survive. A house suit is distinctly what the name implies, and is not an appropriate garment to wear out for dinner, or to receive any but intimate guests in at home. The accessories are a pleated shirt, with turned-down stiff collar and black bow-tie, or even an unstarched shirt with collar attached, white, of course. The coat is made with two buttons instead of one, because no waistcoat is worn with it. FORMAL AFTERNOON DRESS Formal afternoon dress consists of a black cutaway coat 
with white pique or black cloth waistcoat, and grey and black striped trousers. The coat may be bound with braid, or even, in better taste, plain. A satin-faced lapel is not conservative on a cutaway, but it is the correct facing for the more formal, and elderly, frock coat. Either a cutaway or a frock coat is always accompanied by a silk hat, and best worn with plain black waistcoat and a black bow-tie, or a black and white four-in-hand tie. A grey silk ascot worn with the frock coat is supposed to be the correct wedding garment of the bride's father. For details of clothes worn by groom and ushers at a wedding, see chapter on weddings. Shoes may be patent leather, although black calfskin are at present the fashion, either with or without spats. If, with spats, be sure that they fit close, nothing is worse than a wrinkled spat, or one that sticks out over the instep like the opened bill of a duck. Though grey cutaway suits and grey top hats have always been worn to the races in England, they do not seem suitable here, as races in America are not such full-dress occasions as in France and England. But at a spring wedding or other formal occasions, a sand-coloured double-breasted linen waistcoat with spats and bow-tie to match looks very well with a black cutaway and almost black trousers on a man who is young. THE BUSINESS SUIT The business suit, or three-piece sack, is made or marred by its cut alone. It is supposed to be an everyday inconspicuous garment, and should be. A few rules to follow are. Don't choose striking patterns of materials. Suitable woolen stuffs come in endless variety, and any which look plain at a short distance are safe though they may show a mixture of colors or pattern when viewed closely. Don't get too light a blue, too bright a green, or anything suggesting a horse blanket. At the present moment trousers are made with a cuff, sleeves are not. Lapels are moderately small, padded shoulders are an abomination. Peg-topped trousers equally bad. If you must be eccentric, save your efforts for the next fancy dress ball, where you may wear what you please, but in your business clothing be reasonable. Above everything, don't wear white socks, and don't cover yourself with chains, fobs, scarf-pins, lodge emblems, etc., and don't wear horsey shirts and neckties. You will only make a bad impression on everyone you meet. The clothes of a gentleman are always conservative, and it is safe to avoid everything that can possibly come under the heading of novelty. Jewelry In your jewelry let diamonds be conspicuous by their absence. Nothing is more vulgar than a display of ice on a man's shirt-front or on his fingers. There is a good deal of jewelry that a gentleman may be allowed to wear, but it must be chosen with discrimination. Pearl shirt studs, real ones, are correct for full dress only, and not to be worn with a dinner coat unless they are so small as to be entirely inconspicuous. Otherwise you may wear enamel studs that look like white linen or black onyx with a rim of platinum or with a very inconspicuous pattern in diamond chips, but so tiny that they cannot be told from a thread-like design in platinum or others equally moderate. Waistcoat buttons, studs and cufflinks, worn in sets, is an American custom that is permissible. Both waistcoat buttons and cufflinks may be jeweled and valuable, but they must not have big precious stones, or be conspicuous. A watch chain should be very thin, and a man's ring is usually a seal ring of plain gold or a dark stone. If a man wears a jewel at all, it should be sunk into a plain gypsy hoop, setting that has no ornamentation, and worn on his little, not his third, finger. In the Country Gay-colored socks and ties are quite appropriate with flannels and golf tweeds. Only in your riding clothes you must be again conservative. If you can get boots built on English lines, wear them. Otherwise, wear leggings. And remember that all leather must be real leather in the first place, and polished until its surface is like glass. Have your breeches fit you. The coat is less important. In fact, any odd coat will do. 
your legs are the cynosure of attention in riding. Most men in the country wear knickerbockers with golf stockings, with a sack, or a belted, or a semi-belted coat, and in any variety of homespuns, or tweeds, or rough worsted materials. Or they wear long trousered flannels, coats are of the polo or ulster variety. For golf or tennis, many men wear sweater coats, shirts are of cheviot or silk or flannel, all with soft collars attached and to match. The main thing is to dress appropriately. If you are going to play golf, wear golf clothes. If tennis, wear flannels. Do not wear a yachting cap ashore unless you are living on board a yacht. White woolen socks are correct with white buckskin shoes in the country, but not in town. If some semi-formal occasion comes up, such as a country tea, the time-worn conservative blue coat with white flannel trousers is perennially good. Other Hints The well-dressed man is always a paradox. He must look as though he gave his clothes no thought, and as though literally they grew on him like a dog's fur, and yet he must be perfectly groomed. He must be close-shaved and have his hair cut and his nails in good order, not too polished. His linen must always be immaculate, his clothes in press, his shoes perfectly done. His brown shoes must shine like old mahogany, and his white buckskin must be whitened and polished like a prize bull terrier at a bench show. Ties and socks and handkerchief may go together, but too perfect a match betrays an effort for effect, which is always bad. The well-dressed man never wears the same suit or the same pair of shoes two days running. He may have only two suits, but he wears them alternately. If he has four suits, then he should wear each every fourth day. The longer time they have to recover their shape, the better. What to wear on various occasions The appropriate clothes for various occasions are given below. If ever in doubt what to wear, the best rule is to err on the side of informality. Thus, if you are not sure whether to put on your dress suit or your tuxedo, wear the latter. Full dress. 1. At the opera. 2. At an evening wedding. 3. At a dinner to which the invitations are worded in the third person. 4. At a ball or formal evening entertainment. 5. At certain state functions on the continent of Europe in broad daylight. Tuxedo. 1. At the theater. 2. At most dinners. 3. At informal parties. 4. Dining at home. 5. Dining in a restaurant. A cutaway or frock coat with striped trousers. 1. At a noon or afternoon wedding. 2. On Sunday for church in the city. 3. At any formal daytime function. 4. In England to business. 5. As usher at a wedding. 6. As pallbearer. Business suits. 1. All informal daytime occasions. 2. Traveling. 3. The coat of a blue suit with white flannel or duck trousers for a lunch or to church in the country. 4. A blue or black sack suit will do in place of a cutaway at a wedding, but not if you are the groom or an usher. Country Clothes 1. Only in the country To wear odd tweed coats and flannel trousers in town is not only inappropriate, but bad taste. End of chapter 34「Chapter 35 of Etiquette – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden – Etiquette in Society, in Business, in Politics, and at Home by Emily Post – Chapter 35 – The Kindergarten of Etiquette – in the houses of the well-to-do, where the nursery is in charge of a woman of refinement, 
who is competent to teach little children proper behavior, they are never allowed to come to table in the dining room until they have learned at least the elements of good manners. But whether in a big house of this description, or in a small house where perhaps the mother alone must be the teacher, children can scarcely be too young to be taught the rudiments of etiquette, nor can the teaching be too patiently or too conscientiously carried out. Training a child is exactly like training a puppy, a little heedless inattention, and it is out of hand immediately. The great thing is not to let it acquire bad habits that must afterward be broken. Any child can be taught to be beautifully behaved with no effort greater than quiet patience and perseverance, whereas to break bad habits once they are acquired is a Herculean task. Elementary Table Manners since a very little child cannot hold a spoon properly, and as neatness is the first requisite in table manners, it should be allowed to hold its spoon as it might take hold of a bar in front of it, back of the hand up, thumb closed over fist. The pusher, a small flat piece of silver at right angles to a handle, is held in the same way in the left hand. Also in the first eating lessons, a baby must be allowed to put a spoon in its mouth pointed in foremost. Its first lessons must be to take small mouthfuls, to eat very slowly, to spill nothing, to keep the mouth shut while chewing, and not smear its face over. In drinking, a child should use both hands to hold a mug or glass, until its hand is big enough so it can easily hold a glass in one. When it can eat without spilling anything or smearing its lips, and drink without making grease moons on its mug or tumbler, by always wiping its mouth before drinking, it may be allowed to come to table in the dining room as a treat for Sunday lunch or breakfast. Or, if it has been taught by its mother at table, she can relax her attention somewhat from its progress. Girls are usually daintier and more easily taught than boys. But most children will behave badly at table if left to their own devices. Even though they may commit no serious offenses, such as making a mess of their food or themselves, or talking with their mouths full, all children love to crumb bread, flop this way and that in their chairs, knock spoons and forks together, dawdle over their food, feed animals, if any are allowed in the room, or become restless and noisy. Once graduated to the dining room, any reversion to such tactics must be firmly reprehended, and the child should understand that continued offense means a return to the nursery. But before company it is best to say as little as possible, since too much nagging in the presence of strangers lessens a child's incentive to good behavior before them. If it refuses to behave nicely, much the best thing to do is to say nothing, but get up and quietly lead it from the table back to the nursery. It is not only bad for the child, but annoying to a guest, to continue instructions before company, and the child learns much more quickly to be well behaved if it understands that good behavior is the price of admission to grown-up society. A word or two such as, Don't lean on the table, darling, or Pay attention to what you are doing, dear, should suffice. But a child that is noisy, that reaches out to help itself to candy or cake, that interrupts the conversation, that eats untidily, has been allowed to leave the nursery before it has been properly graduated. Table manners must, of course, proceed slowly in exactly the same way that any other lessons proceed in school. Having learned when a baby to use the nursery implements of spoon and pusher, the child, when it is a little older, discards them for the fork, spoon, and knife. The Proper Use of the Fork as soon, therefore, as his hand is dexterous enough, the child must be taught to hold his fork, no longer gripped baby fashion in his fist, but much as a pencil is held in writing. Only the fingers are placed nearer the top than the point. The thumb and two first fingers are closed around the handle, two-thirds of the way up the shank, and the food is taken up shovel-wise on the turned-up prongs. At first his little fingers will hold his fork stiffly, but as he grows older, his fingers will become more flexible, just as they will in holding his pencil. If he finds it hard work to shovel his food, he can, for a while, continue to use his nursery pusher. By and by the pusher is changed for a small piece of bread, 
which is held in his left hand and between thumb and first two fingers, and against which the fork shovels up such elusive articles as corn, peas, poached egg, etc. THE SPOON In using the spoon, he holds it in his right hand like the fork. In eating cereal or dessert, he may be allowed to dip the bowl of the spoon toward him and eat from the end, but in eating soup he must dip his spoon away from him, turning the outer rim of the bowl down as he does so, fill the bowl not more than three-quarters full, and sip it, without noise, out of the side, not the end, of the bowl. The reason why the bowl must not be filled full is because it is impossible to lift a brimming spoonful of liquid to his mouth without spilling some, or, in the case of porridge, without filling his mouth too full. While still very young, he may be taught never to leave the spoon in a cup while drinking out of it, but after stirring the cocoa, or whatever it is, to lay the spoon in the saucer. A very ugly table habit, which seems to be an impulse among all children, is to pile a great quantity of food on a fork, and then lick or bite it off piecemeal. This must on no account be permitted. It is perfectly correct, however, to sip a little at a time of hot liquid from a spoon. In taking any liquid either from a spoon or drinking vessel, no noise must ever be made. THE FORK AND KNIFE TOGETHER In being taught to use his knife, the child should at first cut only something very easy, such as a slice of chicken. He should not attempt anything with bones or gristle, or anything that is tough. In his left hand is put his fork with the prongs downward, held near the top of the handle. His index finger is placed on the shank so that it points to the prongs, and is supported at the side by his thumb. His other fingers close underneath and hold the handle tight. He must never be allowed to hold his fork immigrant fashion, perpendicularly clutched in the clenched fist, and to saw across the food at its base with his knife. THE KNIFE the knife is held in his right hand exactly as the fork is held in his left, firmly and at the end of the handle, with the index finger pointing down the back of the blade. In cutting, he should learn not to scrape the back of the fork prongs with the cutting edge of the knife. Having cut off a mouthful, he thrusts the fork through it, with prongs pointed downward, and conveys it to his mouth with his left hand. He must learn to cut off and eat one mouthful at a time. It is unnecessary to add that the knife must never be put in his mouth, nor is it good form to use the knife unnecessarily. Soft foods like croquettes, hash on toast, all eggs and vegetables, should be cut or merely broken apart with the edge of the fork held like the knife, after which the fork is turned in the hand to first or shovel position. The knife must never be used to scoop baked potato out of the skin or to butter potato. A fork must be used for all manipulations of vegetables. Butter for baked potatoes, taken on the tip of the fork, shovel fashion, laid on the potato, and then pressed down and mixed with the prongs held points curved up. When no knife is being used, the fork is held in the right hand, whether used prongs down to impale the meat or prongs up to lift vegetables. To pile mashed potato and other vegetables on the convex side of the fork, on top of the meat for two or more inches of its length, is a disgusting habit dear to schoolboys, and one that is more easily prevented than corrected. In fact, taking a big mouthful, next to smearing his face and chewing with mouth open, is the worst offense at table. When he has finished eating, he should lay his knife and fork close together, side by side, with handles toward the right side of his plate, the handles projecting an inch or two beyond the rim of the plate. They must be placed far enough on the plate so that there is no danger of their overbalancing onto the table or floor when removed at the end of the course. OTHER TABLE MATTERS The distance from the table at which it is best to sit is a matter of personal comfort. A child should not be allowed to be so close that his elbows are bent like a grasshopper's, nor so far back that food is apt to be spilled in transit from plate to mouth. Children like to drink very long and rapidly, all in one breath, until they are pink around the eyes and are literally gasping. They also love to put their whole hands in their finger bowls and wiggle their fingers. 
A baby of two, or at least by the time he is three, should be taught to dip the tips of his fingers in the finger bowl without playing, draw the fingers of the right hand across his mouth, and then wipe his lips and fingers on the apron of his bib. No small child can be expected to use a napkin instead of a bib. No matter how nicely behaved he may be, there is always danger of his spilling something sometime. Soft boiled egg is hideously difficult to eat without ever getting a drop of it down the front, and it is much easier to supply him with a clean bib for the next meal than to change his dress for the next moment. Very little children usually have hot water plates that are specially made like a double plate with hot water space between, on which the meat is cut up and the vegetables fixed in the pantry, and brought to the children before other people at the table are served. Not only because it is hard for them to be made to wait and have their attention attracted by food not for them, but because they take so long to eat. As soon as they are old enough to eat everything on the table, they are served, not last, but in the regular rotation at table in which they come. Table Tricks That Must Be Corrected To sit up straight and keep their hands in their laps when not occupied with eating is very hard for a child, but should be insisted upon in order to prevent a careless attitude that all too readily degenerates into flopping this way and that and into fingering whatever is in reach. He must not be allowed to warm his hands on his plate or drum on the table or screw his napkin into a rope or make marks on the tablecloth. If he shows talent as an artist, give him pencils or modeling wax in his playroom, but do not let him bite his slice of bread into the silhouette of an animal or model figures in soft bread at the table. And do not allow him to construct a tent out of two forks or an automobile chassis out of tumblers and knives. Food and table implements are not playthings, nor is the dining room a playground. Talking at Table When older people are present at table and a child wants to say something, he must be taught to stop eating momentarily and look at his mother, who at the first pause in the conversation will say, What is it, dear? And the child then has his say. If he wants merely to launch forth on a long subject of his own conversation, his mother says, Not now, darling, we will talk about that by and by. Or, Don't you see that mother is talking to Aunt Mary? When children are at table alone with their mother, they should not only be allowed to talk, but unconsciously trained in table conversation, as well as in table manners. Children are all, more or less, little monkeys, in that they imitate everything they see. If their mother treats them exactly as she does her visitors, they in turn play visitor to perfection. Nothing hurts the feelings of children more than not being allowed to behave like grown persons when they think they are able. To be helped, to be fed, to have their food cut up, all have a stultifying effect upon their development as soon as they have become expert enough to attempt these services for themselves. Children should be taught from the time they are little not to talk about what they like and don't like. A child who is not allowed to say anything but no thank you at home will not mortify his mother in public by screaming, I hate steak, I won't eat potato, I want ice cream. Quietness at Table Older children should not be allowed to jerk out their chairs, to flop down sideways, to flick their napkins by one corner, to reach out for something, or begin to eat nuts, fruit, or other table decorations. A child, as well as a grown person, should sit down quietly in the center of his chair and draw it up to the table, if there is no one to push it in for him, by holding the seat in either hand while momentarily lifting himself on his feet. He must not jump or rock his chair into place at the table. In getting up from the table, again he must push his chair back quietly, using his hands on either side of the chair seat, and not by holding on to the table edge and giving himself, chair and all, a sudden shove. There should never be a sound made by the pushing in or out of chairs at table. THE SPOILED CHILD The bad manners of American children, which unfortunately are supposed by foreigners to be typical, are nearly always the result of their being given star parts by over-fond but equally over-foolish mothers. It is only necessary to bring to mind the most irritating and objectionable child one knows, and the chances are that its mother continually throws the spotlight on it by talking to it and about it 
and by calling attention to its looks, or its cunning ways, or even, possibly, its naughtiness. It is humanly natural to make a fuss over little children, particularly if they are pretty, and it takes quite superhuman control for a young mother not to show off her treasure, but to say instead, Please do not pay any attention to her. Some children, who are especially free from self-consciousness, stand stardom better than others who are more readily spoiled. But in nine cases out of ten, the old-fashioned method that assigned children to inconspicuous places in the background, and decree that they might be seen but not heard, produced men and women of far greater charm than the modern method of encouraging public self-expression from infancy upward. CHIEF VIRTUE, OBEDIENCE No young human being, any more than a young dog, has the least claim to attractiveness unless it is trained to manners and obedience. The child that whines, interrupts, fusses, fidgets, and does nothing that it is told to do, has not the least power of attraction for any one, even though it may have the features of an angel and be dressed like a picture. Another that may have no claim to beauty whatever, but that is sweet and nicely behaved, exerts charm over every one. When possible, a child should be taken away the instant it becomes disobedient. It soon learns that it cannot stay with mother unless it is well behaved. This means that it learns self-control in babyhood. Not only must children obey, but they must never be allowed to show off, or become pert, or to contradict or to answer back. And after having been told no, they must never be allowed by persistent nagging to win yes. A child that loses its temper, that teases, that is petulant and disobedient and a nuisance to everybody, is merely a victim, poor little thing, of parents who have been too incompetent or negligent to train it to obedience. Moreover, that same child, when grown, will be the first to resent and blame the mother's mistaken spoiling and lack of good sense. Fair Play Nothing appeals to children more than justice, and they should be taught in the nursery to play fair in games, to respect each other's property and rights, to give credit to others, and not to take too much credit to themselves. Every child must be taught never to draw attention to the meager possessions of another child whose parents are not as well off as her own. A purse-proud, overbearing child who says to a playmate, "'My clothes were all made in Paris, and my doll is ever so much handsomer than yours,' or, is that real lace on your collar, is not impressing her young friend with her grandeur and discrimination, but with her disagreeableness and rudeness. A boy who brags about what he has, and boasts of what he can do, is only less objectionable because other boys are sure to take it out of him promptly and thoroughly. Nor should a bright observing child be encouraged to pick out other people's failings, or to tell her mother how inferior other children are compared with herself. If she wins a race, or a medal, or is praised, she naturally tells her mother, and her mother naturally rejoices with her, and it is proper that she should. But a wise mother directs her child's mental attitude to appreciate the fact that arrogance, selfishness, and conceit can win no place worth having in the world. CHILDREN AT AFTERNOON TEA A custom in many fashionable houses is to allow children, as soon as they are old enough, to come into the drawing-room or library at tea-time, as nothing gives them a better opportunity to learn how to behave in company. Little boys are always taught to bow to visitors, little girls to curtsy. Small boys are taught to place the individual tables, hand plates and tea, and pass sandwiches and cakes. If there are no boys, girls perform this office. Very often they both do. When everybody has been helped, the children are perhaps allowed a piece of cake, which they put on a tea plate, and sit down and eat nicely. But as the tea hour is very near their supper time, they are often allowed nothing, and after making themselves useful, go out of the room again. If many people are present and the children are not spoken to, they leave the room unobtrusively and quietly. If only one or two are present, especially those whom the children know well, they shake hands and say goodbye and walk, not run, out of the room. This is one of the ways in which well-bred people become used from childhood to instinctive good manners. Unless they are spoken to, they would not think of speaking or making themselves noticed in any way. 
very little children who have not reached the age of discretion, which may be placed at about five, possibly not until six, usually go in the drawing room at tea time only when near relatives or intimate friends of the family are there. Needless to say that they are always washed and dressed. Some children wear special afternoon clothes, but usually the clean clothes put on at tea time go on again the next morning, except the thin socks and house slippers which are reserved for the evening hour of their day. Children's Parties A small girl or boy giving a party should receive with her mother at the door and greet all her friends as they come in. If it is her birthday and other children bring her gifts, she must say thank you politely. On no account must she be allowed to tell a child, I hate dolls, if a friend has brought her one. She must learn at an early age that as hostess she must think of her guests rather than herself, and not want the best toys in the grab bag or scream because another child gets the prize that is offered in a contest. If beaten in a game, a little girl, no less than her brothers, must never cry or complain that the contest is not fair when she loses. She must try to help her guests have a good time, and not insist on playing the game she likes instead of those which the other children suggest. When she herself goes to a party, she must say, How do you do? when she enters the room, and curtsy to the lady who receives. A boy makes a bow. They should have equally good manners as when at home, and not try to grab more than their share of favors or toys. When it is time to go home, they must say, Goodbye, I had a very good time, or Goodbye, thank you ever so much. The Child's Reply If the hostess says, Goodbye, give my love to your mother, the child answers, Yes, Mrs. Smith. In all monosyllabic replies, a child must not say yes or no or what. A boy, in answering a gentleman, still uses the old-fashioned yes, sir, no, sir, I think so, sir, but ma'am has gone out of style. Both boys and girls must therefore answer, no, Mrs. Smith, yes, Miss Jones. A girl says, yes, Mr. Smith, rather than sir. All children should say, what did you say, mother? No, father. Thank you, Aunt Kate. Yes, Uncle Fred, etc. They need not insert a name in a long sentence, nor with please or thank you. Yes, please, or no thank you, is quite sufficient. Or in answering, I just saw Mary down in the garden. It is not necessary to add Mrs. Smith at the end. Etiquette for Grown Children Etiquette for grown children is precisely the same as for grown persons, excepting that in many ways the manners exacted of young people should be more alert and punctilious. Young girls, and boys of course, should have the manners of a gentleman rather than those of a lady, in that a gentleman always rises, relinquishes the best seat, and walks last into a room, whereas these courtesies are shown to, and not observed by, ladies, except to other ladies older than themselves. In giving parties, young girls send out their invitations as their mothers do, and their deportment is the same as that of their debutante sister. Boys behave as their fathers do, and are equally punctilious in following the code of honor of all gentlemen. The only details, therefore, not likely to be described in other chapters of this book, are a few admonitions on table manners that are somewhat above kindergarten grade. THE GRADUATING TESTS IN TABLE MANNERS A young person may be supposed to have graduated from the school of table etiquette when she, or he, would be able to sit at a formal lunch or dinner table and find no difficulty in eating properly any of the comestibles which are supposed to be hurdles to the inexpert. CORN ON THE COB Corn on the cob could be eliminated so far as ever having to eat it in formal company is concerned, since it is never served at a luncheon or a dinner. But if you insist on eating it at home or in a restaurant, to attack it with as little ferocity as possible is perhaps the only direction to be given, since at best it is an ungraceful performance, and to eat it greedily a horrible sight. Asparagus Although asparagus may be taken in the fingers, don't take a long drooping stalk, hold it up in the air, and catch the end of it in your mouth like a fish. When the stalks are thin, it is best to cut them in half with the fork, eating the tips like all fork food. 
The ends may then be taken in the fingers and eaten without a dropping fountain effect. Don't squeeze the stalks or hold your hand below the end and let the juice run down your arm. Artichokes Artichokes are always eaten with the fingers. A leaf at a time is pulled off and the edible end dipped in the sauce and then bitten off. Bread and butter Bread should always be broken into small pieces with the fingers before being eaten. If it is to be buttered, at lunch, breakfast, or supper, but not at dinner, a piece is held on the edge of the bread and butter plate, or the place plate, and enough butter spread on it for a mouthful or two at a time with a small silver butter knife. Bread must never be held flat on the palm of the hand and buttered in the air. If the regular steel knife is used, care must be taken not to smear food from the knife side on the butter. Any food that is smeared about is loathsome. People who have beautiful table manners always keep their places at table neat. People with disgusting manners get everything in a horrible mess. The Management of Bones in Pits Terrapin bones, fish bones, and grape seed must be eaten quite bare and clean in the mouth and removed one at a time between finger and thumb. All spitting out of bones and pits into the plate is disgusting. If food is too hot, quickly take a swallow of water. On no account spit it out. If food has been taken into your mouth, no matter how you hate it, you have got to swallow it. It is unforgivable to take anything out of your mouth that has been put in it except dry bones and stones. To spit anything whatever into the corner of your napkin is too nauseating to comment on. It is horrid to see anyone spit skins or pits on a fork or into the plate. The only way to take anything out of your mouth is between first finger and thumb. Dry grape seeds or cherry pits can be dropped from the lips into the cupped hand. Peaches or other very juicy fruits are peeled and then eaten with knife and fork, but dry fruits, such as apples, may be cut and then eaten in the fingers. Never wipe hands that have fruit juice on them on a napkin without first using a finger bowl, because fruit juices make indelible stains. Birds Birds are not eaten with the fingers in company. You cut off as much of the meat as you can and leave the rest on your plate. Forks or Fingers All juicy or gooey fruits or cakes are best eaten with a fork, but in most cases it is a matter of dexterity. If you are able to eat a peach in your fingers and not smear your face, let juice run down, or make a sucking noise, you are the one in a thousand who may, and with utmost propriety, continue the feat. If you can eat a Napoleon or a cream puff and not let the cream ooze out on the far side, you need not use a fork. But if you cannot eat something, no matter what it is, without getting it all over your fingers, you must use a fork, and if necessary, a knife also. All rules of table manners are made to avoid ugliness. To let anyone see what you have in your mouth is repulsive. To make a noise is to suggest an animal. To make a mess is disgusting. On the other hand, there are a number of trifling decrees of etiquette that are merely finical, unreasonable, and silly. Why one should not cut one salad in small pieces if one wants to makes little sense, unless one wants to cut up a whole plateful and make the plate messy. A steel knife must not be used for salad or fruit because it turns black. To condemn the American custom of eating a soft-boiled egg in a glass or cup because it happens to be the English fashion to scoop it through the ragged edge of the shell is about as reasonable as though we were to proclaim English manners bad because they tag a breakfast dish called a savory of fish roe or something equally inappropriate after the dessert at dinner. Many other arbitrary rules for eating food with fork, spoon, or fingers are also stumbling blocks rather than aids to smoothness. As said above, one eats with a fork or spoon finger foods that are messy and sticky. One eats with the finger those which are dry. It is true that one should not eat French fried potatoes or Saratoga chips in fingers, but that is because they belong to the meat course. Separate vegetable saucers are never put on a fashionable table. Neither is butter allowed at dinner. Therefore both must be avoided in company, because company is formal, and etiquette is first aid always to formality. But if a man in his own house likes butter with his dinner or a saucer for his tomatoes, 
He is breaking the rule of fashion to have them, but he is scarcely committing an offense. In the same way, if he likes to eat a chicken wing or a squab leg in his fingers, he can ask for a finger bowl. The real objection to eating with the fingers is getting them greasy or sticky, and to suck them or smear one's napkin is equally unsightly. On the subject of elbows. Although elbows on the table are seen constantly in highest fashionable circles, a whole table's length of elbows planted like clothesline poles, and hands waving glasses or forks about in between, is neither an attractive nor, fortunately, an accurate picture of a fashionable dinner table. As a matter of fact, the tolerated elbow on table is used only on occasion and for a reason, and should neither be permitted to children nor practiced in their presence. Elbows are universally seen on tables in restaurants, especially when people are lunching or dining at a small table of two or four, and it is impossible to make oneself heard above the music by one's table companions, and at the same time not be heard at other tables nearby without leaning far forward. And in leaning forward, a woman's figure makes a more graceful outline supported on her elbows than doubled forward over her hands in her lap as though in pain. At home, when there is no reason for leaning across the table, there is no reason for elbows. And at a dinner of ceremony, elbows on the table are rarely seen, except at the ends of the table, where again one has to lean forward in order to talk to a companion at a distance across the table corner. Elbows are never put on the table while one is eating. To sit with the left elbow propped on the table while eating with the right hand, unless one is alone and ill, or to prop the right one on the table while lifting the fork or glass to the mouth, must be avoided. End of chapter 35、Chapter、36 Of etiquette. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chris Gladys. Etiquette in society, in business, in politics, and at home by Emily Post. Chapter 36. Everyday Manners. At home. Just as no chain is stronger than its weakest link, no manners can be expected to stand a strain beyond their daily test at home. Those who are used to losing their temper in the bosom of their family will sooner or later lose it in public. Families which exert neither courtesy nor charm when alone. Can no more deceive other people into believing that either attribute belongs to them than they could hope to make painted faces look like real complexions. A mother should exact precisely the same behavior at home and every day that she would like her children to display in public, and she herself, if she expects them to take good manners seriously, must show the same manners to them alone. That she shows to company. A really charming woman exerts her charm nowhere more than upon her husband and children, and a noble nature, through daily though unconscious example, is of course the greatest influence for good that there is in the world. No preacher, no matter how saint-like his precept or gold in his voice, can equal the home influence. Of admirable parents. It is not merely in such matters as getting up when their mother or other older relatives enter a room, answering civilly and having good table manners, but in forming habits of admirable living and thinking, that a parent's example makes or mars. If children see temper uncontrolled, hear gossip, uncharitableness, and suspicion of neighbors. Witness arrogant, sharp dealing or lax honor; their own characters can scarcely escape perversion. In the same way, others cannot easily fail to be thoroughbred who have never seen or heard their parents do or say an ignoble thing. No child will ever accept a maxim that is preached but not followed by the preacher. 
It is a waste of breath for the father to order his sons to keep their temper, to behave like gentlemen, or to be good sportsmen, if he does or is himself none of these things. In the present day of rush and hurry, there is little time for home example. To the over-busy or gaily fashionable, home might as well be a railroad station, and members of a family, passengers, who see each other only for a few hurried minutes before taking trains in opposite directions. The days are gone when the family sat in the evening round the fire or a table with a lamp, when it was customary to read aloud or to talk. Few people talk well in these days, fewer read aloud, and fewer still endure listening to any book literally word by word. Railroad station reading is as much in vogue as railroad station bolting of meals. Magazines, picture ones, are all that the hurried have time for, and even those who profess to love reading dart tourist fashion from page to page, only pausing at attractive paragraphs, and family relationships are followed somewhat in the same way. Any number of busy men scarcely know their children at all, and have not even stopped to realize that they seldom or never talk to them, never exert themselves to be sympathetic with them, or in the slightest degree to influence them. To growl, Morning, or Don't, Johnny, or Be quiet, Alice, is very, very far from being an influence on your children's morals, minds, or manners. Home Education A Supreme Court Justice, whose education had been cut short in his youth by the Civil War, when asked how, under the circumstances, his scholastic attainments had been acquired, answered, My father believed it was the duty of every gentleman to bequeath the wealth of his intellect, no less than that of his pocket, to his children. Wealth might be acquired by luck, but proper cultivation was the birthright of every child born of cultivated parents. We learned Latin and Greek by having him talk and read them to us. He wrote doggerel rhymes of history, which took the place of Mother Goose. He also told us bedtime stories of history, and read classics to us after supper. When there was company, we were brought down from the nursery so that we might profit by the conversation of our betters. Volumes full of manners, acquired after they are grown, are not worth half so much as the simplest precepts acquired through lifelong habits and through having known nothing else. THE OLD GRAY WRAPPER HABIT How many times has one heard someone say, I won't dress for dinner, no one is coming in, or that old dress will do, old clothes, no manners, and what is the result? One wife more wonders why her husband neglects her. Curious how the habit of careless manners and the habit of old clothes go together. If you doubt it, put the question to yourself. Who could possibly have the manners of a queen in a gray flannel wrapper? And how many women really lovely and good, especially good, commit aesthetic suicide by letting themselves slide down to where they feel natural in an old gray flannel wrapper, not only actually, but mentally. The woman of charm in company is the woman of fastidiousness at home. She who dresses for her children and prinks for her husband's homecoming is sure to greet them with greater charm than she who thinks whatever she happens to have on is good enough. Any old thing good enough for those she loves most? Think of it! A certain very lovely lady, whose husband is quite as much her lover as in the days of his courtship, has never in twenty years allowed him to watch the progress of her toilet. 
because of her determination never to let him see her except at her prettiest. Needless to say, he never meets anything but prettiest manners either. No matter how out of sorts she may be feeling, his key in the door is a signal for her to put aside everything that is annoying or depressing, with the result that wild horses couldn't drag his attention from her, all because neither she nor he has ever slumped into the grey flannel wrapper habit. So many people save up all their troubles to pour on the one they most love, the idea being, seemingly, that no reserves are necessary between lovers. Nor need there be, really. But why, when their house looks out upon a garden that has charming vistas, must she insist on his looking into the clothes-yard and the ash-can? She who complains incessantly that this is wrong or that hurts or any other thing worries or vexes her, so that his inevitable answer to her greeting is, I'm so sorry, dear, or that's too bad, or poor darling, it's a shame, is getting mentally into a grey flannel wrapper. If something is seriously wrong, if she is really ill, th that is different. But of the petty things that are only remembered in order to be told to gain sympathy, beware. There is a big deposit of sympathy in the bank of love, but don't draw out little sums every hour or so, so that by and by, when perhaps you need it badly, it is all drawn out, and you yourself don't know how or on what it was spent. All that has been said to warn a wife from slovenly habits of mind or dress may be adapted to apply with equal force in suggesting a rule for husbands. A man should always remember that a woman's regard for him is founded on her impressions when seeing him at his best. Even granting that she has no great illusions about men in general, he at his best is at least an approximation to her ideal, and it is his chief duty never to fall below the standard he set for himself in making his most cogent appeal. Consequently, he should continue through the years to be scrupulous about his personal appearance and his clothes, remembering the adage that the most successful marriages are those in which both parties to the contract succeed in keeping up the illusion. It is of importance also that he refrain from burdening his wife with the cares and worries of his business day. Many writers insist that the wife should be ready to receive a complete consignment of all his troubles when the husband comes home at the end of the day. It is a sounder practice for him to save her as much as possible from the trials of his business hours. And, incidentally, it is the best kind of mental training for him to put all business cares behind him as he closes the door of his office and goes home. When it is said that a husband should not fling all the day's trifling annoyances into the lap of his wife, without reflecting that she may have some cares of her own, there is no intention to indicate that a wife should not have a thorough understanding of her husband's affairs. Complete acquaintance and sympathy with his work is one of the foundation stones of the domestic edifice. THE FAMILY AT TABLE Whether there is company, or whether the family is alone, the linen must be as spotless, the silver as clean, and the table as carefully set as though twenty were coming for dinner. Sloppy service is no more to be tolerated every day at home than at a dinner party, and in so far as etiquette is concerned, you should live in exactly the same way whether there is company or none. Company manners and everyday manners must be identical in service as well as in family behavior. You may not be able to afford quantities of flowers in your house and on your table, or perhaps any, but there is no excuse for wilted flowers or an empty vase 
that merely accentuates your table's flowerlessness. There are plenty of table ornaments that need no flowers. In the same way, the compotiers can be filled with candies or conserves of the everlasting variety, silver-foiled chocolates or nougat, or gumdrops, or crystallized ginger, or conserved fruits will keep for months. But the table must be decorated, and a certain form observed at the dinner hour. Otherwise, gray flannel wrapper habits become imminent. Letters, newspapers, and books have no place at a dinner table. Reading at table is allowable at breakfast and when eating alone, but a man and his wife should no more read at lunch or dinner before each other or their children than they should allow their children to read before them. The table is not a place for private discussion. One very bad habit in many families is the discussion of all their most intimate affairs at table, entirely forgetting whomever may be waiting on it. And nine times out of ten, those serving in the dining room see no harm, if they feel like it, in repeating what is said. Why should they? It scarcely occurs to them that they were invisible, and that what was openly talked about at the table was supposed to be a secret. Apart from the stupidity and imprudence of talking before witnesses, it is bad form to discuss one's private affairs before anyone, and it should be unnecessary to add that a man and his wife who quarrel before their children or the servants deprive the former of good breeding through inheritance, and publish to the latter that they do not belong to the better class through any qualification except the possession of a bank account. Furthermore, parents must never disagree before the children. It simply can't be. Nor can there be an appeal to one parent against the other by a child. Father told me to jump down the well. Then you must do it, dear, is the mother's only possible comment. When the child has jumped down the well, she may pull him out promptly, and she may in private tell her husband what she thinks about his issuing such orders and stand her own ground against them. But so long as parents are living under the same roof, that roof must shelter unity of opinion so far as any witnesses are concerned. End of chapter 36 Chapter 37, Part 1 of Etiquette This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chris Gladys Etiquette in Society, in Business, in Politics, and at Home, by Emily Post. Chapter 37. Traveling at Home and Abroad, Part 1. To do nothing that can either annoy or offend the sensibilities of others sums up the principal rules for conduct under all circumstances, whether staying at home or traveling. But, in order to do nothing that can annoy or give offense, it is necessary for us to consider the point of view of those with whom we come in contact, and in traveling abroad it is necessary to know something of foreign customs which affect the foreign point of view, if we would be thought a cultivated and charming people instead of an uncivilized and objectionable one. Before going abroad, however, let us first take up the subject of travel at home. Since it is not likely that any one would go around the world being deliberately offensive to others, it may be taken for granted that obnoxious behavior is either the fault of thoughtlessness or ignorance, and for the former there is no excuse. On a Railroad Train on a railroad train, you should be careful not to assail the nostrils of fellow passengers with strong odors of any kind. 
an odor that may seem to you refreshing, may cause others who dislike it and are poor travelers to suffer really great distress. There is a combination of banana and the leather smell of a valise containing food that is to many people an immediate emetic. The smell of a banana or an orange is, in fact, to nearly all bad travelers, the last straw. In America, where there are diners on every Pullman train, the food odors are seldom encountered in parlor cars, but in Europe, where railroad carriages are small, one fruit enthusiast can make his traveling companions more utterly wretched than perhaps he can imagine. The cigar, which is smoldering, has, on most women, the same effect. Certain perfumes that are particularly heavy make others ill. To at least half of an average train full of people, strong odors of one kind or another are disagreeable, if not actually nauseating. CHILDREN ON TRAINS People with children are most often the food offenders. Any number not only lets small children eat continuously so that the car is filled with food odors, but occasional mothers have been known to let a child with smeary fingers clutch a nearby passenger by the dress or coat and seemingly think it cunning. Those who can afford it usually take the drawing-room and keep the children in it. Those who are to travel in seats should plan diversions for them ahead of time, since it is unreasonable to expect little children to sit quietly for hours on end merely by telling them to be good. Two little girls on the train to Washington the other day were crocheting dolls' sweaters with balls of worsted in which were wound wrapped and disguised prizes. The amount of wool covering each might take perhaps half an hour to use up. They were allowed the prize only when the last strand of wool around it was used. They were then occupied for a while with whatever it was, a little book or a puzzle or a game. When they grew tired of its novelty, they crocheted again until they came to the next prize. In the end, they had also new garments for their dolls. Ladies do not travel with escorts. In a curiously naive book on etiquette appeared a chapter purporting to give advice to a lady traveling for an indefinite number of days with a gentleman escort. That any lady could go traveling for days under the protection of a gentleman is at least a novelty in etiquette. As said elsewhere, in fashionable society, an escort is unheard of, and in decent society a lady doesn't go traveling around the country with a gentleman unless she is outside the pale of society, in which case social convention, at least, is not concerned with her. Ladies are sometimes accompanied on short direct trips by gentlemen of their acquaintance, but not for longer than a few hours. If a lady traveling alone on a long journey, such as a trip across the continent, happens to find a gentleman on board whom she knows, she must not allow him to sit with her in the dining car more often than a casual once or twice, nor must she allow him to sit with her or talk to her enough to give a possible impression that they are together. In fact, she would be more prudent to take her meals by herself as it is scarcely worth running the risk of other passengers' criticism for the sake of having companionship at a meal or two. If, on a short trip, a gentleman asks a lady, whom he knows, to lunch with him in the dining car, there is no reason why she shouldn't. THE YOUNG WOMAN TRAVELING ALONE In America, a young woman can go across every one of our thousands upon thousands of railed miles without the slightest risk of a disagreeable occurrence, if she is herself dignified and reserved. She should be particularly careful, if she is young and pretty, 
not to allow strange men to scrape an acquaintance with her. If a stranger happens to offer to open a window for her, or get her a chair on the observation platform, it does not give him the right to more than a civil thank you from her. If, in spite of etiquette, she should on a long journey drift into conversation with an obviously well-behaved youth, she should remember that talking with him at all is contrary to the proprieties, and that she must be doubly careful to keep him at a formal distance. There is little harm in talking of utterly impersonal subjects, but she should avoid giving him information that is personal. Every guardian should also warn a young girl that if, when she alights at her destination, her friends fail to meet her, she should on no account accept a stranger's offer, whether man or woman, to drive her to her destination. The safest thing to do is to walk. If it is too far, and there is no official taxicab agent belonging to the railroad company, she should go to the ticket seller or someone wearing the railroad uniform and ask him to select a vehicle for her. She should never, above all in a strange city where she does not even know her direction, take a taxi on the street. Registering in a Hotel a gentleman writes in the hotel register, John Smith, New York. Under no circumstances, Mr. or Honorable, if he is alone. But if his wife is with him, the prefix to their joint names is correct. Mr. and Mrs. John Smith, New York. He never enters his street and house number. Neither John Smith and wife, nor John Smith and family, are good form. If he does not like the Mr. before his name, he can sign his own without, on one line, and then write Mrs. Smith on the one below. The whole family should be registered. John T. Smith, New York. Mrs. Smith and maid, if she has brought one. Miss Margaret Smith, John T. Smith, Jr., baby and nurse. Or, if the children are young, he writes, Mr. and Mrs. John T. Smith, New York, three children, and nurse. A lady never signs her name without Miss or Mrs. in a hotel register. Miss Abigail Titherington is correct, or Mrs. John Smith, never Sarah Smith. LADIES ALONE IN AMERICAN HOTELS If you have never been in a hotel alone, but you are of sufficient years, well-behaved, and dignified in appearance, you need have no fear as to the treatment you will receive. But you should write to the hotel in advance, whether here or in Europe. In this country, you register in the office and are shown to your room, or rooms, by a bellboy. In some hotels, by a bellboy and a maid. One piece of advice. You will not get good service unless you tip generously. If you do not care for elaborate meals, that is nothing to your discredit. But you should not go to an expensive hotel, hold a table that would otherwise be occupied by others who might order a long dinner, and expect your waiter to be contented with a tip of fifteen cents for your dollar supper. The rule is ten percent, beginning with a meal costing about three or four dollars. A quarter is the smallest possible tip in a first-class hotel. If your meal costs a quarter, you should give the waiter a quarter. If it costs two dollars or more than two dollars, you give thirty or thirty-five cents, and ten percent on a bigger amount. In smaller hotels, tips are less in proportion. Tipping is undoubtedly a bad system, but it happens to be in force, and, that being the case, travelers have to pay their share of it, if they like the way made smooth and comfortable. A lady traveling alone with her maid, 
or without one, of necessity has her meals alone, in her own sitting-room, if she has one. If she goes to the dining-room, she usually takes a book, because hotel service seems endless to one used to meals at home, and nothing is duller than to sit long alone with nothing to do but look at the tablecloth, which is scarcely diverting, or at other people, which is impolite. ON THE STEAMER In the days when our great-grandparents went to Europe on a clipper ship, carrying at most a score of voyagers, and taking a month, perhaps, to make the crossing, those who sat day after day together, and evening after evening around the cabin lamp, became necessarily friendly, and in many instances not only for the duration of the voyage, but for life. More often than not, those who had endured the rigors of the Atlantic together joined forces in engaging the courier who was, in those days, indispensable, and set out on their continental travels in company. Dashing to Europe and back was scarcely to be imagined, and travelers who had ventured such a distance stayed at least a year or more. Also, in those slower days of crawling across the earth's surface by post-chaise and diligence and horseback, travelers meeting in inns and elsewhere fell literally on each other's neck at the sound of an American accent, and each retailed to the other his news of home, to which was added the news of all whom they had encountered. It is also from these traveling ancestors that families inherit their continental visiting lists. Friends they made in Europe in turn gave letters of introduction to friends coming later to America, and to them again their American hosts sent letters by later American friends. But today, when going to Europe is of scarcely greater importance than going into another state, and when the passenger list numbers hundreds, making friends with strangers is the last thing the great-grandchildren of those earlier travelers would think of. It may be pretty accurately said that the faster and bigger the ship, the less likely one is to speak to strangers, and yet, as always, circumstances alter cases. Because the worldlies, the old names, the eminents, all those who are innately exclusive, never pick up acquaintances on shipboard, it does not follow that no fashionable and well-born people ever drift into acquaintanceship on European-American steamers of today. But they are at least not apt to do so. Many, in fact, take the ocean crossing as a rest cure, and stay in their cabins the whole voyage. The worldlies always have their meals served in their own drawing-room, and have their deck-chairs placed so that no one is very near them, and keep to themselves, except when they invite friends of their own, to play bridge or to take dinner or lunch with them. But because the worldlies and the eminents, and the snob-sniffs who copy them, stay in their cabins, sit in segregated chairs, and speak to no one except the handful of their personal friends or acquaintances who happen to be on board, it does not follow that the Smiths, Joneses, and Robinsons are not enlarging their acquaintance with every revolution of the screws. And if you happen to like being talked to by strangers, and if they in turn like to talk to you, it cannot be said that there is any rule of etiquette against it. Dining Saloon Etiquette Very fashionable people, as a rule, travel a great deal, which means that they are known very well to the head steward, who reserves a table, or they engage a table for themselves when they get their tickets. Mr. and Mrs. Gilding, for instance, if they know that friends of theirs are sailing on the same steamer, ask them to sit at their table, and ask for a sufficiently large table on purpose. Or, if they are traveling alone, they arrange to have one of the small tables for two to themselves. People of wide acquaintance in big cities are sure to find friends on board with whom they can arrange, if they choose, 
to sit on deck or in the dining saloon. But most people, unless really intimate friends are on board, sit wherever the head steward puts them. After a meal or two, people always speak to those sitting next to them. None but the rudest snobs would sit through meal after meal without ever addressing a word to their table companions. Well-bred people are always courteous, but that does not mean that they establish friendships with any strangers who happen to be placed next to them. In crossing the Pacific, people are more generally friendly, because the voyage is so much longer, and on the other long voyages, such as those to India and South Africa, the entire ship's company become almost as intimate as in the old clipper days. THE TACTICS OF THE CLIMBER There are certain constant travellers who, it is said, count on a European voyage to increase their social acquaintance by just so much each trip. Rich and Vulgar, for instance, has his same especial table every time he crosses, which is four times a year. Walking through a steamer train, he sees a celebrity— a brilliant, let's say, but unworldly man. Vulgar annexes him by saying, casually, Have you a seat at table? Better sit with me. I always have the table by the door. It's easy to get in and out. The celebrity accepts, since there is no evidence that he is to be featured, and the chances are that he remains unconscious to the end of time that he served as a decoy. Boarding the steamer, Vulgar sees the lovejoys and pounces. You must sit at my table. Celebrity and I are crossing together. He is the most delightful man. I want you to sit next to him. They think celebrity sounds very interesting. So, not having engaged a table for themselves, they say they will be delighted. On the deck, the smartlies appear and ask the lovejoys to sit with them. Vulgar, who is standing by, he is always standing by, breaks in, and even without an introduction says, Mr. and Mrs. Lovejoy and Celebrity are sitting at my table. Won't you sit with me also? If the Smartleys protest they have a table, he is generally insistent and momentarily overpowering enough to make them join forces with him. As the Smartleys particularly want to sit next to the Lovejoys, and also like the idea of meeting celebrity, it ends in Vulgar's table being a collection of fashionables whom he could not possibly have gotten together without just such a maneuver. The question of what he gets out of it is puzzling, since with each hour the really well-bred people dislike him more and more intensely and at the end of a day or so, his table's company are all eating on deck to avoid him. Perhaps there is some recompense that does not appear on the surface, but to the casual observer the satisfaction of telling the others that the Smartleys, Lovejoys, and Wellborns sat at his table would scarcely seem worth the effort. Those Acquisitive of Acquaintance there is another type of steamer passenger and hotel guest who may or may not be a climber. This one searches out potential acquaintances on the passenger list and hotel register with the avidity of a bird searching for worms. You have scarcely found your own stateroom and had your deck chair placed when one of them swoops upon you. I don't know whether you remember me. I met you in 1902 at countless Della Robbia's in Florence. Your memory being woefully incomplete, there is nothing for you to say except, how do you do? If a few minutes of conversation, which should be sufficient, proves her to be a lady, you talk to her now and again throughout the voyage, and may end by liking her very much. If, however... Her speech breaks into expressions which prove her not a lady. You become engrossed in your book or conversation with another when she approaches. Often these over-friendly people are grasping, calculating, and objectionable. 
but sometimes, like Ricky Ticky Tavy, they are merely obsessed with a mania to run about and see what is going on in the world. For instance, Miss Spinster is one of the best bred, best informed, most charming ladies imaginable, but her mania for people cannot fail on occasions to put her in a position to be snubbed. Never seriously, because she is too obviously a lady for that. But to see her trotting along the deck and then darting upon a helpless, reclining figure is at least an illustration of the way some people make friends. It can't be done, of course, unless you have once known the person you are addressing, or unless you have a friend in common who, though absent, can serve in making the introduction. As said in Introductions, introducing oneself is often perfectly correct. If you, sharing Miss Spinster's love of people, find yourself on a steamer with the intimate friend of a member of your family, you may very properly go up and say, I am going to speak to you because I am Celia Lovejoy's cousin. I am Mrs. Brown. And Mrs. Norman, who very much likes Celia Lovejoy, says cordially, I am so glad you spoke to me. Do sit down, won't you? But to have your next chair neighbor on deck insist on talking to you if you don't want to be talked to is very annoying, and it is bad form for her to do so. If you are sitting hour after hour doing nothing but idly looking in front of you, your neighbor might address a few remarks to you, and if you receive them with any degree of enthusiasm— your response may be translated into a willingness to talk. But if you answer in the merest monosyllables, it should be taken to mean that you prefer to be left to your own diversions. Even if you are agreeable, your neighbor should show tact in not speaking to you when you are reading or writing, or show no inclination for conversation. The point is really that no one must do anything to interfere with the enjoyment of another. Whoever is making the advance, whether your neighbor or yourself, it must never be more than tentative. If not at least met halfway, it must be withdrawn at once. That is really the only rule there is. It should merely be granted that those who do not care to meet others have just as much right to their seclusion as those who delight in others and have a right to be delighted, as long as that delight is unmistakably mutual. STEAMER TIPS Each ordinary first-class passenger, now, as always, gives ten shillings, two dollars fifty, to the room steward or stewardess, ten shillings to the dining-room steward, Ten shillings to the deck steward, ten shillings to the lounge steward. Your tip to the head steward, and to one of the chefs, depends on whether they have done anything special for you. If not, you do not tip them. If you are a bad sailor, and have been taking your meals in your room, you give twenty shillings, five dollars, at least, to the stewardess, or steward, if you are a man. Or... If you have eaten your meals on deck, you give twenty shillings to the deck steward and ten to his assistant, and you give five to the bath steward. To any steward who takes pains to please you, you show by your manner in thanking him that you appreciate his efforts, as well as by giving him a somewhat more generous tip when you leave the ship. If you like your bath at a certain hour, you would do well to ask your bath steward for it as soon as you go on board, unless you have a private bath of your own, since the last persons to speak get the inconvenient hours, naturally. To many, the daily salt bath is the most delightful feature of the trip. The water is always wonderfully clear, and the towels are heated. If you have been ill on the voyage— some ship's doctors send in a bill. Others do not. In the latter case, you are not actually obliged to give them anything, but the generously inclined put the amount of an average fee in an envelope and leave it for the doctor 
at the purser's office. Dress on the steamer. On the deluxe steamers, nearly everyone dresses for dinner. Some actually in ball dresses, which is in worst possible taste, and, like all overdressing in public places, indicate that they have no other place to show their finery. People of position never put on a formal evening dress on a steamer, not even in the a la carte restaurant, which is a feature of the deluxe steamer of size. In the dining saloon, they wear afternoon house dresses, without hats, for dinner. In the restaurant, they wear semi-dinner dresses. Some smart men on the ordinary steamers put on a dark sack suit for dinner after wearing country clothes all day. But in the deluxe restaurant, they wear tuxedo coats. No gentleman wears a tailcoat on shipboard under any circumstances whatsoever. End of chapter 37 Part 1 Chapter 37 Part 2 of Etiquette This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chris Gladys Etiquette in Society, in Business, in Politics and at Home by Emily Post Chapter 37 Traveling at Home and Abroad Part 2 Traveling Abroad Just as one discordant note makes more impression than all the others that are correctly played in an entire symphony, so does a discordant incident stand out and dominate a hundred others that are above criticism, and therefore unnoticed. In every country of Europe and Asia are Americans who combine the brilliancy which none can deny is the birthright of the newer world with the cultivation and good breeding of the old. These Americans of the best type go all over the world, fitting in so perfectly with their background that not even the inhabitants notice they are strangers. In other words, they achieve the highest accomplishment possible. But, in contrast to these, the numberless discordant ones are only too familiar. One sees them swarming over Europe in bunches, sometimes in hordes, on regular professionally run tours. This, of course, does not mean that all personally conducted tourists are anything like them. The objectionables are loud of voice, loud in manner. They always attract as much attention as possible to themselves and wave American flags on all occasions. The American flag is the most wonderful emblem in the whole world, and ours is the most glorious country too. But that does not mean that it is good taste to wave our flag for no reason whatsoever. At a parade or on a special day when other people are wearing flags, then let us wave ours by all means, but not otherwise. It does not dignify our flag to make it an object of ridicule to others, and that is exactly the result of the ceaseless flaunting of it by a group of people who talk at the top of their voices, who deliberately assume that the atmosphere belongs to them, and who behave like noisy, untrained savages trying to show off. In hotels, on excursions, steamers and trains, they insist on talking to everyone, whether everyone wants to talk or not. They are all over the place. There is no other way to express it, and they allow privacy to no one if they can help it. Numberless cultivated Americans traveling in Europe never by any chance speak English or carry English books on railroad trains as a protection against the other type of American 
who allows no one to travel in the same compartment and escape conversation. The only way to avoid unwelcome importunities is literally to take refuge in assuming another nationality. Strangely enough, these irrepressibles are seldom encountered at home. They seem to develop on the steamer and burst into full bloom only on the beaten tourist trails, which is a pity, because if they only developed at home instead, we might be intensely annoyed, but at least we should not be mortified before our own citizens about our other fellow citizens. But to a sensitive American, it is far from pleasant to have the country he loves represented by a table full of vulgarians noisily attracting the attention of a whole dining room, and to have a European say mockingly, Ah, and those are your compatriots? Some years ago, a Russian Grand Duke sitting next to Mrs. Oldname at a luncheon in a Monte Carlo restaurant said to her, Your country puzzles me. How can it be possible that it holds without explosion such antagonistic types as the many charming Americans we are constantly meeting, and at the same time looking at a group who were actually singing and beating time on their glasses with knives and forks? Those. A French officer's comment to an American officer with whom he was talking in a club in Paris quite unconsciously tells the same tale. You are a liaison officer, I suppose, with the Americans? But may I be permitted to ask why you wear the uniform? The other smiled. I am an American. You? An American? Impossible. Why, you speak French like a Parisian. You have the manner of a great gentleman, un grand seigneur, which would indicate that the average American does not speak perfect French, nor have beautiful manners. There is much excuse for not speaking foreign languages, but there is no excuse whatever for having offensive manners and riding roughshod over people who own the land, not we, who seem to think we do. As for souvenir hunters, perhaps they can explain wherein their pilfering of another's property differs from petty thieving, a distinction which the owner can scarcely be expected to understand. Those who write their names defacing objects of beauty with their vainglorious smudges and scribblings are scarcely less culpable. In France, in Spain, in Italy, grace and politeness of manner is as essential to merest decency as being clothed. In the hotels that are used to us, something of a commentary, our lack of politeness is tolerated, but don't think for a moment it is not paid for. The officer referred to above, who had the advantage of summer after summer spent in Europe as a boy, was charged just about half what another must pay who has the rudeness of a savage. But good manners are good manners everywhere, except that in Latin and Asiatic countries we must, as it seemed to us, exaggerate politeness. We must, in France and Italy, bow smilingly. We must, in Spain and the East, bow gravely. But in any event, it is necessary everywhere, except under the American and British flags, to bow, though your bow is often little more than a slight inclination of the head and a smile, and to show some ceremony in addressing people. When you go into a shop in France or Italy, you must smile and bow, and say, Good morning, madame, or Good morning, monsieur, and until we meet again when you leave. If you can't say au revoir, say good afternoon in English, but at all events say something in a polite tone of voice, which is much more important than the words themselves. To be civilly polite is not difficult. It is simply a matter of remembering. To fail to say good morning to a concierge a chambermaid, or a small tradesman in France, 
treating him or her as though he did not exist, is not evidence of your grandeur, but of your ignorance. A French duchess would not think of entering the littlest store without saying, Good morning, madame, to its proprietress, and, if she is known to her at all, without making inquiries concerning the health of the various members of her family. Nor would she fail to say, Good morning, Auguste, or Marie, to her own servants. Europe's Unflattering Opinion of Us For years we Americans have swarmed over the face of the world, taking it for granted that the earth's surface belongs to us, because we can pay for it. And it is rather worse than ever since the war, when the advantages of exchange add bitterness to irritation. And yet there are many who are highly indignant when told that, as a type, we are not at all admired abroad. Instead of being indignant, how much simpler and better it would be to make ourselves admirable, especially since it is those who most lack cultivation who are most indignant. The very well-bred may be mortified and abashed, but they can't be indignant except with their fellow countrymen, who, by their shocking behavior, make Europe's criticism just. Understanding of and kind-hearted consideration for the feelings of others are the basic attributes of good manners. Without observation, understanding is impossible, even in our own country, where the attitude of our neighbors is much the same as our own. It is not hard to appreciate, therefore, that to understand the point of view of people entirely foreign to ourselves requires intuitive perception as well as cultivation in a very high degree. Americans in European Society It is only in musical comedy that one can go into a strange city and be picked out of the crowd and invited to the tables of the high of the land, because one looks as though one might be agreeable. To see anything of society in the actual world, it is necessary to have friends, either Americans living or stationed or married abroad, or to take letters of introduction. Taking letters of introduction should never be done carelessly because of the obligation that they impose. But to go to a strange country and see nothing of its social life is like a blind person's going to the theatre, and the only way a stranger can know people is through the letters he brings. Under ordinary circumstances, no knowledge whatsoever beyond the social amenities the world over are necessary. A dinner abroad is exactly the same as one here. You enter a room, you bow, you shake hands, you say, how do you do? You sit at table, you talk of impersonal things, say good-bye and thank you to your hostess, and you leave. The matter of addressing people of title correctly is of little importance. The beautiful Lady Old World, who was Alice Town, was asked one day by a fellow countryman what she called this person of title and that one, and she replied, I'm not sure that I know. Why should I call them at all? which was a perfectly sensible answer. One never says anything but you to the person spoken to, and it might be an excellent thing not to know how to speak about anyone with a title, as it would prevent one's mentioning them. Having gone into the subject thus far, however, it may be added that if at dinner you are put next to a duke, if it is necessary to call him anything except you, you would say, Duke. Unless you are waiting on the table instead of sitting at it, you would not say, Your Grace, and not even then, My Lord Duke. Neither, unless you are a valet or chambermaid, would you say, Your Lordship, to an Earl. If you are a lady, you call him Lord Arlington. If you know him really well, you call him Arlington. To a knight you say, Sir Arthur which sounds familiar, but there is nothing else you can call him. In England, 
a stranger is not supposed to introduce anyone, so that titles of address are not necessary then either. But if you happen to be the hostess, and French or Americans are present, who like introductions, you introduce Sir Arthur Dryden to the Duke and Duchess of over there, or to Prince and Princess Capri. In talking to her, the latter would be called Princess and her husband, Prince Capri, or Prince, or by those who know him well, Capri. Presentation at Court Frequently, American men are presented at the British court, at levies held by the king for the purpose. Such men are, of course, distinguished citizens, who have been in some branch of public service, or who have contributed something to art, science, history, or progress. An American lady to be eligible for presentation at a foreign court should be either the wife or daughter of a distinguished American citizen, or be herself notable in some branch of learning or accomplishment. It is absolutely necessary that such a candidate take letters of introduction to the American ambassador, or ministry, if in a country where we have a legation instead of an embassy. She would enclose her letters in a note to the ambassadress, asking that her name be put on the list for presentation. The propriety of this request is a very difficult subject to advise upon, in that it is better that the suggestion come from the ambassador rather than from oneself. It is, however, perfectly permissible for one whose presentation is appropriate, but who may perhaps not know the ambassador or his wife personally, to do as suggested above. It must also be remembered that rarely more than three or perhaps five persons are presented at any one time, so that the difficulty of obtaining a place on the list is obvious. In South America alone, where out of courtesy to those who also consider themselves Americans, the embassies and legations of our country are known as those of the United States of America. But in all other countries of the world we are known simply as Americans. It is the only name we have. We are not United Statesers or United Statesians. There is not even a word to apply to us. To speak of the American minister to this country or that, and of the American embassy in Paris, for instance, is entirely correct. An American lady is presented by the American ambassadress or the wife of the American minister, or by the wife of the charge d'affaires, if the ambassadress be absent, or occasionally by the doyen of the diplomatic corps at the request of the American embassy. It would be futile to attempt giving details of full court dress or special details of etiquette, as those vary not alone with countries, but with time. If you are about to be presented, you will surely be told all that is necessary by the person presenting you. These details, after all, merely comprise the exact length of train or other particulars of dress, the hour you are to be at such and such a door, where you are to stand, and how many curtsies or bows you are to make. In all other and essential particulars, you behave as you would in any and every circumstance of formality. In general outline, however, it would be safe to say that on the day of the ceremony you drive to the palace at a specified hour, wearing specified clothes, and carrying your card of invitation in your hand. Your wraps are left in the carriage or motor-car. You enter the palace and are shown into a room where you wait and wait and wait, until at last you are admitted to the audience chamber where you approach the receiving royalties. You curtsy deeply before them, and then back out. Or else you stand on an assigned spot while the king or queen or both make the tour of those waiting, who curtsy or bow deeply at their approach and again at their withdrawal. If you are spoken to at length, 
you answer as under any other circumstances, exactly as a polite child answers his elders. You do not speak unless spoken to. If your answer is long, you need to say nothing except the answer. If short, you add sir to the king and madam to the queen. This seemingly democratic title is, as a matter of fact, the correct one for all royalty. Yes, sir. Very much indeed, madam. I think so, madam. Foreign Languages In the Latin countries, grace and facility of speech is an object of lifelong cultivation, and no one is considered an educated person who cannot speak several languages well. Those who speak many fluently, by the way, are seldom those who constantly interlard their own tongue with words from another. Not to understand any foreign languages would be a decided handicap in European society, where conversation is very apt to turn polyglot, beginning in one tongue and going on in a second and ending in a third, so that one who knows only English is often in the position of a deaf person, even though Europeans are invariably polite and never let a conversation run long in a language which all those present do not understand. It might easily happen that a French lady and an American, neither understanding the tongue of the other, meet at the house of an Italian, where there is also an Italian monolinguist, so the hostess has to talk in three languages at once. It is unreasonable to expect the average American to be a linguist. We are too far removed from foreign countries. As a matter of fact, if you would make yourself agreeable, it is much better, unless your facility was acquired as a child, or you have a talent amounting to genius for accent and construction, to make it a rule when you lunch or dine with Europeans to talk English since all Latins acutely suffer at hearing their language distorted. English, on the other hand, is not beautiful in sound to the foreign ear. It is a series of S's and shushes, lumped with consonants like an iron-wheeled cart bumping over a cobblestoned street. The Latin's accent in English is annoying even to us at times, but the English accent in French, Italian, or Spanish is murderous. Furthermore, the Latin passionately loves his language in the way the Westerner loves his city. He simply cannot endure to have it abused, and he execrates the person who does so. And, proportionally, he loves the few who prove they share his love by speaking it creditably. To Improve One's Accent If you want to improve your accent, Nothing can so help you as going to the theatre abroad until your ears literally absorb the sounds. All people are imitative. There are few who do not gradually lose the purity of a good foreign accent when long away from Europe, and all speak more fluently when their ears become accustomed to the sound. The theatre is not only the best possible place to hear correctly enunciated speech, but a play of contemporary life is equally valuable as a study in manners. There is also a suavity of grace in the way Europeans bow and stand and sit, and in the way they speak that is unconsciously imitated. These manners need not, in fact should not, be gushing or mincing, but you gradually perceive that jerking ramrod motions and stalking into a drawing-room like a grenadier are less impressive than awkward. THE SPOILED AMERICAN GIRL The subject of American manners, as they appear to Europeans, cannot be dismissed without comment on a reprehensible type of American girl who flourishes on shipboard, on tours, and in public places generally, but most particularly in the large and expensive hotels of continental resorts. If she and her family have a home, they are never in it. 
and if they have any object in life other than letting her follow her own unhampered inclinations, it is not apparent to the ordinary observer. Such a girl is always overdressed. She wears every fashion in an extremist exaggeration. She sparkles with jewelry and reeks of scent. She switches herself this way and that, and is always posing in public view and playing to the public gallery. She generally has a small brother, who refuses to go to bed at night, or to stop making the piazza chairs into a train of cars, or to use the public halls as a skating rink. When he is not making a noise, he is eating, and his elegant sister looks upon him with disdain. Sister, meanwhile, jingling with chains and bangles, decked in scarfs and tulle and earrings, leans on or against whatever happens to be convenient, flirting with any casual stranger who comes along. She invariably goes to her meals alone, evidently thinking her parents should be kept apart from her. She is never away from the courthouse or the casino, abroad or the hotel lobby in America. She is nearly always alone, and the book she is perpetually reading is always opened at the same page, and she is sure to look up as you pass. She is very ready to be picked up, and to confide her life's history, past, present, and future, to any stranger, especially a young one of the opposite sex. She is rude only to her mother and father. She is also, we know, but Europe doesn't, a perfectly good girl. Her lack of etiquette is shocking, but her morals are above reproach. She does not even mean to be rude to her parents, and she has no idea that the things she does are exactly those which condemn her in the opinion of strangers. If she were constantly with, and obviously devoted to her mother, she would make an infinitely better impression, both as to good form and as to heart, than by segregating herself so that she can be joined by any haphazard youth who strolls into view, and thereby cheapening not only herself, but the name of the American girl in general. Curiously enough, if she marries in Europe, she is apt to settle down, and become an altogether admirable example of American-European womanhood, because she is sound fruit at heart, merely wrapped in tawdry gilt paper trimming by her adoring but ignorantly unwise parents, who, in their effort to show her off, disguise the very qualities which should have been accentuated. Ladies Traveling Alone in Europe Europeans cannot possibly understand how any lady of social position can be without a maid. A lady traveling alone, therefore, has this trifling handicap to start with. It is a very snobbish opinion, and one who has the temerity to attempt traveling all by herself has undoubtedly the ability to see it through. She need, after all, merely to behave with extreme quietness and dignity, and she can go from one end of the world to the other without molestation or even difficulty especially if she is anything of a linguist. In going from one place to another, it is wiser to write as long as possible ahead for accommodations, possibly giving the name of the one, if any, who recommended the hotel. But in going far off into Asia or other difficult countries, she would better join friends, or at least a personally conducted tour, unless she has the metal of a Burton or a Stanley. Motoring in Europe Motoring in Europe is perfectly feasible and easy. A car has to be put in a crate to cross the ocean, but in crossing the channel between England and France, no difficulty whatever is experienced. All information necessary can be had at any of the automobile clubs, and in going from one country to another, you have merely to show your passports at the border, properly viséd, and pay a deposit to ensure you're not selling the car out of the country, which is refunded when you come back. 
Garage charges are reasonable, but gasoline is high. Roads are beautiful, and traveling, once you have your car, is much cheaper than by train. Once off the beaten track, a tourist who has not a working knowledge of the language of the country he is driving through is at a disadvantage. But plenty of people constantly do it, so it is at least not insurmountable. With English, you can go to most places. With English and French, nearly everywhere. The Michelin Guide shows you in the little drawing exactly the type of hotels you will find in each approaching town, and the price of accommodation, so that you can choose your own stopping places accordingly. And etiquette, you ask? There is no etiquette of motoring that differs from all other etiquette, except, of course, not to be a road hog or a road pig. People who take up the entire road are not half the offenders that others are who picnic along the side of it and leave their old papers and food all over everywhere. For that matter, anyone who shoves himself forward in any position in life, he who pushes past, bumping into you, walking over you, in order to get a first seat on the train, or to be the first off a boat, anyone who pushes himself out of his turn, or takes more than his share, anywhere, or of anything, is precisely that sort of an animal. On a Continental Train Europeans usually prefer to ride backwards, and as an American prefers to face the engine, it works out beautifully. It is not etiquette to talk with fellow passengers. In fact, it is very middle class. If you are in a smoking carriage, all European carriages are smoking, unless marked ladies alone or no smoking, and ladies are present, it is polite to ask if you may smoke. Language is not necessary, as you need merely to look at your cigar and bow with an interrogatory expression, whereupon your fellow passengers bow assent, and you smoke. THE PERFECT TRAVELER One might say the perfect traveler is one whose digestion is perfect, whose disposition is cheerful, who can be enthusiastic under the most discouraging circumstances, to whom discomfort is of no moment, and who possesses at least a sense of the ridiculous, if not a real sense of humor. The perfect traveler, furthermore, is one who possesses the virtue of punctuality, one who has not forgotten something at the last minute, and whose bags are all packed and down at the hour for the start. Those who fuss and flurry about being ready, or those whose disposition is easily upset or who are inclined to be gloomy, should not travel, unless they go alone. Nothing can spoil a journey more than someone who is easily put out of temper and who always wants to do something the others do not. Whether traveling with your family or with comparative strangers, you must realize that your personal likes and dislikes have at least on occasion to be subordinated to the likes and dislikes of others. Nor can you always be comfortable, or have good weather, or make perfect connections, or find everything to your personal satisfaction. And you only add to your own discomfort and chagrin, as well as to the discomfort of everyone else, by refusing to be philosophical. Those who are bad sailors should not go on yachting parties. They are always abjectly wretched, and are of no use to themselves or anyone else. Those who hate walking should not start out on a tramp, and that is much too far for them and expect others to turn back when they get tired. They need not start to begin with, but having once started they must see it through. There is no greater test of a man's or a woman's wearing qualities than traveling with him. He who is always keen and ready for anything, delighted with every amusing incident, willing to overlook shortcomings, and apparently oblivious of discomfort, is, needless to say, the one first included on the next trip. End of chapter 37, part 2
Chapter Thirty Eight of Etiquette. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. Etiquette in Society, in Business, in Politics, and at Home by Emily Post. Chapter Thirty Eight: The Growth of Good Taste in America. Good taste or bad is revealed in everything we are, do, have, our speech, manners, dress, and household goods, and even our friends are evidences of the propriety of our taste, and all these have been the subject of this book. Rules of etiquette are nothing more than signposts by which we are guided to the goal of good taste. Whether we Americans are drifting toward or from finer perceptions, both mental and spiritual. Is too profound a subject to be taken up except on a broader scope than that of the present volume. Yet it is a commonplace remark that older people invariably feel that the younger generation is speeding swiftly on the road to perdition. But whether the present younger generation is really any nearer to that frightful end than any previous one, is a question that we of the present older generation are scarcely qualified to answer. To be sure, manners seem to have grown lax. And many of the amenities apparently have vanished, but do these things merely seem so to us because young men of fashion do not pay party calls nowadays, and the young woman of fashion is informal? It is difficult to maintain that youth today is so very different from what it has been in other periods of the country's history, especially as the capriciousness of beauty, the heartlessness and carelessness of youth. Are charges of a too suspiciously bromidic flavor to carry conviction. The present generation is at least ahead of some of its very proper predecessors in that weddings do not have to be set for noon because a bridegroom's sobriety is not to be counted on later in the day. That young people of today prefer games to conversation scarcely proves degeneration. That they wear very few clothes is not a symptom of decline. There have always been recurring cycles of undress, followed by muffling from shoe soles to chin. We have not yet reached the undress of Pauline Bonaparte, so the muffling period may not be due. However, leaving out the mooted question whether etiquette may not soon be a subject for an obituary rather than a guidebook, one thing is certain: we have advanced prodigiously in aesthetic taste. Never in the recollection of any one now living has it been so easy to surround oneself with lovely belongings. Each year's achievement seems to stride away from that of the year before in producing woodwork, ironwork, glass, stone, print, paint, and textile that is lovelier and lovelier. One cannot go into the shops or pass their windows on the streets without being impressed with the ever-growing taste of their display. Nor can one look into the magazines devoted to gardens and houses and house furnishings, and fail to appreciate the increasing wealth of the beautiful in environment. That such exquisite best as America possessed in her colonial houses and gardens and furnishings should ever have been discarded for the atrocities of the period after the Civil War, is comparable to nothing but Titania's Midsummer Night's Dream madness that made her believe an ass's features more beautiful than those of Apollo. Happily, however, since we never do things by halves, we are studying and cultivating and buying and making, and trying to forget and overcome that terrible marriage of our beautiful colonial ancestress with the dark-wooded, plush-draped, jigsawed upstart of vulgarity and ignorance. In another country, her type would be lost in his forever. But in a country that sent a million soldiers across three thousand miles of ocean, in spite of every obstacle and in the twinkling of an eye. Why even comment that good taste is pouring over our land as fast as periodicals, books, and manufacturers can take it? Three thousand miles east and west, two thousand miles north and south, white tiled bathrooms have sprung like mushrooms, seemingly in a single night. Charming houses, enchanting gardens, beautiful cities, cultivated people, created in thousands upon thousands of instances, in the short span of one generation. Certain great houses abroad have consummate quality, it is true, but for every one of these there are a thousand that are mediocre, even offensive. In our own country, beautiful houses and appointments flourish like field flowers in summer, 
not merely in the occasional gardens of the very rich, but everywhere. And all this means? Merely one more incident added to the many great facts that prove us a wonderful nation. But this is an aside merely, and not to be talked about to anyone except just ourselves. At the same time, it is no idle boast that the world is at present looking toward America, and whatever we become is bound to lower or raise the standards of life. The other countries are old. We are youth personified. We have all youth's glorious beauty and strength and vitality and courage. If we can keep these attributes and add finish and understanding and perfect taste in living and thinking, we need not dwell on the golden age that is past, but believe in the golden age that is sure to be. End of chapter 38 This concludes Etiquette in Society, in Business, in Politics, and at Home by Emily Post